Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Thank you particularly to the Behavioral and Social Science Medical Education Consortium who have traveled here to present today. I've been working with them for almost a year and a half, I think, so I'm really excited that we're all here today. Uh, my name is Lauren Fordyce. I am a AAAS Science Technology Policy Fellow in the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. And my job is uh, to guide you through the day um, and to introduce my esteemed director, Dr. Bill Riley, who's going to welcome and introduce you to the day. Thanks. So Lauren, thanks. And I, before we get started, there are a lot of people we ought to thank, but I want to make sure we thank Lauren before I forget about it, because she's put an awful lot of work into making this happen. So join me in doing that. Uh, so, uh, OBSSR actually um, started this effort doing something that the uh, federal government, particularly the NIH, is, doesn't do a lot of, which is developing curricula. Uh, we do a lot of training and research, um, our T's and our K's and our F awards and those sorts of things. Um, we typically don't get too involved in this area. Um, but in 2004, the IOM report came out on enhancing behavioral and social science uh, training in the medical school curricula. Uh, the office at that time, and I won't take any credit for this because I wasn't around at that time, uh, thought that this would be really important to be able to develop some model curricula, test those curricula, um, determine how best to train medical students in the behavioral and social sciences that are critical to both practice and clinical research as well. Um, so um, from an FOA, we awarded uh, nine awards. Um, all of those folks are sitting somewhere on the front row or second row um, and will be presenting today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their work. And after the first five years, we were already thinking about dissemination and implementation. And so in the second set of awards, we said, okay, you've shown that you can do this in your institution. Now show us that you can do it in other institutions. And so they had to partner with other institutions and medical schools that had not yet um, done much in the way of sort of behavioral and social science curricula or where they were trying to improve upon it um, and expand that over the next five-year period. So they've done that as well um, as part of this effort. It's been a very productive group. Um, we often have meetings at the NIH when we launch something. We don't often have meetings as we're kind of wrapping them up and closing them up. Um, but we thought at, at, for our office, we thought it was critically important that this work not just come out as the typical way we put out and disseminate our work, which is in papers and publications, which this group has done extremely well. But beyond that, to also make sure that these things are disseminated, implemented, and ultimately adopted in medical school and allied health curriculum, and that people are making maximum use of the investment that the NIH has made in this work. Um, so um, like I said, I have, I'm really looking forward to the day. I'm going to actually be here through pretty much all of it except slipping out for something around lunchtime um, because I wanted to hear what um, was going on and the things that people are doing. I'm glad that all of you are here. I think we have a lot of people uh, joining us via webcast as well. Um, so I'll just remind you that when we get to the part where we're talking and asking questions and that sort of thing, there are mics on both sides so that the people on webcast can actually hear you um, if you're asking questions and doing that sort of thing. And at the end, we have a really interesting sort of reactor panel of people who um, spend their, their lives thinking about how to do training in medical schools and in um, allied health professions. And I think that will actually be a really interesting thing um, as well as we go through the day. So I want to thank you all, welcome you, and i um, glad you could be here. And, and, and as part of the medical school sort of motif, we thought um, those of you who have taught in um, old surgery amphitheaters that this would be a feel. <laughs> comfortable to you. Um, um, I, I remember doing this at MCV Surgery Lab uh, Amphitheater, which is now a museum, which scares me that things where I used to teach are now museums. But, but you almost had to look straight up to see the students above you in order to be able to, to teach. So we're kind of trying to give you a little of that flavor in this room as well. So without uh, further ado, I'll, I'll turn back to Lauren. Do I do it or to Patty? So I'll bring Patty. So thank you. So, so I'm Patty Carney. I'm from Oregon Health and Science University. And as part of the effort, we, uh, the NIH funded an evaluation core that would do activities that would support the school. So we broke into a bunch of groups to work on specific things. And, and we just published a systematic review that uh, those of you out there can go to our website and click on the articles that display 
the best measures for assessing social and behavioral science competencies according to all the ION domains as part of this. So the way we've broken the day down, we have three sessions that we'll be doing. The first one is going to be focused on innovations in, prov in provider and patient communication. The second session, which will occur later this morning, is innovations in professional development and reflective narrative writing in behavioral and social sciences. And then the last one will be innovations in uh, interprofessional education. So I am just delighted to welcome our first speaker, um, Pablo Zhu, who comes from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and he's going to be talking about choosing wisely in medical education. Pablo. Also, for those of you who are watching online, before we switch the slide, you'll see we have a tweet. So if you have questions when we get to the discussion section after the, all of the presentations, I can ask your questions for you. So please tweet us your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Dr. Pablo Ho, and I'm the associate. I'm, I'm the assistant dean for medical education at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, um, and and I just realized this doesn't work. <laughs> just one moment. Doesn't roll up in there. It's, oh, I don't. Yeah. I don't if it know. doesn't, that's okay. Okay. That's okay. Okay. So I'm here to actually uh, present our work along with uh, my co-PI, uh, Dr. Paul George from, um, from Alpert, um, sorry, I'm totally disoriented with this, uh, the Alpert Medical School, Brown University. He couldn't be with us uh, today, and we're going to talk to you about the Choosing Wisely in Medical Education initiative, which is a way of teaching value-based care to medical students. It's not working. Sorry. There's a green screen. Let's see. So if you just just click this button there right go. there. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So our only financial disclosure is that we got a second grant from the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation uh, to also support this work. So I'm quickly going to talk about, uh, give an outline of uh, our presentation, and I'm going to talk about the past history of the Einstein-Brown partnership and its accomplishments. I'm going to review background on the national initiative to teach value-based care in medical education, and we will review the Einstein-Brown joint strategic plan to teach high-value care to medical students, and finish up with what our next steps in our initiative. So I wanted to quickly review the history of the OBSSR grant and its accomplishments at both Einstein and Brown. In 2005, Einstein initially received the initial OBSSR funding to enhance curriculum in the behavioral and social sciences. It resulted in a major curriculum innovation which established a longitudinal program that cut across the third year clerkships at Einstein known as the Patients, Doctors, and Communities course. PDC, as it is known, emphasizes communication skills, professionalism, and behavior change. This allowed Einstein to meet the first four out of the six domains of the IOM report, improving medical education, teaching mind-body interactions, patient behavior, physician role and behavior, and physician-patient interactions. During the second phase of the grant, Einstein sought to strengthen its curriculum on the last two IOM domains, social and cultural issues in healthcare, and health policy and economics. And we chose to partner with Brown, who had substantial experience in this arena and had embarked on, a, on curriculum revision to emphasize public health. The partnership enabled the establishment of longitudinal population health curriculum at both schools. And at Brown, it established a four-year dual degree program called the Primary Care Population Medicine Program. The grant also enabled scholarly concentration programs to be established at both schools, which allowed students to explore areas related to medicine and pursue in-depth scholarly projects. In September of 2015, there was a change in PI from Dr. Paul Morantz to myself, and at Einstein from Phil Grapuso to Paul George. And during this phase of the grant, we turned our attention to teaching our students how to work with patients in making wiser choices around appropriate care. 
So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the background uh, re related to the national movement to integrate value-based uh, care into medical education. So we have lots of evidence to substantiate that the American healthcare system is expensive, inefficient, unsafe, and it is not equitable. Patients and families are increasingly concerned about understanding and navigating the complicated healthcare system. And studies show that patients and clinicians share a common challenge in a lack of transparency and the unpredictable nature of health, high healthcare costs. Doctors are often unaware of how their clinical decisions impact patients and society. In one study, 36% of physicians would accommodate a patient's request for a test even if the doctor knows the test is unnecessary. And in this ABIM survey, 600 doctors were asked, in your own practice, what is the reason you sometimes end up ordering an unnecessary test or procedure? One of the top reasons was malpractice concerns, but you'll also see here um, a patient insisting on the test, the patient's demands, um, and also time. So uh, sometimes it's just easier to order the test than to sit and talk about it. So in April of 2012, the American Board of Internal Medicine, Consumer Reports, and nine specialty organizations launched the Choosing Wisely campaign, whose goal was to encourage doctors and patients to have conversations about what care is really needed and debunk the myth that more care is actually better care. To date, there are more than 70 participating specialty organizations um, that have formulated a list of practices that doctors and patients should question to help them make wiser decisions about appropriate care. And these recommendations are based on evidence, quality and safety, cost to individuals and families, cost to society, and the integration of patient preference. So this is just an example of a choosing wisely uh, list, and this one comes from the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, 15 things that doctors and patients should question. And I'm only going to read the first two because they're actually pertinent to what I'm going to be talking about. So one, don't do imaging for low back pain within the first six weeks unless red flags are present. And number two, don't routinely prescribe antibiotics for acute uh, mild to moderate sinusitis unless symptoms last for seven or more days or symptoms worsen after initial clinical improvement. And it, it pays to remember that these choosing wisely lists are about things that we have lots of evidence that we should not do. These are not about areas of controversy in medicine, like whether we should get mammograms for women between age 40 and 49. It's what we should not do. So, but there are many challenges to actually teaching value-based care. So there's a lot of misperception that a physician who considers healthcare costs and manages finite resources somehow is uh, in conflict with uh, patient primacy, you know, putting the patient first. And medical education has been cited as part of the problem because, as you know, we don't teach much on healthcare systems, economics, and quality and safety to medical students. However, medical school training has also been identified as being part of the solution. And one approach is to integrate the Choosing Wiser recommendations into undergraduate medical education. There's also national drivers. The Liaison Committee on Medical Education actually has standards that require that this content now be taught in all medical schools in the US and Canada. The ACGME also um, requires that all residents in all specialties should achieve these competencies. The USMLE has now integrated this content on all of their national board exams. And the American Academy of, uh, I'm sorry, the American Association of Medical, um, the AMMC, sorry, uh, has, um, has established the, the entrustable professional activities. Um, and this is a national list of 13 uh, work activities expected of all graduating medical students to perform on the first day of residency. And the fourth EPA is actually specific to this, that the graduating students should be able to discuss the planned orders and prescriptions with patients and families. So now on to the joint strategic plan. So we use the Kern model to actually develop the curriculum. And as we know, we've already said that the first problem uh, in, is identifying the issue, which is a lack of training and stewardship of patients and resources, and that we don't train students in communication skills with patients about appropriate care. So a targeted needs assessment, we actually use data from the GQ, the graduate questionnaire, where 171 graduating Einstein students were asked in 2013 the following questions. And they had to rate their um, level of satisfaction with instruction in these areas. And they rated uh, 
um, medical economics, healthcare systems, and safety and quality as inadequate, and these are the associated percentages. So we're, we needed a lot of work to do. So then the next thing that we did is we developed six learning objectives. And the first is more of a basic, basic knowledge um, objective, which is that the student will describe physician practice behaviors that can lead to inflated healthcare costs to patients, families, and societies. And then we moved up the Bloom taxonomy, but more importantly, the final one is actually that the student will discuss with patients why certain treatments and tests may be unnecessary and inappropriate. So that's a communication skills application, and it requires some mastery of the first five learning objectives. Next, uh, we established a Choosing Wisely curriculum that we're still building. So in the pre-clerkship years, you want to acquire the students to acquire the fundamental knowledge of value-based care and to identify key elements of effective communication skills. And in the clerkship years, you want them to apply value-based care concepts to clinical cases and to in inpatient care, and also apply communication skills in simulations and in actual patient care settings. And by the end of the clerkship year, you want them to, to demonstrate competency of the Choosing Wisely knowledge skills and, and attitudes. So this is just an example of some of the, you, the specific instructional sessions. At Brown, they actually have a, a workshop on upper respiratory infections and antibiotic stewardship. Uh, and then they use an online case to actually talk about imaging stewardship. At Einstein, we actually have um, in the family medicine clerkship, we're using choosing YZ videos that were already produced by the ABIM Foundation on, sinus, on a sinusitis case and antibiotic stewardship. And the radiology clerkship actually takes on the um, CT, uh, MRI imaging, and its appropriateness in, in um, non-emergent low back pain. And we have several other clerkship pilots underway. So if this is our communication skills competency that we're asking the students to achieve, what are we teaching them to do? What is the framework that we're going to use? So the communication framework, there's many that are out there that we could have used, but for clarity and because it's very easily transferable, we use the choosing wisely communication skills, which are that doctors should provide clear recommendations to patients, elicit the patient's beliefs and questions, provide empathy and partnership and legitimation, and confirm agreement and overcome barriers. And if you break these down into sub-competencies, you'll see um, just straightforward, for example, if you're gonna provide clear information based on best evidence, you need to keep things simple and avoid jargon, uh, pay attention to health literacy, and if you're gonna elicit patient concerns, the importance of silence. You want to make sure that the patients are, are given the opportunity to speak and share their concerns. You also wanna have them uh, use empathic comments to communicate that you care about the patients and you also want to make sure that um, the patient uh, really understands, is satisfied, and agrees with the plan. So a lot of teach back um, opportunities. So in terms of assessing communication skills, we developed three um, observed structured clinical encounters um, to really see if they can really do this by the end of the third year or during third year. And we trained uh, standardized patients on cases. So here you see, we have the three cases are in family medicine, two of them are upper respiratory infections and the use of antibiotics. Um, and this is for, again, uh, non-acute, rather acute, but not uh, life-threatening presentations. So at Brown, it's a case of sore throat in a patient asking for antibiotics. At Einstein, it's acute sinusitis in a patient asking for antibiotics. And the third case is actually a shared case where uh, someone has acute low back pain, but no urgent symptoms or signs, and is actually asking uh, during uh, um, for uh, an MRI and this takes place at the um, at the end of third year during the clinical skills assessment which is a common um, uh, assessment period that happens at most medical schools in prepping the students for their step two um, CS exam so at Einstein uh, we actually at both institutions we we studied and developed two approaches to the rating tool uh, and we trained the students, I'm sorry, we trained the patients to, as raters on these tools. So in the family medicine clerkship, we have an 11 item checklist and it's a dichotomous variable of yes, no, either you saw the behavior or you didn't. Um, there are no behavioral anchors, so there are no descriptors underneath the skills explaining what that behavior actually looks like on this tool, it's yes or no. And we are assessing um, the concurrent validity and reliability for both the URI cases with the same checklist. And in the end of year uh, CSA, it's a 14 item checklist tool which rates the students as does not meet, meets or exceeds competency. And there we do have behavioral anchors. And it's adapted from a validated uh, checklist on communication skills that's more general. 
uh, from Einstein, and actually it's going to be uh, published very soon from uh, Felice Milan. And so we're assessing validity and reliability of the low back pain case and the behavioral anchors checklist um, at both schools. So the strategy for assessing reliability and validity of the, of the cases. So first of all, where the power analysis says that we need to have about uh, 50 uh, uh, students go through these cases and we have more than enough at both Brown and Einstein. Our tests uh, are criterion-based uh, to determine whether each student has achieved the specific skills and, or concepts, and we are using a borderline regression method. The tool features a single global rating item if the student overall passes, fails, or is borderline. We plot student performance on the global rating item on the x-axis, and the mean score of the student's performance from all the other items um, on the y-axis, and the convergence of the two at the borderline global performance determines the OSCE station pass mark. Beta reliability testing looks at the slope of the curve to assess reliability, and the steeper the curve, uh, the steeper the slope, the more reliable the case and the tool is. We also have root mean square error, which is a statistical formula to, that's used to determine the degree of error in the checklist. The lower the number, the lower the error. And we use the R-squared method, which is used to, as a measure of validity how much being in the borderline group is actually predicted by the checklist items scores. We're also using ger a generalizability study. OSCEs can have multiple sources of error. So error could be in the rater, it could be in the OSCE station, and it could be in, in the student in terms of how uh, their performance is. So this uh, complex method accounts for all sources of error and, possible, and the possible interaction between each of these points. In a generalizable OSCE, the student should be the largest source of, of uh, variance. So posting counter notes, we also have the students actually write an H&P and an assessment plan after they've had these encounters. Um, and we can, we can actually use coding and posting counter notes uh, on the posting counter notes to identify emergent themes. And a mixed methods approach allows us to look at the themes that are coming out of the notes from the students who actually uh, uh, do not order the MRI or do not give the antibiotics and compare them to those who actually um, who ordered or gave the antibiotics. And again, you can also use independent video review as well, someone who's not the standardized patient to look at the videos and, um, and uh, do the rating. So the following is the final steps that we're uh, undergoing. So we're also monitoring ongoing areas of research. This one paper actually that came out of JAMA just a couple of months ago actually was quite relevant to our study and it's uh, promoting um, it's actually a one-year uh, randomized control study that was done where they use uh, standardized patients as instructors, but not in an OSCE setting, but actually in actual patient care. They were stealth patients. They registered for family medicine and internal medicine uh, resident practices. They didn't know that the actor was there. And so in this, in this scenario, the patients actually, a young woman asked for osteoporosis testing, and in another situation, uh, the patient asked for an MRI with acute low back pain. Um, and then they announced themselves at some point during the visit that I'm actually a standardized patient and actually would give instruction and feedback. Um, so the intervention group received that feedback while the control group received no feedback at all. And then they followed and did this repeatedly again for the next um, three to 12 months. And they found that there was no improvement in patient-centeredness of the primary care residents or the rates of low value test ordering. So the considerations for our study is that patients insisting accounts for only 28% of the excessive ordering, but does, this, but does this account for all the other reasons that I showed on that other slide, you know, concerns about malpractice, time concerns, et cetera. Uh, it also appears to support a more longitudinal approach to teaching and, uh, and for, uh, formative feedback. We'll have our students for four years, which is, may, may uh, be different, and the focus was on graduate medical education here, and maybe an early intervention could make a culture shift and possibly change these outcomes. So we're completing the, the pilot testing. We're actually undergoing that right now. We hope to finish by uh, the beginning of next month, and we have some prelim information on that. We're, um, we'll be implementing the actual formal OSCEs during the next academic year, and we'll be collecting our data during that time. And then we'll assess which checklist approach actually performs better. And then we're also gonna take a look to see if, um, if this information can be used to actually assess students on that EPA number four that I was talking about earlier. So I just wanted to thank our funders and all of the great folks at, um, at Einstein, at Brown, that actually 
worked o over uh, the projects over the last few years. And that's it. Thank you very much. So for the speakers, we do have this timer up here. So when start slashing red, you know you're in trouble. Um, so so that, was, that was just an outstanding way to think about how complicated it is to teach students and, and the providers who are in the um, docs who are teaching those students. This is, and there's some good science here. People think education is soft, and it's not. So I want everybody to be so inspired by that, because we all know this group is. For sure. So our next speaker is Jim Tysinger. He's from the University of Texas Health Center at San Antonio. And he's going to be talking about his collaboration with Oregon Health and Science University on using electronic health records and telemedicine training with medical students to address these social behavioral science principles. Jim. Good morning, I'm Jim Tysinger. I'm from San Antonio, and I'm representing the team of Fran Biagioli, Brian Palmer, Ashok Kumar, and Naaman Andre. And we've been collaborating on this project, and we've really enjoyed not only interacting with each other, but the students and helping them in a couple of critical areas. These are the disclosures. As you will note, we don't have any conflicts of interest posed by this presentation's content. And we cite some other uh, activities Fran and Ryan are involved in. Here are the objectives, primarily focusing on the electronic health record curriculum, as well as the telemedicine component that's associated with it, and uh, discussing the project's outcomes. If you've gone to a physician within the past three to five years, you probably interacted with the third person in the room, the electronic health record. And many people tell us, and I personally observed, that physicians struggle with the electronic health record during the encounter. Has anybody engaged in a telemedicine encounter with the physician? Several people. If you haven't, you will within the next five years. So these are critical areas. Interestingly enough, neither are covered in medical school curriculum. And the grant made this possible and the collaboration that came out with it. We would like to recognize Bill Toffler, who was in the team who originally started this, along with Fran and Ryan at OSHU. The focus was to train students to provide patient-centered care using technology, and to make that, that care safe and effective. We were the collaborator initially with this. There are other schools involved now, so we've spread what we've done. We have preclinical introduction to e electronic health records, just telling the students what's coming when they hit second year and third year when they go for rotations. We have in the clerkship specific activities related to prepping people for the OSCE encounter or the interaction with the standardized patient. That's really one of the things that students enjoy most because they love feedback. And in this interaction, this 15-minute encounter with a female standardized patient with a urinary tract infection that's rather uncomplicated, fairly easy for them to diagnose, what we're doing is assessing their ability to interact with the patient in a patient-centered way while using the electronic health record. We have a faculty observer using a checklist, and the checklist is divided into three components. One is verbal and nonverbal communication skills. These are the basic things that people use every day while interacting with patients, and for the students, it's the same set of skills they are assessed in the step two clinical skills exam. Sample question is, did they initially ask open-ended questions? Second component related to the EHR communication skills, establishing rapport before they went to the record. 
Then, finally, the EHR data gathering skills. Can they review the social history, including the sexual history in this case, with the patient? They get feedback on each one from both the standardized patient and the faculty member. Telemedicine component. This is coming, it's also already used in many areas now, but for most of us, even in urban areas, we're going to start using this. This is an OSCE involving a 12-minute encounter with a standardized patient. They have two possibilities. One standardized patient is a female who has depression. The other standardized patient is a male with diabetes who has a foot sore. And we chose not to show you that foot sore this early in the morning, but it's giving people, it's giving the patient a lot of trouble. He lives two hours from the hospital. His daughter has to take vacation from school to come and take him in. It's a two-day trip. So the student focuses on diagnosing the issue and trying to get the person to come into the clinic, which is closer for review. So that's the scenario. We want them to interact with the patient who's rather testy. This guy is seasoned and really takes them on and they are challenged to deal with the technology as well as the patient. So we give verbal feedback from the standardized patient in this case and we complete a clerk, uh, an observer form that assesses interpersonal skills, medical knowledge, and the use of technology. And you see how all these components of the curriculum come together with the patient, technology, and the student. The collaboration and rewards of challenges. We wanted to really especially focus on this component of our interaction. There are rewards and challenges associated with the collaboration from Texas to Oregon. The rewards is we brought in different perspectives on the projects. So we gave a critical eye to everything that the people in Oregon had developed. They were excellent materials, but we tweaked them based on the interactions we had with the students, with the standardized patients, and with each other in trying to gauge how to check on that checklist. The peer-reviewed presentations and publications. As I'll go over some of the outcomes later, it's been great working with Fran and the other colleagues on these presentations, and we're just finishing an article that's going into academic medicine. It's already been accepted, and we're doing the final tweaks. Student feedback. I've been involved with a number of innovations in medical school. Many of those innovations aren't necessarily so popular with third-year students because they're focused on the NBME subject exam that they take at the end of the clerkship. This is an exception. After the OSCE, where the students get feedback from the standardized patient and the faculty member, the usual response is, thank you for doing this. This is one of the most stressful OSCEs I've had. We don't use or I can't access an electronic health record at my site. There's still a lot of resistance to allowing students to use records. We're trying to overcome that. Sometimes they do use records, but the record is different. We use Epicare. Other places use others. So they're somewhat frustrated in navigating through the electronic health record. I would add for practicing physicians, this is also a challenge. So the students love this. And we also tell them if you're doing an away or an audition elective, one of the things you want to do before you start seeing patients is to sit down and familiarize yourself with the record. This will make you shine. Also, connections with faculty who, who value behavioral science principles at other schools. 
there is a mass of emphasis on basic science. Students sometimes get lost in that. This helps bring the focus to what are you going to do with patients. I think that's another reason students value this. And it's not only collaboration with folks at Oregon, but with other schools and our calls, reading their publications, it's been very rewarding for us. The challenges, IT support. Students had never had access to EPIC training ground at our school. It took a massive amount of work to get that set up and to get them trained and to get the people who work with EPIC at our school to set up something that works. And I really have to congratulate the people at OHSU. They have a person who focuses on electronic health records in their department. So that was one of the essential things that helped, it, helped the project get traction in our school. Distances between sites, we've overcome that by phone, email, but it's still a challenge. We did have a nice visit with the folks at Oregon and met a lot of people there who were involved with this. So it's been really rewarding to participate in this. Going over the outcomes, students value this. Now, I can't overemphasize this. I think part of it is students want feedback, of how they come across. Most of you familiar with residency education nowadays know that a failure on the step two clinical skills exam is a kiss of death as far as the match. So we tell students this is something that's going to help. Last Friday we had an OSCE. A student came in, he actually did really well on the electronic health record part. In the feedback, I asked, were you chewing gum? And he said, I forgot. So even on matters unrelated to the EHR, you'll sometimes see students after the OSCE with a red spot on their head. I shouldn't have done that. I should have washed my hands, or I should have talked with the patient to build rapport before I went to the record. Student performance, the strengths, they maintained eye contact, and that's great. Only a few people just focus on the electronic health record. They stopped using the computer when the patient said, I'm really concerned about this. Am I having too many bladder infections? They stopped. They did patient education. <laughs> they identified a medication allergy, which is a major concern related to patient safety, and they performed medication reconciliation. The student asked about what medications they were taking and dropped a couple from the record when it was found they were no longer taking those. Areas to improve, not confirming the medical history documented in the electronic health record. They didn't go back and actually go through and ask some questions they should have. Not reviewing the social and sexual history. This is still a rather sensitive topic for some students and we emphasize the importance of doing this. And then failing to use the electronic health record in a matter to foster patient rapport and engagement. It's simple as taking the monitor and turning it so the patient could see it. After all, we tell the students the content of the electronic health record is the patient's property. They need to know what's there. And you can actually use this as a teaching tool as you walk through and complete parts of the electronic health record. The project outcomes. Telemedicine, the students are applying the principles. We give feedbacks. We're looking at the data now to present and publish. They do encounter challenges with the technology. We do things like move the camera so that only half of the standardized patient's face is showing. So they actually have to ask the patient to move his camera so they can see. These things are all set up. 
but they're set up to help us identify issues so that we can address those with the students. We've had six peer-reviewed presentations. We have one article, as I said, in publication now. It's been accepted. We turned in the final reviews today. And then the project material shared with other schools. We love to share what we have and get collaborators because we want to spread the word on this. So the main points, use of electronic health records is here. Telemedicine is coming. Schools need to have exposure to these technologies while the student's in medical school. Pablo talked about communication skills. These directly relate to the communication skills our program directors expect on day one. So this is essential information. And thanks to the grant, we were able to form this collaboration, and we still continue work. Questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. We uh, have information if you would like it. Thank you. So I think you can see how vital the communication skills are for practicing physicians. And I just want to point out, being from Oregon, the rural issue is a, a really important one. I'm sure there are rural areas in Texas as well. We have a, a couple of practices that our students work at that don't have parking lots, but they have hitching posts for your horse. So it is rural out there. So um, our next speaker is Jason Satterfield from the University of California, San Francisco. And he and his partner, Becky Blackenberg, are going to be, and Stephanie Harmon, are going to be talking about behavioral and social science teaching opportunities in um, hospital medicine. I'll turn it over to Jason and his team. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jason Satterfield. I'm psychology faculty in internal medicine at UCSF, and I am deeply grateful to be here, particularly with so many beautiful minds and with people who have done so much uh, incredible work. I'll be the first of three speakers representing our partnership between UCSF and Stanford. And we've decided, rather than sort of give you a greatest hits compendium of all the different things that we've done, I wanted to present really the foundational work that we did in the beginning of our partnership where we identified some high need areas. And then our Stanford partners will be presenting a deep dive into just one of those areas where we've really done uh, quite a bit of work in trying to change the culture and trying to change our teachers as well. Uh, as our learners. So we have no disclosures, but I, I do want to express my thanks to our funders. We've been at this since uh, late 2005 through the support of NIH and OBSSR. Uh, and while I'm at it, I want to also thank Patty Carney for making today happen and Lauren uh, for all the work that they've done. For those of you here or those of you who may be uh, watching online, I also wanted to put in a plug for the website that Patty's group has also created. Uh, you can find it at bsscollaborative.org. That's bsscollaborative, all one word, dot org. You will see all of the funded programs there, information about the programs, as well as a robust dissemination directory. So if you hear us referring to papers and to publications, if you want to find them easily, that's the website to go to. So as I mentioned, uh, this is where really we started in our partnership with Stanford, and this was published in Academic Medicine uh, about a year and a half or so uh, ago. And I want to say just a word about how uh, we got here. So in the first half of our funding, like many of the programs, we focused on uh, our classroom curriculum of how do we integrate social and behavioral sciences in a meaningful and clinically relevant way into our classroom curricula. We started with the first two years, but also looked at our clerkship years when our students would come back to the classroom, sometimes weekly, sometimes in intercession periods. But really, the big leap we needed to make was how would we then integrate what they've learned in the, into the classroom into their clinical practices, into their residencies, and beyond. In fact, a lot of the feedback that we got from our learners was, uh, we like what you're doing in the classroom. We think this is important. In fact, this is part of why we came to UCSF. But when we get out into the wards, particularly in inpatient medicine, what you've told us and what they're doing are not the same. 
So they recommended our students to us, if you get another grant, please go to the inpatient side, please work with your residents, work with the faculty so that we're all on the same page uh, in terms of what we mean by social and behavioral sciences and their relevance and importance, their, their essentialness uh, of uh, inpatient medical care. So we decided that what we needed to do then is to roll up our sleeves and get to the front lines, the front lines being in the hospitals, and that's exactly what we did uh, at UC and Stanford. We wanted to look at a couple of different things. We wanted to look at the quality of care, and we were particularly interested in patient-centeredness, of understanding the human being, the rich and unique individual that uh, is sitting in, in front of you. We wanted to look at the quality of teaching, and we had heard some pushback from teachers saying, well, I can't be patient-centered and learner-centered at the same time. It's a zero-sum game, so if you want me to think about patients, I can't think about learners. We didn't agree, and, but we wanted, again, to see if that were true, and we wanted to do that in a data-driven way. We decided that we would focus on attending rounds. There's lots of different care that happens in the uh, inpatient setting, but really the, the quintessential, the prototypical teaching activity is attending rounds or morning rounds. So we wanted to be there right at rounds uh, at the bedside. And we wanted to see if there were indeed these SBS, social and behavioral science, teachable moments occurring at the bedside. And I will say just from a straw poll we had done of our hospitalists, there was a real range of opinions of some saying, absolutely, it's going to be there, and some saying, nope, doesn't really come up uh, at all. So again, we wanted to be data-driven and see what really happens. So this was our design. We did a cross-sectional observational study. We looked at both medicine and pediatric inpatient units at both Stanford and UCSF. So we had four services total, two peds uh, and two uh, in medicine. We, uh, along with a, a medical anthropologist, we iteratively developed an observational tool that we call the OBS tool. It captured team demographics. It captured a, a, a priori created list of social and behavioral science topics. We had about 30 different topics. It also captured how the team responded to those topics once they came up at the bedside. So if a patient mentioned that they were feeling stressed or they were depressed or they had a problem with alcohol, that's a social and behavioral science topic that's been raised at the bedside. Then what did the team uh, do about it? Our data collection method was to send uh, two independent, independent observers to the bedside. Uh, they did not participate in rounds. They were just observers filling out their observation forms. We had a number of different outcomes. We looked for the frequency or the occurrence of SBS topics that came up at the bedside. Uh, we looked at the team response, and we just divided it into uh, a negative response, a minus one, a neutral response, so it was essentially ignored, or a positive response, so the team picked up on it and they went somewhere uh, hopefully useful with it. We also had our observers rate uh, two uh, different scales, one for learner-centeredness with five items and patient-centeredness, also five items. So this is a quick look at our results. We ended up following 80 teams, 40 at UC and 40 at Stanford. Median team size was six. We had 80 attendings, 83 residents, 75 interns. You can see a number of medical students and allied health providers. We observed a total of 622 patient encounters on the inpatient side. So we had a fairly robust sample, and we thought a pretty good idea of what's really happening on uh, attending rounds. The median length was two hours. They saw about eight patients per round. Uh, and about half of them were led by an attending, 25% were led by the resident, and the others were sort of a mix uh, of leadership, and that really varied by service and, and even by uh, university. So here's our outcomes of the 622 patients. 97% uh, had at least one SBS topic that came up at the bedside. The average number of topics that came up, though, was 5.3. So there were five or more topics that came up uh, with most patients. Just to give you an example of some of the most common topics, there were things such as nutrition, uh, referrals, discussions about adherence, social supports, resources, and oftentimes in the context of discharge planning, uh, bringing up issues about, around pain or pain management and patient education. So as you can see, really quite common and I think quite essential and uh, important. The least common topics were about prevention and screening, smoking, unsafe sexual behaviors, gender, sexual orientation, spirituality, and integrative medicine. For those of you who've worked on the inpatient side, you would probably agree that these things oftentimes don't come up. They're just not part of the culture or, or the uh, emphases are just directed in, in other places. In terms of how the team responded, uh, the, the 
number of positive responses was around 38%. So 38% of the time when a uh, social behavioral science topic came up, the team responded positively. They noticed that it came up and they did something with it. But that means that 62% of the time it was either ignored or it was actively devalued. And what that told us is that there was this huge opportunity. So five opportunities per patient on average were coming up and we were missing nearly two thirds of those uh, opportunities, those uh, teachable moments. The least positive responses that we saw were for adherence, for alcohol, smoking, unsafe sex, social supports, and socioeconomic status. Now what about learner-centeredness and patient-centeredness? So again, this is on a one to five scale where five is the best and one is the lowest. You see we were kind of in the middle on learner-centeredness and uh, we were able to verify some of what our learners were telling us is that they weren't getting as much feedback as they would like to get. So this was important uh, for our hospital teams and attendings to know. For patient-centeredness, uh, you can see they were doing a little less well. In fact, there are two items I want to draw your attention to at the bottom. The SDM sh stands for shared decision-making. Shared decision-making setup is asking a patient and or family their preferences and how they want to make decisions. Not everyone wants to do shared decision-making, but it's really up to the patient and you should have that conversation. And then the SDM process, the shared decision-making process, is how they actually went about making a decision. You can see that these scores were actually quite low, so we saw these as really a high-need area. And in the second half of our talk, our Stanford partners will be talking about exactly what we did uh, with shared decision-making. And for those of you who are wondering about the relationship between learner-centeredness and patient-centeredness, essentially we didn't find one. It wasn't a zero-sum game. Some teams were high in both, some teams were low in both, some were good in one, but not necessarily the other. But it didn't seem to be the case if you were pushing uh, more patient-centeredness that you would have less learner-centeredness. So some of the take-home topics, uh, SBS topics occur with nearly every patient encounter. Uh, the number of topics raised was strongly associated with a team's level of patient-centeredness. Stigmatized topics such as alcohol, psychiatric illness, or unsafe sex were raised less often. And although 38% of the teams were responding positively, and I think that's a strength we want to build on, 62% were not responding or were responding negatively, which to us uh, pointed out a really important opportunity. So other take-homes, even within the context of a busy inpatient service where we know that there's a huge pressure for quick turnover of beds and discharge, there is an opportunity to be patient-centered and learner-centered. Our biggest opportunities for improvement were in shared decision-making, both the setup and the process. <coughs> So some of the limitations, we just looked at rounds. We know that there's a lot of visits that occur throughout the day. So there could have been other discussions of social and uh, behavioral science topics. The teams, of course, knew that they were being observed, but they didn't know that we were looking at social and behavioral sciences. They're observed all the time. People join the teams all the time. They really uh, didn't know what the study was about when it was occurring. So the next steps, uh, we carved out a group that we called PEP, the Patient Engagement Project. Uh, we created a partnership with our hospitalists at both universities, and we really rolled up our sleeves and we dove into shared decision making. Thank you, Jason, and thank you again for, ah, yes, I'm a little high challenged. Um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to share this work. As uh, Jason had mentioned, we decided to do a deep dive uh, for shared decision making as this was clearly an area of high needs um, in uh, patient-centered uh, care in the inpatient setting. And so, uh, as you can see, we have uh, quite a Herculean effort across four different hospitals in looking at shared decision making um, in the inpatient setting. We have no um, conflicts of interests or uh, financial relationships to disclose, and again, to just express our deep gratitude and thanks for the support from the NIH and the OBSSR um, in allowing us to proceed with this work. So, as we mentioned, shared decision making, this has really been something that has been studied and developed in the ambulatory setting. Uh, this is something that facilitates patient engagement. We have seen it improve healthcare outcomes in the ambulatory setting, uh, particularly in um, breast cancer patients, and there has been a recent Cochrane review looking at the impact and the improvement of healthcare outcomes 
in uh, the use of decision aids um, for both treatment decisions as well as screening decisions. We know that patients uh, are willing and able to engage in shared decision making, and very little is actually known about how to increase shared decision making in the inpatient setting. So this, the goal of our study was to evaluate the effectiveness of an educational bundle um, on inpatient house staff teams' uh, abilities to do shared decision making during uh, inpatient rounds. So we uh, conducted our study over about a six month period from August 2014 to March 2015. Um, look, this covered um, and spanned uh, four different hospitalist services in both pediatrics and medicine at our two institutions. Uh, we considered the rounding team a unique combination of the hospitalist and their trainee member um, team, as well as that particular date in um, identifying encounters. And we had a repeated, basically cross-sectional study design in which in the, the pre-intervention phase and the post-intervention phase, there were unique patients, but we actually matched hospitalists in those two data collection phases. Our intervention phase itself was approximately eight weeks. Uh, in terms of the data collection, we had uh, basically counted a clinical encounter for observation if the patient or guardian was included in a clinical decision discussion. Um, clinical decision categories included that for treatment decisions, uh, diagnostic workup decisions, discharge planning, um, or um, potentially other categories. Each hospitalist team was observed for three separate days of inpatient rounds. We had 12 peer observers um, who are all physicians in these divisions, uh, and we uh, worked on our inter-rater um, reliability by uh, doing serial, serial video reviews of kind of clinical encounters and discussion with the aim and goal of having our scores on a validated instrument be within one point. And we did this both before our data collection period in the pre-intervention phase as well as during the intervention phase for kind of calibration. Uh, we used a uh, instrument that's been a validated tool in the ambulatory setting called the Rochester Participatory Decision Making Scale, which is a nine item um, clinical kind of behavioral observation tool. And we <coughs> chose to look at team level data. So we gave credit for any of these observed uh, shared decision making behaviors if any team member in that clinical encounter demonstrated them for any of the clinical decisions that we noted in those decision categories. So um, without further ado, this is the um, RPAD or the uh, Rochester Participatory Decision Making Scale um, developed as you would guess at the University of Rochester. And uh, I won't read all the items, but you can see that these are items that are kind of clinical um, communication behavioral uh, uh, tools for communication um, that the observers were all trained to measure and we could calibrate this um, looking at these videos and it's scored on zero to nine points where for each item you could get either no credit, a half point or a full point. In terms of our data collection, we also performed essentially um, kind of concurrent or parallel RPADs for our patients. So we call these the uh, patient or PT RPADs, where we use the scaffold of the RPAD for the clinical observations of the teams to uh, interview patients uh, or guardians of their perceptions of those shared decision-making behaviors. Uh, we had research assistants who were not physicians who were not present during the observations of those inpatient rounds return within eight hours of rounds to interview those patients and guardians. And our, our statistical analysis included within um, the, uh, this period of looking at the RPAD scores, the mean RPAD scores for the teams, um, and the intervention effect looking at the difference between the post-intervention scores and the pre-intervention scores um, by matched uh, hospitalists. In terms of our intervention methods, so this was our educational bundle. So four main categories in which we had kind of interventional uh, tools, education, a campaign, peer support, and audit and feedback. Our uh, educational um, component uh, included train the trainer workshops, which in, had very um, interactive exercises like role play and um, kind of video review with both the hospitalist groups as well as uh, house staff. Um, we um, employed the ask, inform, ask, 
ask model for a kind of a communication strategy for clinicians. Um, our campaign, we adopted methods from uh, quality improvement. So we had posters, screen savers, um, pocket cards, uh, flyers in all the team rooms and um, tips of the week, um, which were kind of emails sent out each week on shared decision making. We had peer support, so um, during the intervention phase, our peer observers were returning to actually do some coaching with the teams and audit feedback in which those peer observers did uh, observe uh, those clinical encounters with those teams on two separate occasions and actually gave kind of report cards based on the shared decision-making behaviors outlined in the RPADs and then followed up with emails with regards to those teams' uh, performances. So with that, I will pass it off to Dr. Blecky, Becky Blankenberg, my colleague. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to share the most exciting part, which are the results. So uh, with this intervention, we watched uh, 35 hospitalist teams pre and 38 hospitalist teams afterwards. With that, we saw 88 ward rounds beforehand and 98 ward rounds after, and this represented uh, 254 unique patients before and um, 387 unique patients afterwards. These were fairly evenly split between pediatrics and medicine, as you can see. We also collected patient surveys, uh, which as you can see are marked in the red there, um, which represented 94% and 97% respectively of the uh, rounding teams. And when it got down to unique patients, represented 59 and 60% of the unique patients before and after the intervention. Probably most exciting, uh, this represents our composite RPAD score. We saw a statistically significant um, increase in our RPAD score as denoted by the faculty observers going from a mean of four out of a scale of nine up to 5.8 after the intervention. We saw an increase actually in all four teams as you can see, um, but the black line denotes the mean across all four services. When we looked at individual items, uh, we saw that all of the items did increase. The red represents the post um, and the blue represents the pre-data. Um, and we're still in the process of looking at those matched hospitalist pairs to see uh, which are statistically significant within the matched pair. In particular, we were look interested in looking at our bottom four scores um, of these items on the RPAD to really see did we move the metric in, the, in these areas. Uh, those are, and going from top to bottom, the physician or team demonstrating that they understand the patient's point of view, the examining barriers to follow through with the treatment plan, the physician and team asking questions, um, asking if there were any questions at the end of their encounter or sometime in their encounter, and then really discussing the uncertainties and alternatives um, associated with these decisions. And we did see an increase in all of these metrics. Interestingly, when we looked at the patient surveys, we didn't see an increase. Um, they started at a very high baseline of 7.3 out of 9 and stayed exactly a mean score of 7.3 out of 9 on the RPAD. We think this demonstrates partly a ceiling effect, but obviously would like to explore it more. Um, despite uh, exciting results, there are always limitations to a study. Uh, the shared decision-making encounters that we saw um, only captured what was seen during rounds. So we know that shared decision-making does take place throughout the day, but because this grew on our work of what medical students would be seeing, witnessing, uh, rounds was the one time we could guarantee that medical students and residents were witnessing these shared decision-making behaviors. Um, in terms of the, there um, definitely could be the Hawthorne effect, though some of the behaviors that we witnessed during our observations would lead us to believe they forgot we were there. There is certainly a selection bias, um, potentially. One of our four services um, selected which patients to go to the bedside on. The other three services actually um, did uh, bedside or hallway rounds with all providers. There were different observers by hospital and by service. For the, uh, for the vast majority of patients, we stayed within our own services. Um, we tried to, uh, to improve our, um, our inter-rater reliability by having videos before and mid-study, and we had good inter-rater reliability during those times. Uh, in terms of patient assessment biases, their health status, recall bias, 
um, desire to please could all affect their um, interpretation of the RPAD. In addition, it may be very difficult for them to distinguish what was shared decision making during the actual rounding time versus the rest of the day. Um, but we balance these with our peer assessments. And then there are limitations to the RPAD instrument. It's a um, wonderful instrument that was validated in the outpatient setting with one-on-one uh, -on -one encounters. But since we were applying it to a team setting um, and also to the inpatient setting, um, there may be some limitations there. In terms of our conclusions, we found that all, all services had a statistically significant improvement, and we saw the 1.8 out of 9, um, which represent a 45% improvement across all services. Uh, interestingly, the patients did not show the same improvement, but as I mentioned before, they started with such a high baseline, it's hard to know if we would have seen an improvement. Um, and so basically we've shown that a brief multimodal intervention can improve shared decision making by inpatient rounding teams uh, as assessed by their peer observers. And that really indeed a cultural shift regarding shared decision making is possible in the inpatient setting. In terms of our next steps, we are doing subgroup analyses right now looking at um, what factors really influence shared decision making. So looking at the type of decision, the timing of the decision, the effects on the uh, rounding teams, team structure and team size, and then also looking at vulnerable populations and also looking as, at adolescents as a subgroup. Um, we're trying to also understand which pieces of the bundle had the highest yield and then really understanding why patients and guardians didn't show an increase. We'd like to acknowledge um, everyone that we've worked with and really our Stanford and UCSF patients and um, pediatrics and me medicine residents and hospitalists and our other collaborators. Thank you. ask our first round of speakers to take seats at this main table so that we can entertain some discussion. One of the things that I hope folks can see is the value of the collaboration that has occurred across these schools. So, you know, Bill, your group was, I don't know how the decision was made to make sure that this advanced to other schools, but a lot of these things would never have happened without this kind of funding. And the other thing that I'm just so tickled by are the manuscripts that are coming out of this important work. So we have two mics on each of the corners here. And Lauren's in charge of the Twitter feed. We have um, how many people are watching online? 120 are watching online. So if they have questions, she's going to manage that. But what I'd love to do is encourage folks who have questions regarding this first session to go ahead and come to the mics. And I'm going to start off because I just can't wait to hear. I just, you know, if no one asks this, I'll be beside myself, so I have to ask it. I want to find out from the UCSF and Stanford group how hard it was to collaborate on this single study across both schools because it's hard to pull off. Yeah, make sure you use the mic so people can hear. It actually was. A, it's been a really rich collaboration. We're still talking about what ne, uh, what additional next steps are coming in terms of future studies. What was really great for us, and I'm a pediatrician, is to really learn from our adult colleagues and vice versa. Um, what we saw on the pediatric side is that we have family-centered rounds, which is fairly integrated across the United States, and yet there are still so many opportunities within family-centered rounds to be more family-centered, and meanwhile to learn with the challenges and the opportunities on the adult side. Um, so we learn both in between services and in between schools. So it's really been, uh, I mean, as you can imagine, a great deal of work, but also a, a lot of fun to uh, establish this collaboration. Um, I, uh, we do have the benefit of having uh, geographic proximity. So we're about 45 minutes apart, and it's probably one of the most gorgeous drives that you can take anywhere. <laughs> um, so we do still, you know, five years later, sort of shuttle up and down the peninsula so that we can meet together in person because we do sort of value the collaboration and the time we spend with each other. I think the other part that's been surprising, and, and as Becky mentioned, for the peds and the medicine folks to work together, together, but also our two universities that have different cultures and serve different patient populations. As we were doing the observations, we would go to the other person's school and the other service. So it was really, I think, a rich learning opportunity. 
The, the other point I wanted to, to bring up is, you know, we um, kind of parachuted into these uh, hospitalist departments into inpatient medicine. Uh, we were right there with them at the bedside, and we were giving them report cards and feedback, and some of which weren't always positive. Um, they were, it was identified information, so they knew what scores were linked to what people, and that was part of our intervention. We showed them when we did the rounding exercise at the bedside, um, these are the SBS opportunities, this is what's being missed. And their response was, well, what can you help us with? We said, where would you like to start? And they said, well, let's go with whatever we're doing least well. And that was shared decision making. So they opened their doors at both universities. They welcomed us in. They helped us, uh, both physicians and staff, uh, to develop these quality improvement programs. So it really took not just our teams, but also the full cooperation of all four units. And I, I think we got some results from it. Awesome. Luce, uh, please do identify yourself, too, Lucinda. Thanks. Uh, Lucinda Main from the Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, and you just almost took my question out of my mouth. Uh, but would you just elaborate a little bit more on the intervention? Sure. So, uh, so the intervention, I and mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we struggle with with um, educational interventions is kind of how do we look at the impact of, you know, a lecture versus a workshop, and you know, we, you know, we. One of the advantages of actually working with hospitalist divisions, hospitalists do quality improvement. They do a ton of quality improvement, and so much of that is about behavior change. And so we actually drew on that kind of expertise to say, we're going to do what we would normally do for skills building, training, you know, workshops, reminders, observation and feedback, and integrate things like basically that, like running a campaign, like hand hygiene. You've got the screensavers, you've got the flyers, the posters, and that was all occurring. I mean, that's both hospitals. So in our inpatient hospital, that was a screensaver on every single workstation, said shared decision making, got SDM, question mark, and with building blocks of kind of ask, inform, ask. And I mean, that, which was huge, but I, you know, I think that that was, Kind of the specifics of the intervention that were, I think, a little more unique around trying to do something educational and combine it with the expertise of quality improvement. Nice. And oh, do we have? Go ahead, Jason. Um, you know, we're still uh, working on trying to tease apart what the, the active ingredient was in, in training because it really was a, a rich and multi-layered bundle. Um, just subjectively, from some of the feedback that we've gotten. I think the report cards were quite effective uh, in getting people's attention because they want to do well. No one wants to do poorly <laughs> in shared decision making. Um, I think though probably um, the most valuable intervention was sending the shared decision making expert to the bedside with a patient and saying, time out, let's rewind. Here's an opportunity to role model shared decision making in front of the team with the real patient. So it wasn't just giving them feedback outside of the encounter, it was there at the bedside showing them exactly what it was that uh, we meant by shared decision making. Nice. Sue. Good morning. Susan Skoshalak at the American Medical Association. Thank you for these really excellent presentations and for the good work. I've got a question for each group and then I'll step aside. I just want to emphasize that you guys are working in the world of practice. It used to be that we felt like we were on the outside looking through the window in, and behavioral and social sciences are at the forefront now, and that's, that's an exciting part. Jim, I'm thinking about the work that you and OHSU are doing on the EHR. We're doing abysmally in medical education and teaching about EHR, less students now with access to EHR than before. It's the number one tool. We won't let students graduate not knowing how to use the stethoscope, but all physicians spend more than 50% of our time on the EHR. So it's on us. Thank you for being a leader in this area. But I'm gonna ask you a more controversial question than that, and that is the students now feel like the clinical skills exam part two is irrelevant. You've seen the national petition going around, and yet you perhaps have a perspective on why at least some form of clinical skills remains important and part of what we do for licensing. So if you could reflect perhaps on that. Pablo, thank you for the work that you all are doing. What you talked about in terms of the measurement was very impressive. I also was impressed with the fact 
that the choosing wisely and making good decisions is only in part related to what physicians feel patient preferences are, and there's a whole number of factors out there. So thinking about what's the next work and next question would be interesting. And then for the partnership in San Francisco with Stanford, very exciting. What, what seems so important there is that the patients don't have the right measure right now. That, that, that Rochester measure is interesting and helpful to us on the inside, but thinking about what, where would you go with developing a measure that would really capture the patient's sense of shared decision making. So thanks for letting me ask each of you a question. So let's go to Jim to start with. You've had a couple of minutes to think. Yes, thanks for the thinking time. So. <laughs> the step two CS. Most students do really well on that exam. And so I can see why many students don't see the value. But the failure rate, at least the last time I looked, was around 3 to 4%. And those 3 to 4% who go out present real issues for themselves and for their future patients. They are in jeopardy in residency because we emphasize the skills that are assessed on that exam. And if a student goes into residency and doesn't do well, they will not fare long. Patient-wise, we discussed this in a recent meeting. One of my colleagues is a family physician. He's in a practice at UT Medicine. One of his patients, a faculty member, was referred to a specialist in San Antonio. The specialist examined the patient, recommended some treatment, and the patient said, I'm concerned about this. I don't know if I want to do this. The specialist promptly answered, I'm the physician. You're going to do what I say. Needless to say, that report came back to my colleague. He's not going to send that specialist any more patients. So this is a career issue. And I like the shared decision making that's been discussed. And that's something that I'm going to take back from this meeting, that we need to ingrain this in the students. This is a career issue, as well as related to patient-centered care. So I think that's why many students at the end of our OSCE say, thank you. It's a good chance to get feedback. It really boosts their ego because most people do well on the exam. But for a few people, we have people in the Clinical Skills Center who watch these students go from first year, second year, to third year now. And we say, this student didn't do well. The people in the Clinical Skills Center say, we're not surprised. So they continue to go through. They need to change. Thank you, Jim. Pablo. Uh, hello. So uh, let me know if I am actually answering the question, because I actually, um, so I'll take, a, I'll take a stab at this. So I think, um, one of the ways going forward is that you know there, there's a lot of challenges in terms of these OSCE stations. The behavioral sciences and the communication skills, um, I mean, it's one thing to actually say, yes, we need to teach them, but these EPAs, for example, are made up of so many complex things. I mean, these are measurements of expected work outcomes, and they're made up of individuals' various competencies. So to be able to, to have a conversation with the patient about value-based care requires you know, fundamental knowledge, again, of the of some underlying basic science principles, evidence-based medicine, uh, and then, of course, quality and safety, so on and so forth. But there are several challenges, and I think part of the challenge moving forward is we don't really have a national stick on what's the right way to do this. Um, so our attempt is actually to look at this issue from two different schools, um, but it's sort of a national pro problem. So if you have these entrustable uh, professional activities uh, and and the activity number four is that you'll be able to uh, talk to a patient about a, a particular test ordering. What does that actually mean? 
So every institution is coming up with its own way of trying to figure out what that actually means, and that doesn't necessarily mean choosing wisely. Um, so we do, that's how we defined it. So again, um, and I think everyone's sort of in, in this pilot mode trying to figure out what that means and how to actually even do this. Um, one interesting preliminary data that actually is very, it's, that we just got uh, yesterday, we had, we had our first 47 students actually go through our OSCE station just at Einstein uh, related to the low back pain. And they actually did fairly well with the, the typical history ele asking elements on the station related to low back pain. They, they kind of knew this is not an urgent situation because of the nature of the questions they were asking. They didn't do as well on some of the communication skills because we, again, this is pre a full intervention in terms of what are the right things that I should say uh, to reassure the patient to actually meet the patient where they're at. But what was very interesting was something actually more fundamental that was actually below that. And you wouldn't find that in any of our competencies is that students actually don't know how to do a good musculoskeletal exam. So that's brand new that just came out um, from knowing that. So that wasn't something we factored in, but it makes sense. And we know that's a national problem is that how can I eliminate that this is not an emergency situation and then go on to have that conversation if I haven't mastered that skill. So there's a lot of room to still go that we need to, and again, this is context specific. So if you move on to the next choosing wisely recommendation, it can change around a, a lot again. So I don't know if I answered totally the question, but thank you. <laughs> uh, your question about creating measurements for that that would properly assess what patients see as shared decision making. I think there needs to be a lot more qualitative work. I think a lot of us are struggling with how to best use patient measures um, to best understand if, if we are capturing what they want in terms of shared decision making, in terms of um, that patient uh, communication. And so I think part of it really needs to go back to qualitative studies to really assess what factors um, f would feed into those tools and rubrics. So I only wanted to add, especially in this day and age of kind of press gainy and HCAP scores, you know, a lot of those questions actually ask patients about, you know, did they feel like they were heard? Um, did your doctor include you in the treatment plan? And, you know, I think um, just to echo Becky, it just we and those tools are being widely used, and there's really not much in terms of a basis for, you know, are those the right measurements? Do they those really reflect that patients are? Um, you know, satisfied that they're getting engaged and that their clinicians are engaging them. And, you know, those, those um, Prescan and HCAP tools are being used to make major, clin basically, clinical practice um, decisions about how care is delivered. I mean, it's, it's kind of remarkable. So there's a lot of work to do. My sense from talking with the, the patients, and, you know, I think we have to remember when a patient's hospitalized, it's often a very uh, fearful, emotionally charged time. And part of what we were hearing from patients really wasn't based on those individual RPAD questions. It was, I feel like I'm in good hands. My team is really smart. I'm being taken care of. So there was a, a big element of gratitude and satisfaction and confidence in the team. And it really didn't seem like it was about shared decision making the way that we meant it. So we need to find another way to try to elicit that from patients because what we used clearly didn't work. Tom. Hi, Tom Anui, Indiana. I, I have um, a, a question uh, and a jump ball, basically. I'm from Indiana. So, <laughs> so <laughs> a, anybody can respond to the jump ball. I'll, I'll give you it. Uh, some years ago, uh, we uh, were interested in um, what was initially f uh, framed as a, a just say no initiative inside the Harvard Community Health Plan and came to the conclusion that this was one of the um, core challenges of working inside a cost conscious um, environment, uh, trying to do the right thing for patients but also for the enrolled community, the population. Uh, that look to us for their care. So we developed, uh, or my colleagues in the teaching center developed a, um, a scenario that became a, a video trigger tape and uh, uh, it was one in which a, a young man, a runner, presented himself uh, for care requesting an MRI of his knee because his times were not up 
to his expectations, and he felt as though he was having some discomfort in his knee. Long story short, there were no indications that would lead you to believe that an MRI would be helpful in this setting. And so uh, the assignment after the trigger tape for the those who chose in the exhibit space of an American College of Physicians meeting to volunteer to um, uh, show us, camera pointed at them, what they would say just for openers to this somewhat demanding, uh, probably works for fidelity um, <laughs> patient who was clear that he needed an MRI. And there was a secondary tape that said, you're making money, aren't you? From the bottom line, I question your ethic in this situation. You have a conflict of interest. So we, we had a two-stage, uh, just face the camera and tell us what you would say for openers. It reminded me of your question. Since it was a camera and this was um, not in person, it was a bit of a telemedicine yeah, occasion, and about one-third of these ACP meeting attendees, when the red light turned on, quit Ooh. and said, this is unreasonable. I didn't know I would be facing this kind of a situation. I have no idea what to say. And they left. We came to the conclusion we were touching an important challenge and that uh, people felt de-skilled in this area. And I wonder if we might, uh, d d here, here comes the jump ball, think about um, uh, uh, these kinds of interactions going on in a telemedicine context, the graduate pool of uh, boarded physicians who are in practice, who are struggling with this, uh, adding to the Stanford 21, you know, or whatever it is now. I'm not sure what the number is now this kind of core. So that, that's the gem ball. I, I had one other, which is um, a beautiful essay in the Annals of Internal Medicine this week said, we should stop saying, do you have any questions for me or us? And start asking, uh, what questions do you have for us now? And it may, maybe that would come closer to touching uh, some of the uh, <laughs> cognitive content that we're trying to exchange. but. Uh, I was kind of impressed at 38% of the content uh, being touched by rounds, and it reminded me that only 5% of the empathic opportunities are touched. So it may be that in the emotional dimensions of this interaction, there's more to think about and talk about than there is in the on the cortex um, shared decision making, explicit content. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. As usual, Tom has, uh, who's quite provocative, has touched on things that are just crucially important for, I think, us to think about. And I, you know, I'm going to turn it over to the group. Hopefully, they're chewing this over. But I just think we un we do not appreciate the complexity of what's involved here, and that's why I so appreciate the fact that this entire effort was funded so we could work on understanding that. I think that's huge. Now, um, I'm going to turn this back over to the panel to, to respond. So who wants to go first? I think one of the things you touched upon is, is that training over, over all of our years of practice and that um, these are skills that many of us are continuing to develop. and. Um, I think one of the things we found was so helpful in our in the camp the educational campaign that we did was the peer mentoring and just really entering that space and giving hospitalists attending and some of them pretty senior an opportunity to say yeah, this is really tricky what do I do when my medical student says X how do I nicely preserve their autonomy and yet lead us in the right direction or how do I personally use these words and I loved your point about the what questions do you have. We actually train them to specifically say what questions do you have because it, it really, it, it, it's a very simple way of changing the dynamic in the room to assume that there would be questions and that there would be an interchange and dialogue. But I agree, this is something we need to continue to, um, to teach all of our practitioners to do and to, and to make it a safe space that it may not, these may be skills that continue to need to be developed. 
Tom, thank you for your question, and I think it's, a, a as usual, a multi-layered and rich one. Um, I, I, I think it, it is, you know, as we know, important to teach things like uh, communication skills and conflict management and negotiation. But, but for me, the piece that really stands out from that particular example is the importance of teaching emotional management skills or what some might call emotional intelligence. And um, it's not that people who find that difficult are emotionally unintelligent. It's just that it's an advanced skill that can be quite difficult. I mean, medicine is oftentimes a very intimate encounter which you can't help but personally feel. And it takes a great deal of resources and expertise to be able to understand what you're feeling, why you're feeling it, and how to respond in the most constructive way. Jim. Just dealing with the issue of complexity with technology we're dealing with students who aren't interacting with real patients. They're simulated. But there are struggles that they have to deal with the patient. And both the telemedicine and the electronic health record OSCE, I am always struck by how adept students are at focusing on the patient while dealing with the frustrations of an electronic health record. It's amazing through many encounters I've observed, I leave the room after the feedback session and think, wow, I want this person to be my physician, regardless of the specialty they go into. A few definitely need help. But the frustration of dealing with technology is there. Amazingly, most students don't show it, even though they verbalize it during the feedback session. So certainly more needs to be done. And I think teaching interactions like this, especially with feedback, are valuable in changing behavior because most people want to do it well. So, and just, so I'm echoing everything that everybody else else has already said. So it's great that we're doing uh, the teaching of these communication skills and it's important to have the visibility of role models who are actually saying that this is okay to have these dialogues and discussions. Um, I think the, the, the next big challenge, like we don't need another one, but there is, and it's actually the productivity demands, which ironically, for example, the EHR adds to that. I mean, um, our learners are actually sitting in offices, in practices, watching doctors with panels that are enormous, five charts on your door, and uh, an electronic medical record, which um, no matter how facile you are, sometimes gets in the way, um, and actually, and just the whole cognitive load of the demands that are on there, which actually works against actually having these very uh, communication skills that actually need to happen. And I think the problem is, is that we, um, at least, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I think it's time to start addressing how we actually do, how does a doctor actually cope with that with that wave. The EMR was supposed to make things easier, and we know that that's not actually true, so. Sorry, the, the only thing I would add as well is um, to, to underscore the, this, the concept of the modeling that's occurring with attending faculty residents getting feedback for the students, for the students to see that process, you know, kind of thinking about coaching as a lifelong process, um, like a la Atul Gawande, uh, I think um, I'm a palliative care doc um, by training, and one of the things um, that is interesting is that, you know, I, I think, uh, Tom, as you had mentioned, you were at a, a conference with, these are all practicing providers, these are all folks who are in practice who struggle, and, you know, there is just a, a recent poll of um, practicing physicians on discussing end-of-life care, and, you know, there's a big, still a big gap um, of, Everyone thinks it's important and only 10, 15% actually can do it or do it. And so this idea of saying, you know, coaching, getting feedback on things like communication skills on the areas that are tough where our emotions are high, the stakes, um, the stakes are high, and um, thinking about strategies like coaching, like um, peer feedback is something that's, that can be um, a lifelong learning skill. Any other questions from the audience or from the Twitter? What are your questions? <laughs> I'm sorry. What are the other questions? I'm going to turn this over. Have Lauren um, 
address the Twitter. Yes, thank you. And thanks to Isabel Estrada, who's watching in our office and helping me manage Twitter, because I don't use it. So um, <laughs> we have a question from Lauren Beach, and I think this is for the UCSF Stanford folks. Um, are there plans for a later point to see how long the effects of the intervention last? It would be lovely to do. I think we could, we definitely could do it at the medicine um, sites. Uh, since finishing the study, the two pediatric sites have become part of the bedside IPASS study, which is looking at family-centered rounds and how we improve family engagement. And so it's a, so it, those site, it would be hard to know which of the two interventions made a difference, but it's a great question. But we could certainly look at it um, at the medicine side. I have one other question. Uh, this says, we are seeing teaching EHRs being developed. How does a tool separate it, separated from care compare to the real life experience? This is from Tyler Simon. Well, you, we use EPIC training ground. And the students get trained in EPIC before they start the clerkship. This is a separate area from any patient chart, so they can't get into the actual EPIC, which is good. They can go in at any time with the training ground, look at the charts, get a feel for EPIC. The interesting thing is some people take full advantage of that, so they're very facile in using the chart. On the other hand, others delay. They look at EPIC the night before, those are the people who really get frustrated. So there is a separate area. And that's one of the things the folks at Oregon helped set us up. They already had the charts that we could put into EPIC. They use EPIC as well. So that saved a lot of time and energy. So I'll, I'll just add a, a little comment to that. So one of the things we're innovating at at OHSU is the medical students get a panel of patients fake patients in an EHR that they start managing the first week of school. And so they're, and then they, that patient group, um, we add illnesses and issues that link to the curriculum over time to try to help get them both using this, understanding how events change, and having them feel more like a doctor right from the start. And so, and then we put, we load some errors in there to try to help them understand and find these errors in the EHR. Um, so that's one of the things that we're also trying to do because we recognize this as a big problem that we're not teaching that depth. Yeah, I would just like to comment on the uh, teaching EMR uh, as a just another option. Um, Indiana University has made their production system into a clone that can be used for medical schools around the country where they not only have um, simulated patient data included but real uh, de-identified scrub data available to medical students day one of medical school. So many engaging, thanks to the AMA for Amen. their involvement in this yeah. as well. I, I think one of the things you can see is how we're now all starting to recognize how important research in medical education is becoming more and more. And, but it's hard to get, hard to find funding to do these things, but it's critically important. And it would be great if the medical schools were flushed, but they're not. They are quite lean, um, so doing these things is a challenge. Um, any remaining questions or comments before we take a break? We have three minutes if anybody wants to make any other comments. Okay, so the good news is that we, one of the big things that I think has come out of this morning session is our faculty aren't really prepared to do the things we want. They're not role modeling the behavior that we've tried to show in undergrad and a lot, and Rita's, Rita's awesome. I mean, she's just, she's in the next session. But now we're gonna turn after the break to really looking at what are the kinds of novel approaches that can be done to really change professional development out there. So that's what we'll be focusing on after the break. So let's do that now, and then we will reconvene at uh, 10.30. Thank you. We're good? Okay, so we're gonna reconvene. We're ready for our second session. And um, you know, just, just hearing the hum in the room, this is so cool and so much fun. 
Um, that we have been planning for this meeting for so long, and we are just thrilled. It's so cool to see the culmination of so much work that's gone on at these schools. Um, and the next session, we're going to be focus focusing on innovations in professional de development and reflective narrative writing that focuses on the social and behavioral sciences. And so our first um, session is with Deb, Lit Deb Litzelman from Indiana University and Rachel Brown from the University of Missouri. That's their partnership. And they're going to be talking about using narrative and reflective writing in support of patient and relationship-centered care. So Deb and Rachel. All right, thank you so much, Patty, and thank you so much for the speakers early this morning. This is a, a great middle section. I think the day will build on itself uh, nicely. So I am um, honored to be here with our uh, consortium schools and all, all of you who are participating uh, to tell you about um, the work that we've been doing over 10 years, some of us, five years for others of us. Um, I'm presenting for the Indiana group, and my partner, uh, Rachel Brown, will be presenting for our Missouri, University of Missouri team, uh, and we'll kind of team tag it. I will start and close, and Rachel will provide some updates and a little deeper dive to the work they're doing at University of Missouri in our, the middle segment. So like uh, some of the speakers this morning, I wanted to back up a little bit to talk about the work that we had done in the first leg of this from 2005 to 2011. Um, we were fortunate to be one of the early schools that received um, uh, support from the NIH, OBSSR. And uh, like Jason, we at Indiana felt that we had a lot of work to do in our behavioral, uh, in our basic science years to um, really improve the social science content and learning that was occurring there. So we spent a lot of those first years really working hard to create new curricular content. You see there that we had 48 team-based learning experiences and problem-based learning experiences that were cre created uh, anew. Uh, we integrated standardized patient experiences for the application and practice learning. Um, and we also layered this through not only the existing uh, basic science courses, but through the curriculum and intercessions and that uh, sort of thing. So it was really deeper in the first two years, but really a, a broad brush of uh, looking carefully at what were gap areas and trying to sprinkle it around. We also felt very strongly that um, dealing uh, with improvements in the formal curriculum was a first important step, but was um, would need to have focus on our informal curriculum as well. So we uh, did some, I think, really early and I think pioneering work, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, the area of uniting the formal and informal curriculum. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And then even in the first uh, leg of this, in the first five years, we did work with faculty development. Uh, again, it was more focused on helping faculty know how to integrate the social and behavioral sciences into these TBL sessions, PBL sessions, et cetera, and using active learning methods. So a lot of effort put in that um, first five years. In terms of outcomes, we, um, we uh, sadly had BSS scores uh, with our USMLE in those early years that were below the national average, but we could say at the end of those five years that we had moved those scores to above the national average. Uh, and USMLE, BSSS, uh, for the campuses where we intervened and not for the others. So we did feel that there was at least that sort of uh, um, quantitative measurement of outcomes that we could say and attribute to NIH's efforts to, to help move us forward. Similarly, with our AAMC graduation questionnaires and the specific questions, as many of you know, that are focused on behavioral and social science understanding as perceived by the students, we were below average on many of those questions at the beginning and improved across the five years. So important outcomes. Um, regarding our uh, vision of how we might begin to think about impacting the informal curriculum, a tough, a tough uh, beast to tackle, 
Um, we really began early on, it was really with the help of my co-PI, Tom Anui, that we started thinking about journaling and narrative reflective writing even in those early years. So we integrated journaling into many aspects of our curricular reform and then took though, those journals and uh, built them into this, this circle of this unification of formal and informal curriculum. Nothing more powerful than the eyes of our students writing stories about what they were seeing and experiencing um, wherever they were, wh whether it was the basic science classroom or cadaver lab or in their clinical rotations of what they were seeing and learning um, and what was being re role modeled both positively about behavioral and social sciences and negatively um, so that they could be held up and used for conscious reflection was really this important part of the curricular improvement part of that circle to say how can we all collectively reflect consciously on what's going on here to build it back into the curriculum to improve. When we analyzed in a very careful qualitative way um, those entries that students put into those journals, we were able to easily identify all six of the behavioral and social science domains of the IOM report in the narratives of the students. So without even trying, we had cur real curricular content emerging from our uh, uh, the students' observations. So it's very interesting to hear the work by Jason et al. Uh, from the, the uh, West Coast scene that's occurring on the, in the rounds as well. Um, so uh, as we together looked for a partner um, and moving into the, the next five years of the, the R25, we said, where, where can we best work? And we um, had clearly been focusing on our informal curriculum, on the importance of our role models. We knew we were making headway with a core of our faculty, our teaching faculty, but we said, wow, this really needs to be done at a deeper, more uh, a broader level with our focus at Indiana on a relationship-centered care environment to impact more of the faculty who would be prepared and ready uh, as the students came forward with their observations and reflections to know what to do with this real time at the bedside. Um, we found a great partner in uh, University of Missouri in that they had been working for many years on a patient-centered uh, curriculum that were very thoughtfully being built into their PBL curriculum and we moved forward with a, a, a deep focus with one of our aims which is written there uh, focusing on faculty development and that's what we'll speak most about today. So we um, began um, as a, a team, um, IU and uh, MU, uh, and we uh, began with intensive faculty development efforts. We did a kickoff with one of our favorite people in the world, Rita Sharon, who came and uh, I said, Rita, we're going to put you to work. She said, put me to work. So, oh my gosh, we put her to work. She came and did her grand rounds for uh, our school that started about 6.30 or 7 in the morning and then said, Rita, we're going to put you through workshops. She said, just bring them on. We had uh, three back-to-back -back workshops. Uh, so total, the impact of people touched on that day just in those formal activities were about 200 people uh, where she did uh, formal workshops uh, around nar narrative medicine. Uh, even at the noon hour, we said, okay, uh, Rita, you have, we'll give you a box lunch, but we're going to put you to work, uh, where we had a, a strategic planning lunch, if you remember, with uh, the people from Missouri who came physically to join us, but then uh, with a video conference to other members at, in Missouri where we used that lunch hour uh, with the energy, the positive energy ongoing, to do some strategic planning about what these intensive faculty development workshops should look like for the year. We came up uh, with four major topics you see listed there and uh, had planned to do four-hour intensives around in communication, self-awareness, uh, the reflective process. Uh, we also moved on later to do, following that, to do some maintenance kinds of sessions, uh, all based on writing, reflection, and uh, at the faculty level, how you then take that back to the bedside and apply it use it in creative uh, ways. After the first leg of this work in the first year, moving into year two, we realized that it was really difficult to get faculty to free up four hours at any point in time and so that we needed to 
to recalibrate, rethink about this, and that led us to our year two work with MU uh, and creating these briefer sessions where we again had a, a wider variety of topics, um, just more often, and um, we ended up doing many of these uh, with the Missouri folks over uh, video conferencing over a noon hour. Worked very well, um, and we had a lot of energy. We shared uh, facilitating, co-facilitating with our partner school. Um, we moved from the topics you see there, the professionalism seminars. Somebody asked me earlier about our appreciative inquiry. We certainly taught about that, thought about that, figured out how you can apply that in real live um, real-time situations, um, and then moved more recently, even in that time frame, but as we see ourselves evolving to interprofessional education and improvement, which many of our schools are working on. So I'll stop there and let Rachel talk a little bit more about her work at MU. So thank you. I'm Rachel Brown. I'm going to speak uh, fairly briefly, of course, as all, we all are doing about the work we've been doing at the uh, University of Missouri. As Deb's already said, um, one of the things that was really good to start off with was to see the alignment between the Indiana University School of Medicine's focus on relationship-centered care and ours at the University of Missouri on what we call patient-centered care. Um, we started out by looking at the strengths that we already have in place at uh, our medical school. Um, we have a lot of alignment of our educational programs. We have a well-developed mission and vision um, and key characteristics of our graduates that include a lot of the behavioral and social science competencies, things like the ability to collaborate and communicate, uh, the ability to work on quality and safety. Um, one of the things we did early on, I'm going to come to it again in the next slide, was to think about whether we really needed to think again about those key characteristics, and we did make some changes in those, which informed some of the educational interventions we did going forward. A um, couple of other things that I think is important, we, had, uh, we have at that point a, a developing student portfolio that we redesigned so that we had the technological basis that would enable our students to write stories that they could either keep privately for themselves, share with limited groups of faculty and peers, or have available to share widely across the school. And we've continued to use that as we've built more narrative strategies into our educational programs. And then the other thing that I did want to say that I think is a strength for us is that student programs, which is where I come from, and I do admissions and student affairs at our school, is part of an integrated medical education office. And that means that some of the territorial battles that go on around student well-being and wellness and so forth, we didn't have to have because we were already working together on those issues. So, oops, I went the wrong way. I Okay, so our first steps were to look and see what we could I improve, and we looked to see um, what we needed to develop. We reviewed our key characteristics, mission, and vision. Um, we worked with uh, Indiana, as you've already heard, on some pretty intensive faculty development, and that was especially focused on the narrative steering group, which I chair and includes a number of other faculty members who've come and gone over the years that we've been involved in, in the grant, but has had some very consistent education leaders as part of it to think about how we, uh, the development that we needed and then how we can implement new approaches. And some of the early work that we did was to think about how narrative could be, um, uh, uh, what kind of narrative strategies we would be using, what kind of definitions we would have around the use of narrative at our university. And so this is the definition that we came up with. I know that narrative medicine means lots and lots of different things to lots of people, and that's one of its strengths. We really felt that we needed some specificity about what that would mean for us as we implement narrative as a strategy with our students. So we t thought about it as being a strategy that is specifically in, in the service of the development of our MU key characteristics, and one of the ones that we changed and emphasized was we had always had our final one key of our eight key characteristics had always been lifelong learning. And we changed that to say that our graduates would be lifelong learners and would focus on their own professional development. And so a lot of the narrative strategies that we implemented for our students were about that focus on professional development. 
I like this list of words, so I put them up there for you, particularly the one that one of the things that writing does for us, any of us who write, is it brings together the cognitive and the emotive and allows us to, to utilize both of those sides of our thinking together and really to tap into, at times, the things of which we are not aware, but that which impact on our um, relationship with our students, with each other, and most particularly on our relationships with our patients. And some of the most um, life-changing narrative experiences I've had when I've written something and looked at it and been surprised by its contents. Um, and so here are also our goals, which we also um, wanted to think about. Um, one of the things, I've, I've already said that one of the ways in which we wanted to use, na use narrative was in the support of the development of professional identity, both for ourselves and also for our students. So as we moved forward, and I know this focuses on faculty, but one of the things I wanted to show you was one of the new educational interventions that we've done for our students at the University of Missouri. One of the things for us to know is, of course, that, that is hard and is hard to remember is that every time a student comes to medical school, a physician comes to medical school. And that's a physician that's in that student's mind. And so we started at the beginning with orientation and we re redesigned our orientation to allow time for the story that the student brings with them to medical school, give time for that story to interact with the story that we want to tell about how we want to educate them. So we developed a three session orientations, uh, set of three sessions in orientation, we call it the journey to the white coat. And the first thing our students do when they come to medical school is write. And they write in response to a prompt that asks them to talk about what inspired them to consider a career of service in medicine. And then later in the week, they revisit those stories in the light of the key characteristics that we've told them about. And they develop content, 12 statements that they want to be, to be read at their white coat ceremony. And a whole 108, one for each student, but they're developed as groups that will be part of their um, program at the White Coat Ceremony. I'm going to briefly mention uh, three outcomes of that. Um, the first one is what kinds of stories do our students write? And, and we have lots, of, we've done lots of analyses of the student stories over the last three years. Um, but this is just a sample of what some of the stories look like. We've done lots of thematic analysis looking to see what kinds of people and experiences inspire our students. And I simply wanted to share some of those so that you can read them and see what they look like. So that's the first outcome. The second outcome is what's read at the white coat ceremony. And so the students develop they write their stories, they interact with the key characteristics, they work in small groups to develop statements, eight statements per small, per small group, and then they vote on the ones that they want to be read at the white coat ceremony. It gives them a voice in the ceremony, but it also, for both the students and for the faculty, emphasizes that we, they didn't just start out, they're not neophytes, they're not new to medicine, <coughs> They have had previous experiences, and there's a physician in, in, inside each of them. And it's our job to shape that physician. And that shaping, hopefully, for all of us, will continue for the rest of our professional lives. So here are the top five statements from the entering class of 2013, which was the first year that we did this with our students. And one of the things that was striking was how struck our faculty were by the altruism that the students expressed. And so one of the things we've wondered about is whether or not um, student cynicism is actually a reflection of faculty cynicism about students. You know, you hear an awful lot of negatives about students, especially as they get into their first year. They're only interested in the boards, they're only interested in the money, they don't really want to be patient-centered. And if you have something like this and the faculty hear it, then the faculty can't go around saying you students are not as altruistic as we would like them to be because this is what our students wanted to be read about them. And then the final piece, which I think we've continued to work on, is how to incorporate what the student, how to continue the opportunity for us to be in dialogue for our students and with our students about their professional identity. Um, and we're continuing to work on that. Um, but one of the things that we do 
during orientation, right after they write their stories, develop their statements, so that it's up on their portfolio homepage, which is where they go for all of their assignments, all of their enrollments, all of their evaluation, all of their information, is a word cloud that's developed from their statements. Oh. And that's the class of 2013's word cloud. And it's the word cloud that you would want them, you would want them to develop, I think. And so that word cloud is there on their portfolio homepage every time they open it, along with their 12 statements that they chose as a class. And it's also leads orientation for each of the years going forward. That's what pops up on the screen as the first slide. And it's also part of what we use to help them work uh, uh, on the other interventions that, that we're doing with them, that helps them to, uh, uh, and partic is particularly part of a new uh, uh, curricular innovation called Compass, which places our students in small groups with students from each of the classes together over time with two uh, guides, Compass guides, haha, isn't that cute? Um, and it's contemplating medicine, physician, patients, self, and society. And we've continued to use narrative as part of that. Now, I want to hand it back to Deb because she's going to talk a bit more about the kind of faculty development we need to continue to do in order to support this kind of work. And I'm conscious that we have a red light, so I'll be brief. I, I'll highlight two important outcomes for IU that I think are um, worthy of, of mentioning briefly here. So we did, in, as part of our efforts uh, in the second five years, focus on a department that had had lower scores in terms of students' ratings of satisfaction and even perceptions of uh, humane and uh, behavioral social science um, modeling. It was the department of ob -GYN. They uh, willingly worked with us. We had, they had new leadership. Uh, they, they embraced this concept. They had the majority of their faculty enroll in the intensive uh, faculty development programs. Um, and they began uh, recruiting faculty using a behavioral uh, model into their organization. Um, a chapter that was written by their chair and their uh, vice uh, chair for education will be coming out in uh, Cruz and Cruz's book on professionalism, reporting their department as a really a case report of how they, I think, really changed the culture, um, changed the scores that they were receiving by students about the perceptions of what they were seeing role modeled at the bedside, um, and even going from residents who were perceived as malignant to those who were receiving the highest percentage of, of gold humanism awards. Um, one other more quantitative outcome that I thought might be of interest to many of you um, is an important paper that has just come out, um, I think important paper, um, in a pre-press uh, pre here from academic medicine from one of our PhD students, Lisa Hoffman, who as part of her uh, work did a project in medical education, chose to do it with our behavioral and social science team and um, actually used our narrative of uh, reflections that were written by student in our medicine clerkship uh, and did an, a, a very important case control study. So she identified cases of students who had had professional lapses as documented in our student promotion and tenure, uh, or st a student uh, promotion review uh, group, uh, identified controls from our school of medicine class who had had no professional lapses. Uh, the 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 study team did a careful analysis of students' reflections using a rubric developed by Patricia Sullivan and others at UCSF and scored those and showed that reflective scores for students in the case group were significantly lower than those in the control group and importantly that a lower reflection score is associated with an increased likelihood of being cited for a professional lapse. So this is an important correlational study of course but all of us, many of us in this room have been spending 10 years believing that if we have students that come in um, who, uh, who are maybe lower on their ability to reflect that we can teach this and that, uh, that our hopefully our goal is that, that is this correlation is also predictive. <laughs> um, I had a lovely uh, reflection but I think for the sake of time we'll skip that. 
um, but it was really reflecting a faculty member who was highly competent, who also had a, just amazing uh, mentorship in terms of the cognitive, emotional um, roles that she played for those ob -GYN students. Uh, again, uh, acknowledgments, thank you, thank you, NIH, OBSSR, and all the folks who have helped us with this work. Well, that just underscores that we're all a work in progress, right? All of us. Um, so our next session um, on narrative medicine is with Sue Estroth, the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, and Nancy King for Wake Forest. And they're going to be talking about why BSS bioethics and medical humanities belong together in the 21st century. And their slides are awesome. Thank you. And I want to recognize our third partner in crime here, Barry Saunders, who's sitting right there. Um, raise your hand. Uh, so Nancy and I are going to try to do a ta tag team match here. Um, we have uh, something I think that's a little bit unique about all these partner schools. Nancy and I first started working and teaching together when neither one of us had any gray hair. <laughs> so that tells you something. So um, what we're trying to do here is uh, reframe the discussion uh, for the way that we think about these issues in our department and have for over three decades, and that is that um, BSS really is more B to the second power SSMH. We added the M because we didn't think it would look good with just the H after the two S's. Uh, we have always included humanities and social sciences as part of what we do. Humanities including literature, history, philosophy, the arts. Uh, so we want to kind of pitch that to you today. Uh, sharing perspective shift with some of our colleagues. This is a photograph that um, I use to introduce the students to our course. Um, I spent a lot of time out in the woods and I was fooling around one day thinking, you know, we think about trees growing up from roots, but what if they're actually go growing down and they came down from on high? So if you shift your perspective, you'll see a torso and two legs going up, right? So this is the same process that we want our students to go through. Um, and along with the previous presentation, our first written assignment for the students is they write their own illness narrative. We do this before we send them out to write other people's narratives. So Nancy. I have a cold and I apologize in advance because I'm kind of croaky. So Sue's going to do most of the talking. but. Wake Forest as uh, the junior partner um, in this enterprise um, still came to this with all these same principles that um, um, BSS and medical humanities and bioethics are both fundamental and they absolutely both need each other. Um, the previous presenters mentioned conscious reflection. We focus on critical reflection. I'm educated as a lawyer, so I can teach faculty how to be uh, devil's advocates and teach students that devil's advocacy is okay so that you can get discussion going in class. Um, it's practiced in small groups. Faculty learn from each other. And um, we look at this as a matter of a broad interdisciplinary overview um, uh, to bring fundamental knowledge. Um, on my first day of law school, I had a faculty member stand up and say, I know a little law and I know how to go and find a lot more. And that's a perspective that I think is coming late to medical education where everybody thinks it's got to be all in your head. But when I first heard um, um, a clinician say, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll find it and we'll talk about it tomorrow, I thought, aha. for uh, our next few minutes uh, to talk about when to do BSS or B2 SSMH interventions, uh, whether you start from an extant program as we did or if you're creating a new one. As we did. <laughs> right. 
um, expanding the social sciences, and I have to say, as an anthropologist, I found that uh, entering into the uh, KO7 and then R25 world, I thought we were little light on social sciences. Um, so expanding to social epidemiology, population health, science and technology studies, humanities and medicine, and bioethics. So then we're going to move to how. How do you develop and fund faculty, acquire curriculum time? Everybody has these same issues. Uh, how you get located, cross-course coordination. Um, the most often used curse word, in my opinion, in our school is integration. I call it the I word. And how do we extend into clinical training? And then what are the outcomes we're looking for? We're looking for physician scholars, MDs and PhDs. There's a whole new generation of MD, PhDs and things other than basic science who are really going to carry this forward the next step. We want engaged and informed clinicians, and we want system savvy t um, pra practitioners. So a little bit about context. Um, this is what we face when our students come in, right? Basic science rules, step one, hysteria is worse than it's ever been. Um, the students are already worried about match, right? Then we have this idea, um, our courses have now been called Professional Development One and Two instead of Medicine and Society, and part of that um, is because we've changed our curriculum. So um, this issue of thinking and feeling that's so out there. Um, so we have the how doctors think. Um, and unfortunately, the one in the middle is sometimes they think that way. The problem is not that obesity runs in your family. The problem is that nobody in your family runs. Um, what our students say, we, they don't have time to read. My students this year told me anything over three pages we're not going to read. And these, this is fiction, short stories, some other things. I knocked that out of them uh, pretty quickly. And then the whole issue of cultural competence, um, not exactly what we had in mind. Uh, and now we're turning everything into competencies. And uh, because there are, uh, we are culturally and socially grounded in the mix of people in our department, uh, we try to take it a little in a little different direction. So when does this happen? Uh, so we started out um, trying to hide amongst people that we weren't like. We started out as a program in human biology and went to social and cultural issues in medical practice and medicine society to PD. This is a historical document. This is from 1979. This was our curriculum in social and cultural issues in medical practice. We went from this um, to the Social Medicine Reader, and I'm sorry to say we're working on a third edition now. Um, and now we are PD. The course objectives are very much the same. As they were, we just are hiding under a different... Um, I, I will say, we just totally revised our curriculum, and there are four pillars that run throughout all three phases. And we are one of them. We are one of them. So what is PD? So we have a year-long professional uh, development, social dimensions of illness, medical ethics and health care, uh, a third semester of advanced seminars that the students choose. Um, I teach one on difference in disability. We have one, a joint one with the law school on law and medicine. Um, Terry Holt teaches two classes in writing. Uh, we have uh, his, history of medicine across the board. And then we have uh, Barry's Coyle on science and technology studies. He, you have a handout from him. I'll show you a couple of slides there. Um, we integrate with the behavioral sciences coil and the cases. Uh, this is just another overview of some of the things we do, categories of difference, ethics, healthcare policy, healthcare finance. Our students will engage in a mock Senate debate. 
at the end of the semester on how to cover the uninsured. And this is an example of the science and technologies interventions that Barry has made into the basic sciences. Um, courses for the first year in the foundation phase. So in immunology, hematology, and cardiovascular, for example, there was a discussion about BIDIL and racial categories and so forth and so on. Um, we, th we feel strongly that science and technology studies brings together clinical medicine, critical thinking, critical analysis, history, and uh, social context for the students, and it's directly tied to the tests they're going to be using, the instruments they're going to be using, what they're learning in ClinEpi in terms of evidence. We had a, a, a bit of a discussion with our education dean about the use of um, social determinants of health as a title. And those of us in social medicine don't like the word determinants. We like to be more empirically accurate about influences, contributions, so forth and so on. This was pointed out to our dean who said, oh, that's why the students aren't using this terminology on clinics rounds. And they need to, you all need to modernize and get with the lingo. So one of our challenges is this sort of um, branding appetite of some of our professional organizations uh, and how to maintain some critical purchase on that. So at Wake Forest, things evolved a little differently. What first got us into the partnership with Chapel Hill <clears throat> was a faculty member who created an exercise um, on technical, social, and ethical issues that was really an asynchronous online exercise for third-year students. And the idea was to sort of grow that out. But then uh, there, there was always a course called Being a Physician that was actually based in narrative and virtue ethics, but it was a large-scale lecture course. Um, Wake Forest was known for case-centered learning. We started out by building in behavioral, social science, and ethics content into selected CCL cases. And some clerkships always had narrative writing assignments. We actually couldn't get into those and do any more because they said the students are already doing plenty. So we started with these inroads. Then the curriculum did a number of somersaults, and so did, and, and we kept passing the PI baton to a bunch of different people. And then suddenly, the being a physician course had gone away, and people said, wait a minute, LCME is coming. We need something. So they came back to us and said, give us something that will put back what we lost. And we created the MAPS course medicine and patients in society, which is a, um, a very much a along the model of what's now called PD at Chapel Hill. It's a three semester longitudinal freestanding course that has a story arc that starts with the experience of patients, the social and cultural context in which patients and families address health and illness, brings in ethics because you have to have that background to make the ethics stuff meaningful, then gets to uh, health policy at the end, which has to be built on all of that so that health policy can be related to um, the, the patient-physician um, uh, relationship. For example, we have two sessions on uh, death and dying. The um, um, got to find the place in my notes. The having two consecutive sessions on end of life issues enables students and faculty to discuss the emotional emotional impacts and social practices surrounding death and dying before addressing the ethical issues that arise in decision making and before considering how to maximize the use of advanced directives and DNR orders reflecting social policy and individual choices. So we integrate everything in that way, which is what I learned by having uh, spent so many years in Chapel Hill. So I would add, uh, along taking death and dying or end of life as a, um, as a topic, um, in the PD-1-2 curriculum, we have two very separate sessions 
one in the social and cultural section called Death as a Cultural Practice, in which we explore to whom does death belong, what are the kinds of rituals that we have, how do we decide about brain death, and how cultural is that. Then in the ethics section, we do end-of-life decision-making, but we want to bring death back to its social and cultural roots. So, wait a minute, did I skip? No. No, I didn't, okay. All right, how do we do it? So at Wake Forest, um, we are sort of starting from the beginning, which is the way Chapel Hill started this many years ago. You bring clinical and non-clinical faculty members together with a, representing a lot of different primary disciplines, and mixing those disciplines together is an, actual, is an essential component of mutual education. We have faculty meetings. You've got to have a faculty meeting to talk about what's going to come up next. You know, you have to develop an experiential base. We're working on a faculty handbook with tips and exercises. We're developing a case library for teaching. Um, and once you have this kind of atmosphere where you're bringing your faculty together, it really helps support students so that you have a really good class discussions to, to build on from week to week. So um, just to point out the range of faculty that we have, uh, if you look on the left, these are all the disciplines that are represented uh, in what we do. Um, before every class, we have a faculty meeting, which is um, like a family food fight, but it's really invigorating for everybody. I, so, and I, I have to say that part of having this kind of a diverse faculty has enabled us to inherit and now take hold of the curriculum in sexualities and genders, uh, the curriculum in health inequalities and um, disparities and to spread out and work in, hand in hand with our patient-centered care, skills development, colleagues in these areas. So how do we make it work? Um, well, we try to listen to each other. And so instead of screaming at each other, um, the lions and the uh, calves work very well together. And we embrace clinical relevance and integrate it with the social science of medicine basics. It's not an either or. So um, I don't want to go back to school. Nobody likes me. They tease me and pull my hair. And nobody ever said it, teaching would be easy. That's sort of. <laughs> so uh, just to reframe it a little bit, we had a deliberate strategy of creolization, and that means creating a new language a lingua franca among uh, nobody's language trumps anybody else's. We recruited um, senior people and the clinicians and team taught. Then we grew with arts and sciences experience. And now with budget cuts like all the rest of you, we're not team teaching anymore. And um, this is a, a bit of a problem. I am, as course director, constantly recruiting. Every single meeting I go into, curriculum meeting, and I go to a lot of them because I'm running this professional development thread throughout all the, all the years of the school, I'm constantly saying, come teach with us. I ran into a nephrology colleague in the airport yesterday who stopped me and said, you know, our, the students who come to our service just can't stop talking about PD, and he said, you all seem to have so much fun, I'd like to teach in your course. I said, come on. So at Wake Forest, we're just in the first year of our course. And it's working really well, because we have a minimum number of students who say, we don't need to learn this stuff. And it's not as important as the basic sciences. We really are developing habits of critical reflection. And students are thinking longitudinally. They're bringing in stuff from other courses. They're saying, oh, we talked about that before. And here's how we can put more depth to it. There's a lot of faculty DNA. Some of our most um, um, thoughtful faculty members in this and in other um, um, first and second year courses um, trained at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, the gene drive model, the fact that most students feel that it's valuable is going to go out and it spreads. Um, 
negative capability is really, really important. Um, getting students to be comfortable with uncertainty and to recognize its role in medicine while they're being fire hosed with lots of other knowledge. And also saying that there are tensions here, but those tensions are creative and productive. And looking upstream to the larger social factors means you got to work with your teams. You got to think about continuity of care. So we're looking forward to how this is going to spread out into the clinical years, although we haven't gotten there yet. and a philosophy of pedagogy that has variety but not discrepancy. So here are the challenges I think that we all face. Faculty development, we have to pay our clinicians for teaching time. This is a real barrier. Um, and we have to pay our arts and sciences colleagues for teaching time. We now have a cross-disciplinary master's program in medicine, literature, and culture with the English department. That too has problems. Uh, incorporating IPE as everybody's struggling to do. The tyranny of the test, infinite 40 residency interviews. Um, high yield equals is it on the test? And now we have the challenge of exporting it and translating this to our clinical sites. But our students will take the integration of moral reasoning, cultural awareness, social savvy about population health together with them to the sites and we'll try to be with there to help them make that happen and we're done. we have 39 seconds no I, we're we're over but i want to add just a couple of things at wake forest we have a lot of support from um medical from the medical education and the administration and faculty are actually paid good money to real money to teach with us, which is terrific, and we got to keep it going. What's next for us is finding the nodal points of clinical integration along the story arc and um, uh, with, with our course in clinical skills and with their community practice experience, which are other things that Chapel Hill's been doing all along, and actually doing some clinical extension, which we can do more of, very much like Chapel Hill has always been doing. Thanks. Oh, we had no conflicts with anybody except intellectual. I have to say that this group, uh, the UNC and Wake Forest group, has done more to remind us that, that social science and culture are a big part of it, because I think we were too heavily focused on behavioral. And just the other day, a basic scientist came up to me and said, you know, the whole, it, people would just stop smoking if primary care doctors told them that that's what they should do. And so I don't understand why this is such a big deal. So the, the, the lack of understanding of our colleagues about the complexities, and it's so interesting to us. We wouldn't be here if it weren't this interesting, but it's not easy. Um, and so Rita Sharon is our next um, speaker. She and her partner from, uh, Rita's from Columbia University, and she and Susan Ball from Cornell will be talking about narrative medicine. And, you know, Rita's work in this area has just been so groundbreaking. So it's such a privilege to have her here. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak first. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, particularly o OBSSR and the NIH for hosting us and for allowing us to bring you our, our work, bring all of us this work together, some of us for 10 years, others for, for five years. <clears throat> Rita, Rita and I have no um, disclosures. Rita has some funding from ABIM. Um, just to say, I'm, my name is Susan Ball. I'm an associate professor at Weill Cornell where I'm an HIV specialist, but with a master's degree in the master's of science program in narrative medicine, the program that that Rita founded. Uh, Rita is a professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center where she is the founding director and now the executive director of the narrative medicine program at uh, Columbia University. I contemplated spending our entire 20 minutes giving you the accolades of Rita Sharon <laughs> because there are, there are very many. But just to say that we're very excited to present you our work. Um, we are at, our schools are at different stages of the development of of bringing narrative medicine to, to, our, to our programs. Um, but it has been an extreme um, honor for me to be Rita's peer, her colleague, her mentee, 
uh, now her co-PI, and I leave it to her to explain the, the overarching principles of, of narrative medicine, which is where we're going to start for today. Um, and, and Susan is the author of um, a um, memoir and visionary book called Voices in the Band about her own experience as an HIV physician from the beginning of the epidemic. And she did that as she was developing her own um, deep skills in narrative work and, and medicine. So you've seen this painting, I imagine. It's one of many of uh, Cezanne's card players. You've seen this. Uh, and it's two guys doing something together. And they look kind of relaxed, maybe. They're, they've got their cards. There's a bottle of wine in the back. Uh, looks a little relaxed. Now that's the same scene. Uh, it's darker. Still a bottle of wine. The one guy on the right is hunched over. The guy on the left looks like he's lording it over. I think he's got better cards. It's two guys doing ritualized activity with something at stake. And maybe there's more at stake in the, in the second one than the first one. And I start here because it was the object of the work of an artist. The artist is the one who arrests the spectacle in which most men take part without really seeing it and who makes it visible to the most human among them. So that kind of feels like our task for our students is to give them the ability to see that which to other people looks kind of ordinary, looks like it's under the radar of the special or the spectacle. And we want our students and colleagues and learners to be able not only to see the singular, extraordinary, high stakes events taking place in everyday medical practice, and we want to give them the skills and the capacities to make it visible to those in the room and others, to make it visible. So I thought I'd tell you what we mean by narrative medicine. This developed at Columbia. It was in 2000. Uh, it was a, a, a group of interdisciplinary faculty from arts and sciences and the medical school. It was funded by the NEH. So this is an NE, National Endowment for the Humanities, NEH-NIH collaboration. I think that's very, very important. And they thought our work was one of the 50 best of 63,000 grants that they gave over their lifetime. And that means that the work we do in medicine changes the landscape of the humanities. But this is what we've come to mean by narrative medicine, that um, we want to equip uh, clinicians to listen, to recognize, to absorb, to interpret, and be moved to action by the stories of illness. It comes from medicine. It comes from narrative studies. It is always relational. It is always intersubjective, which is to say the two people in the room, whether they're playing cards or talking about a new diagnosis of cancer, the two people in the room matter. They together construct, they co-construct that which is thought to be the problem. And it is always committed to social justice because everyone deserves this kind of care. We have three what we've called movements, attention, representation, and affiliation. Uh, Henry James talks about a cup of attention placed between the doctor and patient on the table. We try to do that. We try to teach learners how to donate their selves as containers for that which the patient will then fill with their listening. I wish the room were darker. This is a woman, a Tuareg woman from uh, northern Sahara. Um, Salgado is the, is the photographer, Sebastio Salgado. He's a Brazilian. And I choose it because of the attention of, of, the, of the woman toward us and what I imagine as the attention of the photographer toward her. 
She rivets our attention, and this is, what, this is what we want with every encounter with every ill person. When we perceive an object, we perceive one version or construal of that object. This is Nelson Goodman. When we then try to represent it, he says, we do not copy it, we achieve it which is to say it is only in the writing, the sculpting, the painting, the dancing, that we are able to perceive that which we see. And so that's why we teach our faculty and students how to read, how to write, how to paint. We, we, we have no limits. This is another Salgado. He saw this landscape. He lets me see this landscape in a way that at the beginning, uh, I, I'm a little perplexed about are those things in the distance trees or clouds? And I have to look at it long and hard before I really know. And this is the power of each one of us being able to represent a thing because we are going to see different things, but those of us who represent it will then make it possible for others to see it. The final movement is affiliation. This is what we're after. This is what the whole thing is for, that a patient will feel confirmed in his being. Secretly and bashfully, he watches for a yes, and we, clinicians, including our smallest, youngest students, have the power to give that yes. Neither of these guys is going to fall off the Andes. Now, Susan's going to tell you how these movements and these concepts of what it means to be a clinician uh, matter in the curriculum. So beginning at, for us, with the, with, the, with the support of the grant, the activities at Weill Cornell were diffuse, um, and I, I listed them here. We, we did some faculty development work with workshops um, and faculty development. We have an ongoing um, interdisciplinary session that meets monthly that, that does narrative medicine that is based in the palliative care group, but we have um, providers from throughout the medical center that attend these sessions. Um, particularly, I um, in inaugurated and initiated three different courses for the medical students. One of those courses I'm going to go into in a little more depth, uh, but a first year course that's just dealing with what is narrative medicine um, and introducing the course and the academic background as well as the, um, the fundamental literary background to that and an ongoing um, mandatory uh, na narrative medicine session for the medicine sub-interns that's ongoing and now is in its uh, seventh year that's gotten great reviews from all the medical students and is a particularly apparently a high point of their experience. We've had lectures throughout the first year basic science curriculum that includes um, aspects of narrative medicine and then we have some collaborative programs, notably our art and observation program with Columbia that meets at the Metropolitan Museum. The Foundations in Reflective Practice course is a course designed uh, really that students came to us to create because they were anxious about those transitions that were made in the third year and in the clerkships. Uh, it's specifically a year-long a year elective that meets about every six weeks. Um, students are excused from their rotations. It meets in the evening to have uh, less impact on their schedules. There's no homework. The students commit to attending all these sessions. Um, and we have two faculty, my colleague Randy Diamond and I, and we usually have a note taker or at least a, a microphone there to record our sessions. The goals of this course really were to, as you say, offer a structured prote protected setting, but really to explore some of these issues that some would call the hidden curriculum, but just explore some of the challenges and, and, and um, issues that come up in the third year as those students move from the classroom into the clinical settings and confront uh, situations that they may not have other places to uh, discuss or to, um, to really break down and, and come to think about correctly. So our, objective, our objectives for the course were to discuss topics of professional identity formation, but to do that using tools of narrative medicine um, and to let the students think about who are, who are they, who are they as students becoming doctors, and what do, do these, their experiences in these um, situations, what does that do to them as people, what does that do to them as future physicians. 
Um, just to go, this is to show the structure of the, se of the sessions. These are two-hour sessions where we talk to the students about where they are in their, in their rotation because they're students coming from psych and OB and surgery and medicine. Um, so we spend a little time just kind of seeing where everybody is. We propose a, a theme for each session and we have a, a, a paper and discussion of that theme. We do some reflective writing and then discussion of the reflective writing. These are the themes that we've used. Um, most of these, again, have come from students saying, I want to talk about, I want to talk about isms, one of the students said. Mm. Um, he wanted to talk about racism, but as we all know, there's ageism and sexism and there's fatism and um, all these isms that we would lump under bias and discrimination. But also all these issues, decision making, use of social media, uh, making mistakes, truth and honesty. There, there's not a, a curriculum to address these issues and we had some extremely profound and rich discussions about these topics in the sessions that we held. Um, we gave students a, uh, an evaluative um, uh, survey at the end of the year um, and these are some of the results that came um, uh, that the students told us that we, they were happy to, to have had this safe place to, to discuss their personal and professional uh, changes and see this broader context in which to view some of these experiences that they were having. Um, and then also to have these links that we provided through the narrative content that we, we, we gave them, links to narrative and to literature. Um, and then always to keep them mindful of this transition they are making in their lives, this professional transformation from professional student to, to, to being physicians. This is one comment, we had a lot of student comments. This is one I, I thought I w wanted to include um, for this, the purposes of this talk, but I, I just want to read you the very last of it. We need reflection to thrive and to survive, to take the challenges and use them towards something better, to become a stronger person, a better doctor, a more compassionate caregiver. Um, so in these are our conclusions. We have had very good feedback on this course. We're running it for the fourth time now this year. Um, and uh, we are trying to work toward making this a, a part of the, the overall mandated curriculum. That's part of our future plans, which we'll go into. Uh, Rita's now going to talk to you about, about her work at, at Columbia, which is much further advanced than ours. So, um so I'm, I'm just thinking about um, the earlier sessions and just notice how, how we've kind of shifted the, um, the we've, sh we've, we've shifted the, the um, focus from rather granular, these are the, th these are the words you want to say. Don't say any questions. Try saying, uh, please give me the questions you have. And, and now that we're, we're kind of all three of us now going at a much, uh, uh, um, not deeper, but but ground level um, set of considerations. Not what do you say? Uh, why do you turn away from that screen when you realize it's going to be hard at the ACP meeting? But rather, what what are the capacities within the individual person necessary in order to want to and be able to do these things? Not so much scripted as really aspects of personhood, aspects of the, the subject. And, and so uh, Susan and I and all of us in, in this session are, are not just looking at, at, at individual sing, uh, uh, specific things we want our students to be able to do, but rather where does that come from? And how do we nourish the springs from which these capacities to listen and recognize and care enough that you do something on behalf of that patient come from. And, and I'm just so impressed at how these, you can't, you, you, we all need to do both of these things simultaneously. And, and here you're seeing them a little divided, but I think, I think all of us are, are deeply, deeply aware of, of that. It's not a paradox, but a compliment. So uh, just two things to tell you about. We started with faculty at Columbia. I just figured at the beginning I was just going to give all my money to the faculty. And, and out of my um, uh, K07, I paid stipends 
for the people who taught, for the teachers who taught in our foundations of clinical medicine. We made it a faculty seminar. They came once a week. It was an hour and a half. I even gave them some kind of snacks, I forget. Um, but what we did together was read and write. And in all of these things, uh, we don't really do reflective writing. We do, we do like creative writing. We read fiction together. We read poems. We read, uh, we read things together, biblical uh, newspaper articles. But we really teach in a graduate school in English department level. We teach faculty and students how to do close reading so that they do not squander any of the evidence from what they're reading, be it a poem or an intern's progress note. And then we have them writing in the shadow of what they've read. And usually they're not kind of clinically related. You know, one was a poem about a man who did an unexpected dance. And, and, and the prompt is, and we give people three or four minutes, write about a moment of unexpected beauty. Now, that has nothing to do with medicine, but it lets the students really express things they had not been thinking about. And then when they read to one another what they've written, they realize how much indeed they're able to see and, and um, discover. Uh, those faculty were then able, in turn, as they got good at this, to coach their students. I mostly wanted to make sure that before I asked students, medical students, to write, I wanted to make sure that I had a cadre of faculty who knew how to read what they wrote. Otherwise, it's wasted. So my faculty got a year or two uh, uh, um, head start on then being tasked with reading expertly between the lines. Every word counts. That which their students wrote. This We still call it K07. It's not even a K07. This is Columbia. We don't have big champions, you know, we have funding sources. So, <laughs> so we still call it the K07. But, but that group of faculty, and there have been hundreds, I mean, coming through, but there's like always a, a core. And, and fierce companionship is what has occurred. This is home. This is home for these, for these faculty. And out of this work have come innumerable collaborations and consortia and, and other research projects way outside of what we're allegedly supposed to be doing. And the kinds of outcomes that I've been tracking are, are really promotions and clerkship directorships and, and course directors. And everyone knows that the K07 is where the leaders come from. And then at the same time, we've been, and I, I, I want to I uh, hear more about the Missouri uh, the portfolio, um, that now is a required part of, of our four-year curriculum. It is an electronic shoebox, and students write their way through the curriculum preclinically and on the wards. Uh, but they're coached. We, they, we help them learn enough about reading and writing that they're using their writing not just to remember horrible things that happen, but also to see more of what is in front of their eyes by virtue of their capacity to represent it skillfully. So as the, we're now doing a very time-consuming, but I think already elegant, study of the students' uh, portfolio writings, once a semester, we ask them to go back over the whole semester and read what they wrote. We say, read what you wrote since September and tell us what you learn. And they make major discoveries about themselves. Um, this has all been said. It's creativity, it's awareness, it's professional identity development. This has major impact on healthcare teams. It's another whole thing we could talk about. We're doing clinical trials now in ambulatory settings. Uh, the institutional culture does change. And the clinical outcomes, what we're heading toward for our students is indeed that they know more about individual patients, that they know more about their colleagues, that they respect their colleagues, even if they're in different disciplines, that they know that there are multiple contradictory perspectives and that they can start to imagine what they are. It's good for wellness. It's good for self-awareness. It decreases burnout. And in the future, the two of us at Cornell and Columbia 
um, are now disseminating. We're disseminating, and and in our case, we're disseminating to like Kyoto and South Africa and Beijing. I mean, it's like worldwide, and it comes from you. You know, it comes from you. We're very grateful. Uh, I don't have to pay my teachers anymore out of my stipends because the dean's office picked it up five years ago. <laughs> um, and and we just keep creating, and we're um, we've only but begun. One more. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the members of the panel to come forward and um, sit up front so that we can have a, a lively discussion. I have been so impressed with the work of these schools because I think in medicine we get on a treadmill and we only move forward. And learning how to change so that we turn and look back, uh, especially when it comes to like changing the culture around us, I think that is so important but incredibly challenging. The other thing that I've heard a lot about today is um, having a coach. And now I want a coach because, you know, like Michael Jordan had a coach. Tiger Woods had some good coaches, some not so good coaches, but um, I think it's a really important model in medical education. Um, so now that we have them seated here, and you, you should feel free to ask each other questions as well, but I'm going to open this up, and uh, again, we have the two mics here. Um, and while you guys are cogitating what you might want to ask, I wanted to throw out a first question to Rita and Susan and anybody else who wants to respond to help help us understand how this work with the factor that with the faculty actually makes its way to the students. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? So these faculty the faculty that we teach uh, in in the KO7 uh, really get to be good at reading what their students write. And in our student portfolio, there's only one person who has access to anything the student writes besides the student him or herself. And it's only on direct invitation. And that's that faculty member, that preceptor, who meets with them. 12 students, one preceptor, once a week for 18 months. Then they go on the wards. They meet with them several times on the wards. They are now the, um, we are now the EPA coaches, the EPA guides. Do you all know what that means? So that it is to these preceptors that we've been training in KO7 that the entrustable decisions are, are entrusted. Uh, the students come back to those faculty members, I mean unfailingly, to say you're, you're, you're the one who knows me best around here. So, so t one to one, it has enormous impact. The model at, at Cornell is quite a lot behind where you are, and it's something we're aspiring to. But as we are doing this work increasingly, um, we are getting faculty who want to be part of these sessions and who want to learn more about them. Some have gone on to take uh, Rita's narrative medicine workshops um, at the at, narr at the um, narrative medicine. Um, programs at Columbia, but there's a lot that I'm finding there are a lot of faculty out there who are who are interested and who are just waiting for someone to come along and say, "Let's, I want to do this material with you." Um, some are a little bit of af afraid of it, um, but but for the most part, it it is a, a, a training program. I think it's wise to to not just say, "Okay, you you want to do it, just go do it." I think there is some training involved, um, but but for people who are interested in it and enthusiastic about this work, it's 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 really rewarding for for the faculty and for people like me who are trying to get more faculty involved. I, I want to uh, echo something. Uh, we have um, our students in class for 18 months also, and we see them once a week. And we it's interesting to me that we. De develop longitudinal care curricula for our students in community-based settings. And the longitudinal relationship that develops um, in the student work, in, in the student seminars, and ours are about 14 students, and with that faculty member who is the only one who reads their illness narrative, is really critical um, 
I, I see those students, you know, all four years. I may not have them in class, but it gives them a home room. Mm -hmm. It gives them a chance to uh, be who they are. Um, whether they were went to Juilliard as a cellist, as an undergrad, then they'll have a chance to talk about that in class or somebody who uh, the class melds and you meld with them and the I, I think that kind of stability uh, is really good for the students and for us I I've often said it's the best antidepressant mm -hmm. that I take is my uh, is that 18 months with those students and it doesn't cost nearly as much <laughs> I can give a quick example of a, a direct translation of the faculty development attendees to the bedside. We had one of our ob faculty who began taking poetry to rounds and would read a, a snippet on rounds every day. And I just want to comment. So I do admissions, which I'm not sure how many people in the room do admissions. So I talk to a lot of students, and one of the things that emerged in the thematic analysis of the students coming on their very first day of medical school is the things that inspired them to want to be a physician and created the physician that they brought with them to medical school was a clinical encounter, for the most part. They see our faculty, they see, or, or our physicians or physicians all over the country, all over, in all kinds of practices, and they see the interaction between that faculty and a patient, whether the patient's themselves or family member, and it's that that inspires them to be physicians, and that's what comes to medical school. And so for me, it's like a no-brainer, of course. The better we are, the better our students will be. Sue. So Thank you again. Susan Skoshalak at the American Medical Association. I just want to uh, maybe ask you to move this discussion to a different level for a moment. And that is to acknowledge that there's a world of hurt out there right now in our physician community, perhaps just as deeply in our faculty. And I found my metacognitive voice kept screaming renewal, renewal during uh, your presentations. And I wonder if there's another level that you might help us with in thinking about how this applies beyond students and trainees. If you could say something about that. Um, I can comment um, about some of the work we built into this. Um, year four and five where we began working with palliative care teams around the, around the state of Indiana. And um, we would have a retreats, evening and whole day retreats with these teams. And these are teams, palliative care, who give, give, give uh, at a high emotional level uh, continuously. And that became uh, extremely important in terms of how they could interpret how they could be present for their patients and sustain um, their roles in work they're passionate about without burnout or mini minimizing burnout. I think what we hear from our basic science and clinical colleagues it is that it's a, such a relief and a change of venue for them to have new colleagues and hear new language and to read and to see the students at a different phase in their career. So. Um, in that sense, I see our weekly faculty meeting seminar as somewhat of an intervention. And honestly, uh, it contributes to them having a chance to think back to when they were mm -hmm. in first year and lessons they would like to impart. And I, I think that energy comes back. So I think just getting them involved is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of the work even even the, the KO7 group has been doing is toward other faculty. So someone in my group, either me or one of my colleagues, will do narrative medicine seminars um, ongoing, once a month or twice a month. We're doing it with the general pediatricians. We're doing it with the social workers. We're doing it with the radiology residents. We're doing it with child psychiatry fellows. We're doing it with emergency medicine uh, clinicians. 
So the, these, are, these are a small group. Anybody can come. It's elected. And what we do there is creative work. We read together. We talk about what we're reading. Uh, we write. We read aloud what we've written. And these, these bodies then cohere, small as they may be. These pediatricians, over a, a couple of years, they say, I get to clinic, and I see three charts in the box, and I'm curious about what each of them is going to be. We give these narrative medicine workshops. It's like weekend workshops, three-day, five-day. And it used to be, you know, 30, 40 people would come. This last one, we had to turn people away. We had, a, we, we, we had up to 105 people. That's all we could fit. And there was a waiting list. And when people do come, and they're from all over the world, they say exactly what Susan just said. They're hungry for a kind of recommitment and sense of calling. And they don't find it in their own home institutions. And they come. Susan, Susan taught with me just this past weekend. They come, and, and, and they say, there's a tribe. I'm not alone. There's a tribe. And we've given discounts <laughs> to people who come if they bring more than uh, two people from one institution. We want them not to be alone when they go back. So, and, and then, I mean, Susan is not the only mid-career clinician who came and signed up for our Master of Science in Narrative Medicine graduate program. It's a whole year of close reading, creative writing, and intersubjective uh, 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 training. So we're seeing tremendous hunger, and lots more besides what we're doing up. I mean, lots has to be done to not just sate the hunger, but look behind it to why are we so bloody hungry? Just one other example I can't resist sharing is um, that speaks to the same, the same thing that others have said about the, the really need to feel like you are in a, an environment where you matter. Um, I, one example, again, from ob gynecologist surgeons that I had not previously worked with, with, talked about the importance of saying your name in the operating room when everyone had masks on. How that changed your world and changed your relevance to being part of that team by having a name behind a mask. Who would have thought about that if we hadn't have gotten together to talk? Sorry, I just wanted to add um, about the role of students in, uh, in that, and that is uh, having more time for them. Our students this year on their own required the entire incoming class, the class of 2020, to read Blind Spot and to take IAT tests mm. and to break up into small groups mm. that they ran um, as part of their orientation. Wow. And just being involved with that and letting them move ahead with the sexualities and genders curriculum mm -hmm. is it, very renewing for all of us. Yes. Hi, my name is Adam Saperstein. I'm from the Uniform Services University across the street. Um, and I really appreciated the discussion that many of you have had about the stimuli, both being our own clinical experiences, but also reading literature, reflective writing of others, um, other forms of art, artistic creation as well. In our own curriculum and reflective practice, we've made a shift towards what I would consider more lay press content that often is shorter to meet the learner where they, where they are, things like TED Talks, podcasts, et cetera. I'm wondering what your own experiences are with that kind of a format, how that's worked for you in your various locations, um, and just to hear your experience. Excellent question. Who, who would like to go first? Well, I can say with our um, with the course that I uh, presented to you for the, the third year, the Foundations and Reflective Practice course, a couple of the pieces that we use come from um, the New York Times, you know, wellness section because those those are or, or or certainly from JAMA, from a piece of my mind, probably the most well-read piece of, of that journal. Um, for so so we definitely use that. We try and talk about. What is we talk about the how it's written, in addition to what is written. So I often will talk about why are we so interested in this? What how does the writer bring us into this interaction? What is it about it about it that, that draws us in? Not just what is the message or what is this story, but 
why are we reading this? What is the context of it? Oh, it's in the New York Times, or oh, it's in JAMA, or oh, it's in the New England Journal. That gives it a different cachet of who it's for. One of the examples is a, when we talk about social media, we use a piece called Friend Request, which is from 2010 by Danielle Lama. She was at the time a medicine, uh, an intern, and she wrote about taking care of a young man who was in the ICU with a cardiomyopathy who asked her to be Facebook friends. So it lends itself to this very big discussion about social media, do you friend a patient, but that also what she was dealing with, that link between taking care of someone who's your own age who is dying. A, a, a tremendously rich discussion, so not necessarily a literary discussion in that case, but many, many themes that those, the, those students are in, in, encountering. So I think many, many instances of non, you know, um, Solzhenitsyn type literature are, are perfectly acceptable and, and sometimes extremely valuable and helpful. Can I just uh, add to that? Because we use poetry, uh, short stories, fiction, and often reading poetry in class, especially about death, is really good. At the same time, we want to make sure that the students understand that there are rigorous, analytic, conceptually based understandings of data and research and concepts of bioethics and moral reasoning that they need to learn. It isn't all just um, Danielle Ofri's latest or um, Groupman on something. So we try to mix it up and make it clear that this isn't just Love Humankind 101. Uh, because it, so it's, it's something of a balance. Just um, <clears throat> to provide an example of that, um, you know, Sue showed the second volume of the Social Medicine Reader, but I was deeply involved in volume one, and we teach out of all three at Wake Forest. Um, but one example is um, truth-telling. Um, and in a truth-telling session, um, we have the students both read a classic ancient article by Cabot on um, it, how it's okay to tell the truth and the research that he did with everybody said, oh no, you can't tell the truth to certain people. Um, uh, you know, so it's, you know, I forget how old, way over 100 years old, right? Um, and then they read the lie. One of the um, most popular pieces from Jam is a piece of my mind from years and years ago and have enormous arguments in class about whether that was a lie, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, another thing, using poetry is really interesting because you can either sort of go like this about poetry or you have faculty who are intimidated by it because they think it requires something special. But if you get past faculty intimidation, um, we use um, uh, Raymond Carver's What the Doctor Said and talk about informed consent. Is this a good informed consent discussion or not? And the students over the years have, have gotten more and more sophisticated about how they understand what's going on in a poem like that so it's very easy to unpack. And like Sue said, you connect it to the concepts and use um, uh, fiction and literature and poetry to work with the, the, the fundamental concepts that we're trying to convey. I, I also wanted to just jump in here because I'm a huge fan of podcasts. <laughs> and I do think that um, they're the kind of thing you can listen to on the way to work, you know, you, you know, fit into your life where you don't, you know, you can still drive, you don't have to read. And um, the, one of the ones we used was one that Radio Lab put out, and it was the story of a mom who had twins, only one of which was viable. And the, the, ba the, the they, actually, they were both viable, but one died really quickly after it was born. And she went on, she and her husband went on this mission to find the people who received. Did you hear that one? The, the organs, and I thought that was one of the most powerful, and what we do at our school is we listen to TED Talks and podcasts, and we shoot them to the, the, the dean and say, we think this is a good one, we think this is a good one. And so I think it's, it's the kind of thing that um, they too can listen to where it doesn't feel like work as much, because I think the power is the storytelling, is hearing those stories from, from that point of view, and I, so I think that's pretty amazing. 
Any any closing comment? Oh, I should ask about Twitter. Did we get any tweets? You know what? People are in the cafeteria lunch line, which is where we will soon be. Um, so I, I want to thank the, the group of speakers from this session for their outstanding work. And it's just so great to hear them expand on them in these comments. So thank you, guys. <laughs> And our lunch plans, the cafeteria is around the corner, and Lauren has found a room for us, which is in the basement, where we can all sit together. It's big enough. So those of you who uh, are our guests today, come and hang out with these wonderful folks who have just done this great work. And um, don't be shy. Believe me, these people love to interact. They so, don't be shy. I just want to thank, um, on behalf of my fellow North Carolinians, thank you all for not making bathroom jokes yet. Um, we apologize. We're embarrassed. We're sorry. And thank you for not ridiculing us. And, and the room is F1 and F2. So if you go down the big stairs, you'll see some conference rooms. You can go in there and take some food and hang out. Okay, welcome back from lunch. I know I had some wonderful conversations and it was so loud in the lunchroom that I could hardly hear the person I was speaking with. Um, so we are now going to finish up our last set of presentations, which is gonna be on innovations in interprofessional education. And after that session's over, we'll have um, a reactor panel discussion We've got six stakeholders from different disciplines across the country, all wonderful, thoughtful, provocative people that we'll want to hear from. And, um, and then after that, at about 3.40, we'll have the wrap up. So our first group um, of speakers includes Margie Stuber from um, UCLA School of Medicine, and Michelle Johnson from the University of California, San Diego. And they'll be talking about curricular innovations in social and behavioral sciences with a focus on interprofessional education. So Margie. And Michelle. We're gonna tag team it. Okay, well, good afternoon. Hi. We have the after lunch time slot, so that could either mean that you're energized and caffeinated or I'm about to put you to sleep. So here's hoping that it's the former. We're here representing UCLA and UCSD. Um, UCLA was part of the in initial consortium and we were, UCSD was invited to participate in the second round of funding. And we have so much that we're so excited to share with you about different innovations that we've been able to implement in the curriculum over the course of the last five to ten years. But we've been asked today to really focus in on interprofessional education. So in our outline you'll see that we're going to spend the majority time talking about that. And time permitting we'd love to tell you about some of the other things that we've been doing as well. But first, some introductions. As you just heard, I'm from University of California, San Diego, and I'm a family medicine physician. And one of my roles is I'm a co-director of the preclinical doctoring course. I took over as PI just in the last year, so I want to make sure to give credit to Sean Herity, who was the PI for the rest of the time and retired after nearly 30 years at UCSD in medical education. And I'm honored to be co-presenting with my colleague, Dr. Margie Stuber, who is child and adolescent psychiatrist at UCLA. And she has many roles, including being, included, including being the assistant dean for well-being and career development, but also oversees the health systems curriculum at UCLA. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stuver to talk about UCLA IPE. Thank you. Okay. We have to do a slight adjustment here. Okay. So I'm going to go relatively quickly through um, our IPE course. And although the, the general rubric of it is its IPE course, this actually is also where you'll find our narrative writing and our social as well as the behavioral, mostly social, uh, aspects of, of the curriculum. Um, so watch out for all the themes that you've heard about all morning showing up here as well. But the course, I, actually I was given this course um, to redo when I got the original K07. They said, oh, okay, well you're supposed to do behavioral and social science. Do it in this course. So 
this is what we've do, done, and to some extent, this is my 10-year report, although there are lots of other things that we've done as well. So this is a year-long required seminar course. It's called Systems-Based Healthcare. It used to be called Doctoring. Once we started bringing in nurses and dentists, it took us about a year, but we realized it probably was inappropriate to still call it Doctoring. Um, so we changed that. Um, there are eight students, eight or nine students, and two tutors to a group. Um, they meet for three hours, nine times during the year. Now, this is part of a course that actually is longer than that for the medical students, and I can talk um, more about that, but I'm going to focus on the interprofessional education part, which is nine times. Um, part of that is that it doesn't start until the rest of the campus starts school, which is in late September because they're on a quarter system. The medical school, of course, had, you know, walks to its own drummer, uh, and we start in May, actually. So there's a time period there where it's just the medical students, and then it becomes an interprofessional course and takes on this format. Um, the students, each time we meet, the students share written reflections. This would be clinical, uh, critical reflection is what the term would be, really, uh, on a clinical experience related to the topic of the day. And we'll talk about what the topics are. And this is really um, the way I explain it to the students and to the skeptical faculty who can't believe that I have them writing anything uh, that isn't about, you know, case notes. Um, that this is practice-based learning. They're learning to be able to reflect on their practice and learn from it. Um, they also read current articles on the topic and discuss. And what we like to talk about is that we are ripped from the headlines. Generally speaking, we will have found a, um, a piece of my mind or an editorial from New England Journal that will be on topic within a month or two preferably not within the week or two, because then it's harder to get into the curriculum, but that we see it right, right there, because that's the kind of thing that we focus on. So let's see. So these are the kinds of focus um, topics that we have ripped from the headline. Um, conflict of interest, you see the money. Uh, healthcare finances, that's also money, I guess, in the ACA. Um, Next week, our students will be talking about the use of prescription opioids and medical marijuana, since both of those are certainly hitting the news everywhere and we're getting all kinds of conflicting ideas. This is really under the rubric of population versus individual health care decision making and how do you think about public policy uh, as a health care deliverer. We talk about QI and error and apology. They learn how to do an apology that is would be hopefully approved by our risk management people, but also by what patients actually want in terms of, of an apology. Talk a lot about implicit bias, stereotype threat. We do the IAT. Um, turn, talk about boundaries and burnout, which I think are associated with each other, and collaboration and conflict resolution. Okay. Now, this should come from here, right? Hitting the wrong thing. Okay, so this is a truly interprofessional course. Um, we have about 160 third year medical students. It's a required part of their curriculum. We have 128 third year dental students. 20 of those are international students who um, came to the United States only three or four months before they start this course, which is really interesting in terms of trying to talk about healthcare economics. Um, we have um, 20 second year advanced practice acute care nursing students. That's what we have right now. Next year we will have 40. We're campaigning to have more than that. The students are campaigning as well. Um, that's it. We've gotten to the point where the students say, well, why don't we all have nursing students in our small groups? So that's what I love to hear. Um, we have about 80 faculty members who are involved, so doing the faculty development is an interesting, challenging, and really exciting piece of this. They come from all areas of medicine, um, as well as from psychology, social work, and of course, dentistry and nursing. And then we have, um, this year we have eight fourth-year medical students who co-tutor. Um, that means these are students who are um, volunteering to do this as part of a medical education elective that they do in the fourth year, they are incredibly valued by 
<clears throat> by the third year students um, because, of course, third year students believe fourth year students over almost anybody. Uh, so that winds up being incredibly useful. Um, our goals, of course, um, a la any IPE, is to learn with, from, and about each other. Um, but we're also specifically, our content is exploring common conflicts regarding patient care and education, discovering differences in training and, and expectations. Boy, dental school is really different than medical school. Um, developing skills in teamwork, communication, collaboration, conflict resolution, um, again, IPAC kinds of things. Um, but then developing reflective writing skills and practice-based learning. And with this, the, it's not so much I have to keep telling the faculty, in this case, we're, we're really not correcting grammar and punctuation and spelling. I do have to work on that with some of my faculty. But this is really about can they actually not just give a case report, can they analyze what's going on? Can they reflect on the impact on themselves? Can they reflect on the system contributions? And can they, this is the real hard part, can they say they've actually learned something? What's the learning from this? Where, what are they taking from this? What are they going to do with this? And, and sometimes it could be, I'm not going into that field of medicine. That's not the kind of learning I'm necessarily looking for, but trying to have them have some ideas that would really be more about QI kinds of things. Um, and then, uh, of course, understanding the Im impact of implicit associations on decision making. At this point, um, our, our faculty are teaching some of the other faculty about some of this because we've included this in our curriculum for several years. The, the other faculty are sort of catching up now that the students are talking about these things because they come into medical school with a knowledge of, of these issues and are very disappointed that our student that our faculty don't know what they're talking about. Okay, so the students really love the perspective they gain um, and having all three professions there, the three schools are happy because this addresses accreditation requirements. Um, um, and so we don't get too much pushback. The clinical rotations still argue with us periodically that we're stealing their students and that they're always gone, and even though we keep making accommodations for various things. Um, but they did concede that when we gave them the list of topics that they couldn't actually teach those things. So they were, and we, when we pointed out that they were graduation competencies that were expected to teach, then they said, okay, well, you can have the students if you're going to teach those things. So what has been challenging is actually what I'm going to talk a little bit about when we get to the next steps, which is putting this into a clinical setting. We, when we tried to measure outcome, behavioral outcome with this, we had a very difficult time finding any place where the medical students were actually interacting with advanced practice nurses. I mean, there was no place that they were interacting with dental students. Uh, and we weren't even finding the advanced practice nurses and the medical students were rarely at the same clinical site, so it wasn't even them interacting with each other. We couldn't measure how this was being utilized. And we had very few clinical settings that really had good teamwork that they could observe either without any of these things. Um, the logistics are daunting, any of you have tried IPE. That, that's mostly, in fact, I was at a meeting last week where we said, okay, we know this is hard. Let's talk about how we overcome these obstacles, because we all know the obstacles. Those have been published. It's out there. Let's move on. Um, this does require strong support from the administration. Um, otherwise, we can have faculty who decide not to show up. Um, we can have uh, the dental school has to actually add an extra stipend. They don't. Con the dental school doesn't consider this part of their teaching responsibility. For the nursing, it is one of their courses, so it's listed as one of the courses they're taking. So these are, are uh, challenges for them. Okay. Okay, well, UCSD, we went in quite a different direction, and we created a large-scale clinical simulation IPE activity. That's a long phrase. I'm going to try and break it down over the course of the next five minutes by answering, hopefully, some of these questions and talking about our strengths and challenges that we encountered. 
At UCSD, we're fortunate to have a state-of-the-art simulation center that multiple different types of educational and training programs and health professions utilize throughout San Diego, including a nursing school, a pharmacy school, our medical school. And the idea for the simulation IPE really came from the faculty who had worked with the simulation center coming together and saying, why don't we do a simulation together instead of siloed as separate simulations? So they wanted to design a scenario that would accomplish two goals. One, to have interprofessional learners learn about teamwork, clinical teamwork, as well as to address and reinforce core discipline-specific clinical skills, communication skills, and procedural skills. So they came to the idea that a cardiac case would be the ideal format to achieve those goals. And most importantly about this format was they wanted to make sure to include a transition of care, a handoff where one team had to hand off to another. And we all know that that is such an important part of patient safety and quality. So let me show you what this looks like. So the first, the activity starts with a team of three to five interprofessional students, nursing, medicine, and pharmacy, meeting a standardized patient in the simulation center that represents a clinic, an ambulatory clinic. They perform a history, a physical, and analyze an EKG. And they determine that the patient's having a heart attack. So they decide he needs to go to the emergency department. So you see the students in the, the lower picture are preparing their handoff. They're using the SVAR, which is a common tool, to hand off to the next team. And so the simulation then moves into a different part of the simulation center. The students literally wheel the patient, standardized patient, down the hallway. And one team is presenting their handoff to the other. And then the second interprofessional team takes over with their own assessment and they start treatment. They place an IV, they, the pharmacy students administer medications, they take over. Then the last really important part of the activity is a debriefing. It's a 60 minute debrief with interprofessional faculty from all disciplines and it's done in small group, the very small groups that they work together. And the purpose of the debrief is really to allow students to reflect, self-assess, and then receive feedback from their faculty facilitators. This was done on quite a large scale. Each administration, we had 300 students, 100 faculty, all do this over the course of two half days. Just wanted to point out that our partner in nursing is actually a private institution because we don't have a public school of nursing at UCSD, and so it was really a private-public partnership, too, that we developed. As with any IP, we really have to strongly consider the different levels of learner and the different learner needs. For example, our medical students were second year medical students, preclinical. They'd never been exposed to the hospital. And they were matched with first and second year graduate nursing students who had quite a lot of exposure. And the third year pharmacy students were somewhere in between. So in order to help all students be successful in achieving the goals, we created several discipline-specific modules that we implemented prior to the IPE, as well as on the day of the IPE, specific orientations that helped everybody be successful in the IPE experience. We purposely wanted to make sure to, that BSS topics were included in the IPE. Some core topics, of course, about patient communication, but I just wanted to mention that we trained the standardized patient to become very reluctant to go to the emergency department and start minimizing his pain in an effort to avoid needing to go. And so the students really need to use a very patient-centered, shared decision-making type of model to convince him that he needs this higher level of care. Obviously, they learn about working in teams and then, of course, the skill of reflection and self-assessment. The last critical piece I'll mention, of course, is the faculty development piece. Working with 100 interdisciplinary faculty, we really wanted them to role model for the students working in teams. So in order to do that, we created faculty development tools that were disseminated prior to the day, as well as on the day we did some just-in-time orientation to bring them up to speed as well. So how did this go? This year marks our fourth year of this simulation IPE, and every year's been a success, and every year we've learned something to make it better for next year. Overall, the student response has been very positive. They really enjoy that it's experiential that it's clinical, and they enjoy the opportunity to work together. The partnerships that we formed with the School of Nursing and the School of Pharmacy have been very successful. Each of our partner schools, we've all benefited from the new curriculum, as well as benefited from meeting accreditation requirements. And really, all the, all the partners have shared responsibility for making this a success in all the ways it needed to be with funding and time and resources. That being said, it wasn't without its challenges. As Dr. Stuber mentioned, the logistics alone of 300 students, 100 faculty in two half days were, were quite overwhelming at times. We did struggle certain years to recruit enough faculty volunteers. 
but we found that when we were able to offer CME to the faculty, we had less of a problem. We truly think that the long-term sustainability of the simulation IP really depends on the continued mutual support of all the partners in terms of cost sharing and resource sharing, as well as our continued sensitivity and receptiveness to the different levels of learners and the different learner needs that are specific for this simulation. So hopefully, as you've seen and heard, we implemented quite different strategies in interprofessional education. Both were successful and both had their own unique strengths and challenges. So now I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Stuber to talk about the yeah. yeah, to bring us from yellow to red here. Okay. Um, so, oh, wait a minute. Did we? Future directions. Okay. So, um, we're in the midst right now of dissemination. You are part of the dissemination, um, but uh, we are also doing a fair amount of writing. Uh, as, as some of you may be aware, IPE is a very hot topic at most of the different conferences, so there are lots of opportunities for this. Um, the, uh, at the Western GEA, I presented something just last week. Um, we have a number of different kinds of things that are going on. Um, but what we're trying to do now is to move it beyond just, oh, woe is me, this is really hard, to saying, okay, what are some models that have worked? What could work at your place? How could you start building this up? How do you get the champions from the other schools? Um, how do you leverage these accreditation requirements? Um, really refining the cases and the evaluation. Um, one of the tricky things was that when we had, uh, we started with medical students um, with the systems-based healthcare topics, then brought in nursing students, didn't have to adjust the, the curriculum all that much. We just had to have some readings that were actually nurse specific. When we brought in the dental students, suddenly it didn't really seem like it made much sense to have a lot of time spent on abortion and euthanasia. Uh, and so we wanted to go for a different kind of moral decision making. Luckily, um, dentists have lots of moral decisions they have to make as well. And uh, certainly pain relief was a big issue that we all shared in common. So we taught, we've been able to ha do some of those kinds of adjusting. Um, the really faculty development has been um, a really Oh, well, both the clinical P, um, IPE and the faculty development IPE are really the, the ways that we're going forward. I sort of played with whether that was a conflict of interest right now. I, th I see it more of this as being, thank you NIH, thank you OBSSR, now we're being able to launch some of these other small funding sources, but some other funding sources to carry on this kind of work. So the work with the VA funding is actually to have us be um, inside of an interprofessional um, homeless veterans clinic. We're going to be bringing in trainees, and, and this, will be, this will be including pharmacists, um, even though we don't have a school of pharmacy at, at UCLA, so we're going to be having a private-public uh, partnership for that, um, partly because we do have pharmacists involved in that clinic. So we're being finally able to have an IPE that is a, of a really robust um, functioning team, and we're spending at six, these six months right now planning on how we can bring student learners in. Won't be medical students quite yet. Um, I like to have the residents established for a couple of years before we bring medical students into a mix. But that's something that is, is ongoing right now. The other thing is that we have um, a small amount of funding, and this is something we're doing um, also with Dr. Litzelman, so we get to continue to work with Indiana there. Um, of uh, having a faculty development in IPE. Uh, so we are actually uh, have been funded by the Macy Foundation, just a little tiny bit, but just to be able to start working on how do we develop faculty to be able to provide humanistic care in an interprofessional setting. Uh, and so the nice thing is that I'm joining that together with the clinic that I'm working with. They are wanting to learn how to do this. They're very humanistic people, and they need to learn how they're going to teach that to trainees. Um, so 
with that, I think we're going to just sort of leave this with you. These are all the other things that we did um, that we don't have time to talk about because we're already two minutes over. Um, but thank you all very much, and we hope that we can talk further. Thanks. I get a brain cramp thinking about a simulation thing done in two, two and a half days with 300 learners and 100 faculty. That is amazing. All right, so we have our, our last presentation uh, on relationship-centered transformation of curricula, and this is all related to interprofessional education. We have Ann Gill from Baylor College of Medicine and Lori Graham from the College of Medicine at Texas A&M. Good afternoon. Hi. So Dr. Graham and I are, are very delighted to be with you today to tell you some of our stories about interprofessional education, grant-sponsored activities at Baylor College of Medicine and at Texas A&M Health Science Center. Before I begin, we have no disclosures, and we also want to express our gratitude to the NIH and to OBSSR for convening this conference. I'd also like to recognize the many people who have contributed to this grant. Um, certainly Beth Nelson, who was the PI on the grant for the first four years of this uh, 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 cycle. And I also would like to recognize Dr. Kayla Teal, who is now the Dean of Academic Affairs and Associate Research Professor at Texas A&M who designed all of our assessments and our evaluations and completed the analyses for this project. And I am just so pleased that she could be here. So Kayla, if you would raise your hand and appreciate her tremendous contribution. So um, the, for the purpose of this presentation, uh, Dr. Graham and I are going to just focus on our IPE activities which uh, and our collaborative efforts, which are specific aims two and three of the grant. And time constraints being what they are, we're not able to present all of our activities. There are actually a lot more than this. But we're just going to focus on some of the highlights and some of the things that we think that you might find of interest. So the first activity I'd like to highlight is the creation of a preclinical IPE experience within our second year patient safety course. Oh, and by the way, the patient safety course was also a grant-sponsored activity. This is a requirement for all our second-year students. We originally piloted this with about 40 student volunteers, and then when we got all the kinks knocked out of it, we went ahead and scaled it up to have all the preclinical equivalent students at all three of our institutions, which is Baylor College of Medicine, again, private, the University of Houston College of Pharmacy, also public, and the um, uh, Texas Women's University. So for each year we have conducted this activity, we have about 180 medical students, we have 80 nursing students, and 40 pharmacy students who collaboratively work through a case and then complete an evaluation. The activity takes about an hour and a half, and it is equally led by nursing, pharmacy, and medical faculty for both the presentation and the debriefing. And just to give you some context, the, the case is a near miss, and it concerns a patient who experiences a fall and is seen in the emergency room and appears to be about ready for discharge, but in, you know, it looks like it's just had, you know, he's had some mild bruising. But while preparing for discharge, the nurse notes that the patient is exhibiting a loss of balance and some arm weakness. So she shares her concerns with the MD who notes the concerns but goes ahead and continues on with the discharge. So when the ED pharmacist is making her rounds, the nurse consults with her. And because of these ongoing concerns, all three go in to see the patient together. At that time, the pharmacist uncovers the use of multiple supplements that can increase um, bleeding time. So the patient further deteriorates and ultimately is diagnosed with a subdermal hematoma. This actually came out of the literature, by the way. So this evaluation data is from a retrospective pre
pre-post survey, and it represents the results of our most recent iteration of the event, which was in September of 2015. And this is very similar to what we've seen in the years past. As depicted in this slide, students in each discipline reported significant increases in their perceptions of how to communicate with members of an interdisciplinary team, how their own communication could contribute to a patient error, and how to help resolve patient care conflicts between interdisciplinary teams. While it's not shown in this slide, we also saw significant increases for students of all disciplines pre and post knowledge about the roles of the disciplines and patient care teams, even their own discipline. All right, the second IPE activity I'd like to highlight is our third year No Place Like Home experience. This was one of the very first things we rolled out in the second um, five-year um, iteration of the grant. And during this activity, we have two medical students and we have two pharmacy students who accompany a physician or a nurse practitioner for an afternoon home visit. As part of this experience, students ride together to a patient's home and they engage as an interprofessional team to develop a management plan and to collaboratively present their findings to the provider. The ride to the patient's home is used to educate learners on the concept of home visits. The ride back to the medical center is used for debriefing and reflection about the clinical encounter. So we've done this activity now for about five years. And you know, from the very beginning, we said, okay, we got a grand slam. You know, the students routinely rated it very highly. And every year, at least one medical student and one pharmacy student will say, this is the best thing that they've ever done in medical school. But when we then begin to compare medical student attitudes about pharmacists before the no place like home visit to after the no place like home visit, we found no differences. Even when we compared medical students who participated in the no place like home versus those that did not. And now these um, data are not actually shown here. What we did find is that students really enjoy seeing patients in the home environment, working directly with a practitioner, and learning about community-based resources. But when we looked at the specific IPE goals for this experience, it was significantly less value than other aspects of the visit. You know, so folks, this is why we do educational research. Now, why we're going to continue to do this visit because it's very rich, and but there's a lot of other curricular goals that we're meeting with this experience. But it's our belief that these home visits can be so powerful and overwhelming that the IPE goals get lost in the clinical encounter. Okay. So the last IPE intervention I'd like to spotlight is a simulation activity with a standardized patient that's included as part of our medicine sub-I. The experience begins with an icebreaker, and this is for all of our students, medical, nursing, and pharmacy. And then afterwards, the students are assigned to teams, including one member for each team, for each discipline, and they're instructed that they're going to have to give bad news to a family member whose loved one has been transferred to the intensive care unit after receiving a thousand times the normal dose of heparin. Again, a true case happened in our emergency room in our hospital. The team is allowed about five minutes to develop a plan, and then collectively they go see the family member. The SP's response will be one either of anger or anxiety. And then upon completion of the scenario, the team regroups with nursing, medical, and pharmacy faculty to debrief the experience. It's very similar to what y'all are doing. It's, it's, and we did not, you know, collude on this at all. <laughs> so frequently, issues of team learnership and blame come to the fore, um, with medicine assuming blame because they wrote the order, pharmacy takes blame because they dispense the medication, 
and nursing believing that they're to blame because they administered the medication. We began this offering in 2013, and in addition to doing student evaluations of the experience, we asked the SPs to rate the teams on multiple domains. In 257 encounters, we had 22 trained SPs that were used, and they rated, um, they rated an average of about 12 student teams. 53% of the teams encountered an SP that was portraying an angry family member, and the rest were anxious family members. The SPs were asked to rate six behaviors related to patient-centeredness, such as asking for input or questions about a situation, using plain language, acknowledging emotions, and responding empathetically to those emotions, providing clear and cohesive information, and jointly discussing the next steps. These results were summed, and then when we looked at this measure of patient centeredness and how it was related to, the, and then we looked at the, how it was related to teams' characteristics. So teams that worked collaboratively, that had no dominating, dominating member, shared responsibility for the error, and who had more members of their team that were empathetic and effective with emotion tended to perform higher numbers of these patient-centered behaviors. This suggested that having an effective team member was critical to building relationships with a family member and that a single effective member could not achieve the same. So now, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn the podium over to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Lori Graham, and she's going to share some of our collaborative activities. Thank you, Ann. And I want to apologize up front because I brought my Austin, Texas allergies with me. So if you can bear with me, I'm trying to have enough voice to, to finish up. But we want to... We want to tell you that one of the things we have valued the most has been the collaboration itself, being able to work together. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to take a look at different things that we were doing at each institution that we might be able to replicate, things that might work. Some of you brought that up earlier. And so we spent some time looking at those activities and looking for specifically what might maximize time and utilize resources in the best way. So we had the opportunity to do that, and what I want to share with you today are two specific activities that we did that hopefully you'll find of interest. The first one was Disaster Day. Disaster Day has been at A&M for about eight years. It began with 37 nursing students and is a student-led College of Nursing activity. They use scenarios that are repeated morning and afternoon. But with Disaster Day, we wanted to have the opportunity to evaluate, and that's one of the things that we realized after we, our office got involved, we realized that that was not happening. There was not enough evaluation going on. So we had a small team from our group who elected to try to put together some evaluation instruments that we might be able to utilize. So there were three specific instruments that we put together based on the IPEC competencies. We used a team questionnaire, we used an observer instrument, and a standardized patient questionnaire. And you can see some of the information there. We wanted a multidimensional uh, assessment, and so we wanted to be able to look at specifically how well individuals would interact um, with others that would impact patient care, of course. And so the internal reliability turned out to, to be good. And so I'm going to take just a minute and look at each of these. In this particular case, I wanted you to see the numbers. So this, we started evaluating in 2014. So in 2014 and 2015, we were there, and there were 463 total participants. We just had our third opportunity to evaluate, but it literally ended a couple of weeks ago, so I don't have that information for you yet. But the College of Nursing is obviously the largest proportion with the College of Medicine being next and the College of Pharmacy. And in each year, we've brought that up a little bit. The, the scenario itself that is presented on that day to the students would also dictate sometimes bringing in others who were interested and wanted to participate. So we've had public health with us. 
We've had EMTs, paramedics. We've had radiology students with us. So it's been an opportunity to bring in uh, different people to, to work together. With the team questionnaire, I just wanted you to see that students were actually rating pretty high and that um, the, the nice thing about this was um, we were able to look at the difference between the two. And if you'll notice both the, the, the team, the observer, and the standardized patient, the ratings would end up coming out fairly high. We did notice, though, that um, there were, they were fairly consistent when you looked at the team questionnaires between the two years. And we're very anxious to see if that's the case again on this third year. So that will be, we'll have that information shortly. So what I wanted to tell you was that in summary on these particular instruments that we used, we did get positive feedback from everyone. It was very interesting to note though that students tended to rate themselves higher than did the patients, the standardized <laughs> patients and the observers. But, but that's one thing that was, that was fun to see. Um, also, we created the instruments with the intention of being able to use them for other simulations as well. So there was good information there, and um, we wanted to not just use the large scale. And this particular disaster day event, which started, as I mentioned before, at 37 people, is now uh, 800 plus individuals who are involved. So it is a really large scale. Um, I hate to use the word production, but it feels that way sometimes, but it's, it's really interesting to watch. And um, we had the opportunity, Baylor came over, participated with us, evaluated with us, and we had the chance to get their input on that particular event. As a result of that, they wanted to go back and replicate something similar. It would be very difficult for most of us to go out and plan an 800 person event overnight. So what they wanted to do was a smaller scale to look at perhaps implementing a crisis management event where we could use a similar instrument and we would, we, they actually adapted one of ours instead of a dichotomous. We, ours were literally observed and not observed and they went to a three point scale. They used their objective so it was organized by objective. And we noticed that there were, if you had just a single observer, then as you can note on here, it was not very reliable. But when we had six observers, it was, it was okay. One of the things that we felt like would be important would be to bring in even more. But it was a much smaller scale event, but it was really nice to work together to be able to make that happen and see how we can make that change and grow over time. So with crisis management, this is the event that we, that we chose and thought it went well. The thing that we wanted to do, and some of you have already mentioned this, is our institution was very interested in Baylor's implicit bias training. And so as a result, they came over and trained ours, and then we went and actually spent time observing what they do, went through the process with them to see if it was something that we could make happen at our institution. So this was another one where we were able to try and implement not we were not nearly as far along as they were, but it was a good, a good opportunity to get started. So in the spring of 14, we did, our, our institution is geographically dispersed, and we wanted to run it at the same time on all four campuses. So that's a little bit challenging, and you've mentioned logistics, that's always the hard part. But we did it, and this was strictly medical students. And then in the spring of 2015, we thought, why don't we try it on a smaller scale but let's bring in some others and see how it works in terms of an interprofessional activity. So we did, and we had medicine, nursing, and chaplaincy, smaller numbers, but it was very interesting to look at those outcomes. As a result, I wanted to compare the outcomes with you and just look at how, that, how it all looked when it was finished. The students were clearly more aware of bias when they, that we used the uh, IAT as well, and they had several different pieces of that that they utilized. But it was interesting because the change for nursing students was greater than what we saw in terms of the experience for medical students. So when, when we did theirs, um, the, the um, medical students, there, it was not significantly different. So. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to bring up was we were looking at, as a group, we were looking at 
the focus on implicit bias and its impact on patient care. The piece that seemed to be missing for us was not management. How do we, how do we help them with that? How do we help them with So that is sort of where we would like to go in terms of um, we, we had the opportunity to do the first part. Now we feel like it's, it's an opportunity to go further with that. So that's a critical piece in um, the behavioral and social science research helping change behavior, so we need to figure out what are the best ways to do that in this particular format. So I also wanted to say thank you to a team. We were very fortunate to have a great group of people who worked with us. And some of you know Dr. Courtney West is here today, and Courtney was instrumental in helping us with the grant and has done a great deal of work in manuscript development, and she and I presented last week at SGEA. And so I wanted to say thank you to her for all that she's done to make it a uh, success. And um, last but not least, we wanted to talk just a minute about future steps for us. And one of the things that we've done is we've looked at things that we might be able to continue to do. And as a result of the grant, we feel like we can continue to collaborate. Our disaster day event occurs. We can work together and find ways to continue to fund that. And so we're hoping to continue that and the implicit bias workshop with Baylor to give us more information to build on what we've done so far. And so we're looking forward to that. We've sort of committed to try to do that for the next couple of years. The really nice part about our collaboration with Baylor is that I feel like we have become not just collaborators in terms of our colleagues, but friends as well. And so we've, we really enjoy the opportunity to do that. Um, Baylor College of Medicine is undergoing a lot of curriculum redesign right now and for the fall of 2016 um, they've used some of the things as a part of the NIH BSS curricular reforms um, and interventions as they've done their planning for their new curriculum. As a part of the consortium, two things we wanted to mention, Baylor is implementing a narrative medicine program following the Columbia model. And Courtney and I continue to co-chair the IPE subwork committee. We're trying to examine ways now, we were talking earlier with some of you about that, about how we continue that. How do we keep going? We've done that on a regular basis now and we've had some um, good things come from that and so we, we don't want to see it end. So we need to just find those ways to continue to collaborate. So I thank you very much. We were grateful for the funding and for the opportunity to share some of the things that we've done together. So. Thank you. Wow, there is so much going on at these schools, and I know these guys are, you know, kind of early adopters. It's quite exciting, all the work that we've seen and heard about. Now, I know we need to move on to the reactor panel, and so what I'd love to do is invite those who will be on the panel to start coming forward. Um, while also allowing those of those who just presented to answer any questions that that may have uh, that folks may have so does anybody have questions for the two IPE pre presentations that just occurred one of the things I wanted to know is um, did you guys do any cost analysis to see how much it costs to do this could you speak a little can you come to the mic and speak about that I don't know where to look, but I'll look at you all. Um, we did a cost analysis. The camera. Oh. <laughs> Trying to avoid those. Um, if you assume that all the faculty involved are volunteering their time, including the leadership, and you just look at the student cost, it's $35 per student. <clears throat> ten, uh, ten grand. <laughs> I know. Yeah. They did it for CMA. That's kind of payment. Any other questions before we move on? Yes. Hello, everybody at home. 
I'm wondering to whom you report at your institution um, in terms of IPE. Is that to the president of the university? Is that wh where does that fall? For our institution, quite honestly, that has changed over time. Um, we had an IPE, a person who was responsible specifically for IPE, and that has, has moved through a couple of people. We have a woman now who is in charge of the IPE, and we have a committee that works together. But generally speaking, when we first started out, we actually spent most of our time working with the dean of the College of Medicine, and so that's, it's e still evolving, frankly. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. So I'm going to turn now and introduce the reactor panel, and I'll introduce all of them uh, in alphabetical order, and then I'm going to ask Sue, since you're the last one being introduced, to be the first one to provide comments from the day. And I figured if you each um, shared comments for 10 or 12 minutes, if that's less, it's fine. Um, and that, if, if we stick to 10 or 12 minutes, it'll allow 15 minutes for questions and more discussion at the end, which I think will be good. So. First, Eric Humble. Eric and I are pals in evaluation. That's what we are. We really have a boatload of fun. Uh, and he's a board certified internist. He's senior vice president for milestones development and evaluation at the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. He's over 20 years of experience in education assessment and quality improvement sciences. He um, is also the very recent recipient of the 2016 John P. Hubbard Award by the National Board of Medical Examiners. He just got awarded that. So yay, Eric. <laughs> he hates it when I do that. It's awesome. And then another good pal of my Tom Inouye, we've had a couple of conference calls with the USMLE about step scores, which is a character builder for sure. <laughs> And Tom is professor of medicine at Indiana University, and he's a senior research scientist there as well. Uh, he's got a lot of experience as a primary care physician, educator, and researcher, and he brings lots of expertise to the physician-patient communication, health promotion and disease prevention, chronic disease management, and the social context of medicine and the humanities. He's a recipient of the Holman, am I saying that right? Hellman Health Achievement Award from Indiana Public Health Association in 2010 and the Elnora Rhodes Service Award for exceptional service to the Society of um, SGIM. That's the quickest way to say it. Um, and he received that award in 2014. Lucinda Main was new to me. I called her and got her on the phone. Like, <laughs> the, well, I, I, I cold called her got her on the phone first time, asked her to come, and I've never heard a faster yes to anything I've ever done in my life. It was awesome. And so uh, Dr. Main is the Executive Vice President and CEO of the American Association of the Colleges of Pharmacy. Um, she's a leader at this organization and in high quality pharmacy education. She has an incredible, we, we spend a lot of time over lunch talking and her career has just been amazing. So she's got so much experience in developing strong ap academic scholars and leaders support to support excellent professional doctorate and postgraduate degree programs, both in and outside the profession of pharmacy. She also currently serves as the president of the Pharmacy Workforce Center and the treasurer for Research America. Next is John Prescott. He's the chief academic officer for the Association of American Medical Colleges and he uses his expertise and experience to lead change efforts at AAMC that will help prepare deans, faculty leaders, and future physicians for the challenges of clinical practice in the 21st century. Next, who, without which we would not be here, Dr. Riley. He's the director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research at the NIH. And he uses his backgrounds in clinical psychology, so he gets all this stuff really well. Um, his research interests are in behavioral assessment and, and psychosocial health risk factors, tobacco use and cessation, and the application of technology to prevent health behavior and chronic disease management, uh, and to be a leader in the field of behavioral and social sciences. And last but not least, I, Sue Skoshlak was one of the PIs when we were first funded, and that's when I got to meet her. She was at Wisconsin then, 
And so we, you know, this whole group bonded very early on and Sue provided an incredible leadership. And so she gets bored quickly, so she has moved on. <laughs> and she is the group vice president for medical education at the American Medical Association. Since joining the AMA, she has leaded, led the str strategic initiative accelerating change in medical education, which now has how many medical schools in it? 32. 32, yahoo. Um, she also created the AMA Center to Transform Medical Education and has led planning for five national invitational conferences on various topics in medical education. So that's our panel, very impressive. So I'm going to start off by having Sue give her reflections. She's been with us um, all day long, asked some great questions uh, after some of the earlier presentations. And uh, Sue, take it away. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for that very generous introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure to have been present for the birth <laughs> and also to be present for the passing on now into immortality, I'm sure, uh, as this initiative uh, has a chance to celebrate and reflect its achievements. And I'm here to bear witness to the fact that you can declare victory, and I mean that seriously. This initiative has made a difference, and let me tell you what I mean by that. I think Dr. Ju's slide at the beginning was a key, and he put in one place some of the most important things that have happened in this area in the last decade. It includes LCME standards that say that to be an accredited medical school, this must be part of your curricula. It includes an NBME now restructured so that this material is on all three of the step exams. It includes the ACGME's leadership in these areas that relate to the six domains of competency and the leadership coming from AAMC in terms of the EPAs for entering residency, as well as AAMC's leadership that was heavily uh, 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 contributed to and led by people from this group in the area, the core area of foundations in behavioral and social sciences. When we started as a group of K07 schools, nine of us, we had the most fun coming here to the NIH because it was like two different cultures. It really was fun. But we had a value system that I don't think is exactly uh, congruent with the R and the F and some of the other uh, ways of funding initiatives, which are very individual based. So we got together as our first group and we all said, we want to share our curricula. We want to have the opportunity to understand if we're making a difference through a national evaluation plan. We want to get together regularly. And the office staff, as well as the staff at the institutes, because the money came from cancer, heart, lung, blood, complementary medicine, they all said, oh, you want to do that? Well, we've got some mechanisms, and it's not a U or it's not a T, but we've got some evaluation grants and some conference grants, and they all worked with us to figure out how we could actually come together when originally, I think, um, NIH and the institutes were thinking, great, curriculum, go do good work, but perhaps didn't understand the culture of sharing and opportunities that come from those of us that work in education. Now, I'm not claiming that all of these things that we just cited came only from this initiative, but if there was not an IOM report in 2004, and if this group wasn't out there for 10 years in the regional meetings you just mentioned and the national meetings and writing those items for national board, et cetera, this change would not have happened. And so please own it and celebrate it. And keep moving forward on that. I want to then speak just for a moment for the vision um, of the original folks and all of you as you've continued forward because one of the first things that happened 10 years ago at the meeting when the PIs came together was an opportunity to brainstorm to say who should we be influencing 
And literally those that were in the room might remember that we talked and called out people like the LCME and the NBME and the AMA and other groups that had the potential to make a difference on a national level. And so it was a deliberative and thoughtful direction that was taken by all of you that have been working on these initiatives, and I think that was really a lot of foresight. I miss greatly someone we talked about at lunch, and that is Dr. Alan Cross. I just want to call his name. Tell him thanks. Because he was a big leader within the power structure of the NIH to say, can we keep this going for another round of funding? And uh, sort of knew how to work the ropes. He'd been out there in health disease uh, prevention, uh, health promotion, disease prevention for a long time and kind of kind of knew how to work some of the, the national uh, um, organizations in a very effective way. Um, so this leads me to talk a little bit specifically about the power of the collaborative and the consortium. And I believe very strongly in that in part because that's the work that I do currently at the AMA with the 32 medical schools. I'm going to use your words that you said today. You talked about one of the things we valued the most is the opportunity to work together. And also earlier, the talk about the fierce companionship and that this is home and that that's what your faculty feel when they get together, but that's what you feel. That's what I feel when I visit with you. You've been welcoming to me for years to come back when you have your meetings at AAMC and other places that this is a sense of renewal that's very important for the work that we're doing and that without this social connectedness and the opportunity to work together as a collaborative, the discipline does not move forward and the change does not disseminate in the same way. So the work is not done. In fact, uh, I would charge back to my own organization to think more deeply about the problems that I've mentioned earlier during my questions throughout the day. The pain that's out there among providers, especially to my knowledge, physician providers that are struggling right now in the current environment and are having a hard time making it through their days and their weeks. A sense of needing to have more renewal, more resilience, and most importantly in the work that we do, more regeneration of those that'll come behind us to keep filling in and doing the work that we're doing. So thank you, just some thoughts. Appreciate your work. Thank you, Susan. I also want to give a shout out to Ron Abels, who is our project officer in the first round of funding. It looks like he's watching, so we've got a shout out for Ron. Yeah. <laughs> So, that's so nice, Dr. Riley. Yeah, that's a nice actual way to start here because the people like Ron Abels and directors before my time actually had a lot to do with getting this off the ground and getting it running and doing the things that need to be done. So, um, so definitely hats off to the people who actually thought through this process along the way. Um, a, a few thoughts as I've listened throughout the day, um, and I'll, I'll start with the NIH sort of perspective, um, just because as I was listening to the things that everyone was doing and the work that was going on, um, that's very practice oriented. Um, I always think about that small percentage of people from medical schools and allied health professions that end up going into research and the value that this also has for them. Um, the ability to better understand how to recruit, how to engage participants, how to maintain their adherence over time and whatever clinical research protocol and treatment they have them involved in, how to deal with adverse effects, all of those sorts of things that need to be done. Um, so this grounding, I think, is important not only for practice purposes but also for the research purposes that the NIH is most well known for. Um, so it was nice to see some of those things. Um, I will say as well, um, it was certainly nice to see how much things have changed um, from when I was first asked to teach medical students about behavioral science and I was told I had three and a half hours. Um, so it's nice to see there's a little more time. Um, that though reflects back on, I think, one of the problems that we have, which is um, primary care docs particularly and docs in general and allied health professionals across the board are so strained with so many things they have to do. And I think the U.S. Preventive Health Task Force said something like uh, it takes over eight hours in a day 
to, to do those recommendations without ever actually seeing a patient or treating them in some ways. So we've, we've thrown almost too much at their laps. And I think one of the things that we need to think about is how do we prioritize these things? What sort of trainings are more critical, more important? If you only had to pick three things, what would those three things be? Um, so that we're a little bit more um, focused in, in what we do and how we do it. Um, the, the, the other part is just thinking about how much things have changed. Uh, my wife is a physical therapist, and her entire behavioral and social science training was in transactional analysis. I don't know if many of you remember that, but she works mostly now in, uh, in uh, pediatric rehab, um, mostly with kids who are either physically or mentally or emotionally challenged. And from time to time, um, I enjoy, at the end of the day, as she's telling me about those experiences, to say, just say, I'm okay and you're okay. And I'm sure that works just fine, um, which it doesn't, right? And so, um, you know, one of the things as I was listening today, and there are a lot of things that people talked about, um, and I know some of you are pediatricians or have that more pediatric um, end of the experience, is sort of the behavioral management things when it comes to the kids that are more difficult to work with and how do we manage them, how do we maintain just using social learning theory, um, modeling and operant conditioning and those sorts of things to maintain and, and not inadvertently reinforce things that we don't want to have the kids continuing to do. Um, so it was nice to hear a number of those things. The, the last point I wanted to make before um, um, ending is um, with all the things that we teach, we can't teach all the basic behavioral and social science work. But as I was listening through the day um, to all the sort of more practice oriented and more applied into the spectrum, I kept thinking about the basic science that is the underpinnings for um, shared decision making and communication processes, right? And all of those other things that people talked about throughout the day. And so I don't think we need to do that. We don't have to provide that as part of the training, but we, sh we sure need to make sure that medical students and, and allied health professionals understand there's, there's a basic science grounding in that work. That we're, it's coming from something other than you know, doing good things for people, right? Which is how we sometimes end up getting portrayed. Um, so I think it's important to sort of recognize that and make sure they're aware of that aspect as well. And so with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So before I have John start, I, I had an injury early in January and, and would just, to rehab was doing laps after being in a brace for a while and not being able to bend over. And um, I met this man at the track who was doing laps every morning. He used to weigh 400 and something pounds. And his doctor had said, if you don't stop this, you're going to die. And he, he lost when I first met him a couple of years ago. And I finally saw him again after all this time. And he was down to about 165. And he said, my doc was with me every step of the way. And it was his primary care doc. And I'm like, that's the doctors we need, is those guys. Dr. Prescott. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, being here. I really do appreciate it. I'm sorry. We got it. Thank you. For the 270. That's it. I got it. OK. <laughs> No, and I do appreciate the, uh, the, the invitation to be here. And certainly, if I've learned a lot. The reason I didn't ask any questions is because I was listening. Um, I feel like the imposter up here. Uh, I'm the imposter because this is, this, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't write this book, which a lot of you participated in doing and, and helping to do. I came along at the same time as it was being done and uh, got to see some of the early editions of it. And, and I just think it was, it was a great work because it was a turning point for the AAMC, a turning point, I think, for medicine in general. Um, and I was asked, and I, I think we all were asked to do this, so I'm going to kind of keep to the script that I was, I was given, but the bottom line was um, they, was asked, they sort of asked about how did this, uh, if you look back on your career and look about your job and what are the things, um, um, where has the behavioral and social sciences impacted you most? Um, I went to school at Georgetown, uh, Jesuit institution right up the, the street here, um, and uh, they have this thing called Cura Personas, uh, basically the cure of the whole patient. I'd like to say that that was a model they were using back in 1981 when I graduated, but it wasn't. Um, but the idea is, is that they have moved to this concept of the care for the whole patient, looking at it at all times. I have a daughter who's a second year student, uh, so I get to see how that is, is being implemented. But I will tell you that I've known that throughout my career, um, and uh, I have seen the key roles that uh, behavioral social sciences have played in my in getting the job done. 
I'm an emergency physician. That's my background. And so, um, and I was the dean of a medical school. And I have, um, so, and have had, uh, as a military physician. And so I've had experiences um, that I would, well, they, some of them were unique, um, for sure. Um, some of them were incredibly challenging. And I can tell you that the way I got through them, the way I made impact, the way I was actually able to, to help influence, listen, learn, um, were all things that I didn't learn in LA 6, which was the big organism. It, it was the classroom at Georgetown um, where you sat and you learned uh, biochemistry and other things. You learned, I, I learned them from teachers, mentors, others along the way that helped guide me with the understanding that um, by listening, um, by understanding, um, by reflecting, um, and uh, constantly learning that that was going to make the biggest impact uh, along the way. And admitting mistakes, uh, talking with colleagues, um, those were, were, the, were the key aspects. Um, so uh, that those, were, those were just key for me. Um, at the AAMC, I'm supposed to talk a little bit about the perspective that's, that's, that we've taken. And I actually, I think more, you've done more of this today about talking about some of the projects and things that we've been working towards. Certainly the core EPA project has been talked about several times and it's been something that we're, we're working very, very hard on. Ten of our schools are working on it. There's over 800 individuals who are on that list, sir. Probably a lot of you in the room. Um, and this is a, a, a one project uh, that we're continuing to, to move forward on. Uh, the the uh, um, Looking at EPAC, educating uh, pediatricians across the continuum is another of, of our, our projects we've looked at. So you mentioned some of the data, uh, data um, resources, the GQ, uh, MSQ, the P, you know, we, we just, we, we tend to have these resources which are, are very valuable for, again, looking at things all, all along the way. And I will tell you that um, uh, probably you are also involved with the curriculum inventory. If, and if not, please be, because um, <laughs> and the reason I ask that is because that's how we can, um, we can take a look at where are we, where do we have gaps on a national level with uh, particular aspects of our curriculum. Um, and I will tell you that it, it's, 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 it's great when we, when we know that we have 99% uh, of our medical schools and we're working on that last 1% to make sure that we have something that we're working on. My partner in crime here, and Lucinda will talk in just a little bit about, uh, um, we'll talk, but the idea is that uh, the WMC was one of the original uh, members, uh, along with pharmacy and, and uh, other organizations that went on IPEC and looking at the interprofessional educational uh, consortium and collaborative um, and really how important it was. And I think it was a turning point, truly was, and when the competency also came out with regard to that, um, we saw a, a major shift in, in, in things. I like to think also of our diversity policy uh, and programs also have been embracing in a very strong way. Um, uh, a lot of what has been discussed here, um, you've seen the MCAT change. I mean, who ever th thought the MCAT would change? And, 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 and actually, and, and to a point where right now where this is, it's not only considered important, it's considered vital. It's considered absolutely essential. Um, and so we're looking for students, again, uh, the whole holistic review, looking at these things which were, which were going to be incredibly positive. Um, I will challenge, I want to particularly, I was going to mention something to you and I'll challenge this group with some thoughts um, and I'll come again with the perspective of someone who's worked in administration, particularly uh, I work with the 145 deans, you know, okay, so imagine that's my job, that's my primary job, okay, so if you think you've got it, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, so I work with them and I'll tell you though, I don't believe, and you said something before uh, about the, I'll, if I quote it, it's, medical schools are quite lean. Okay, I don't believe it. They have hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, most of them, if not billions, that they work with. Now, well, the, that's here's the, here's the point, and I would challenge you. I would challenge you. I only heard cost mentioned once today. I didn't hear it mentioned at all in most of the presentations. I didn't hear about educational value. I didn't hear, I, I know it's valuable. You know it's valuable. But show me how what you're doing for what cost is actually making impact. I challenge you to do that because, uh, and I've done this, and some of you heard me at the Western GEA, maybe you've heard me at, at the Central GEA this year to, making the same kind of a plea. 
is that that's when you will get the dean's attention and you'll get the, the health system leader's attention is when you can show the, the value of things. Um, and I just, and so I will, I will come back to that and, and, and basically challenge that. And the last thing is, I truly was impressed. I loved the way that all of you talked about your partners. Your partners, it was, it was truly great. And some of you, I wouldn't have naturally put together. Uh, <laughs> uh, and a uh, you know, dean level or state level or whatever else level, sometimes like, it was just, it was neat to see. Can you scale up? Yes. Okay. How do you take what you're doing and scale it up so that it has impact? And I, one of the, the colleagues I get to work with so much is, is Susan, and we look for opportunities to work together. Um, and I, I'm thrilled at where the progress is with the AMA has made over the past several years in its impact on education. But we'll do better when we continue to work together. Um, that's how you look at it. That's how we have to look at it. And that's how we have to look across the health uh, professions continuum. So thanks, and Lucinda, I think you're up. Yeah. So I just want to say, I was kind of surprised that UNC didn't pick Duke for this. <laughs> <laughs> there are Thank some. you so much, Dr. We got some challenges. I love challenges. Thanks very much, Dr. Prescott. Lucinda. There are some cultural divides that just can't be <laughs> surprised. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to mix some personal experiences and reflections and some very strong reflections on what I've heard today. Why did I say yes in a microsecond? I think it's because at two educational inflection points in my career, um, I was at a unique opportunity, I had a unique opportunity to observe a significant social and behavioral shift in pharmacy education. When I tell people that the generation of pharmacists immediately in school before me learned under a code of ethics that said a pharmacist shall never divulge the information about a prescription, its composition of the purpose for, its, for which it was prescribed, and that communications courses at the time, if you want to call them that, taught pharmacists how to deflect patients' questions. Whew. Thank God for capitation funding for schools and colleges of pharmacy and others because there was an insistence in that federal law that schools of pharmacy incorporated clinical therapeutics in the curriculum. And the code of ethics, which is maintained by the American Pharmacists Association, changed in 1969. So that provision was in from 1929 till 1969. But in 1969 to 94, it said a pharmacist has a responsibility to share his knowledge with his patients. Um, we changed that too. Um, I guess I was there at another inflection point, which makes something I learned uh, in a keynote presentation. I was, uh, we were having Rachel Naomi Remen as a keynote speaker in 2004. And um, I was working with her on you know, customizing her, her message to the pharmacist's faculty audience. And she shared with me that she was, was either the daughter or the granddaughter of a pharmacist who had one of those classic pharmacies with a soda fountain in a rural area. And she used to play on the floor behind the counter. And she said, Lucinda, my dad used to ask his patients this question. Is there anything about your medicine that causes you concern? She said, do you think that I should share that with the audience today? And I said, please do, because <laughs> it was such a compelling. I think he was taught in the pre-29 uh, era of, of the code of ethics. So, uh, and when you were talking about how do you ask the question about questions, that just came you know, running back into my, into my mind. My other in inflection point academically was when I decided that my bachelor's in pharmacy was not going to be sufficient to change the world that so desperately needed to be changed. And so I went to the University of Minnesota to the Department of Social and Administrative Sciences. In pharmacy education, farm ad, farm ad as we would call it, about it from the pre-75 and earlier was all about running drugstores. Management and marketing of, of the shop where prescription transactions were done. Well, my uh, major professor and the director of the Social and Administrative Pharmacy Department at University of Minnesota was a pioneer 
and he began to encourage learners from across multiple disciplines. We had, I had as many non-pharmacists in my graduate cohort as I had uh, pharmacy graduates. And so there was just this rich sharing of psychologists and, and occasionally a nurse or a physician, uh, but other social scientists. And we were encouraged to take coursework from all across the University of Minnesota and customize our learning. And, uh, and so that diversity was great. But the emphasis was that drugs don't do it alone. And so we needed to have a, an effective social uh, and behavioral underpinning. And that influenced the PharmD curriculum, the BS, and then the PharmD curriculum in a significant way, um, such that um, my organization, when the decision to go to the entry-level doctor of pharmacy degree was made, it was a 60-year debate that ended just in time, the, um, we set about devising what we call the CAPE Outcomes, the Center for the Advancement of Pharmacy Education, and it was just the curricular outcome framework. Did that in 94, updated it in 98. Uh, in 2004, it took a major ch shift, and we released a new one in 2013. And the, um, the first domain is foundational knowledge, whatever we can figure out that is and then um, approach to practice. But the fourth domain is all about the affective work of clinicians. And what's significant about that is we develop that competency map in collaboration with the Professional Practice Association, so it's not just an academic enterprise. Um, and then our CAPE 1, 2, 3, and 4 became standards 1, 2, 3, and 4 in standards 2016, which is the new accreditation standard that will be in effect um, next, beginning next fall. And the schools are scratching their head right now to figure out how they can enrich those components of, of their um, learning, both in the curriculum and the co-curriculum context. Which brings me to the call I had at the first break today with a very dear friend of mine who's the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at one of our 135 schools of pharmacy. And so I told her what we were doing here, and, um, and she began to muse. She's involved in the integration of the curriculum at, uh, at the University of Tennessee, and she talked about how not one faculty member is ready to relinquish one minute of one <laughs> curricular element. <laughs> And, um, and so, you know, it, it raises a lot of, of questions. Um, and, and one of those, as it relates to the intersection of IPE and this kind of work, is why on earth would we ask medicine to do it, and nursing to do it, and dentistry to do it, and pharmacy to do it separately? when it's such rich contextual material, and intellectual material, and applied material for interprofessional learning. And um, yes, I look forward to getting up at 8 o'clock, or not getting up, getting on the phone at 8 o'clock every single Monday morning with my counterparts from AAMC, osteopathic medicine, nursing, dentistry, and public health, where the call might last five minutes, and sometimes occasionally it will push the limit at 30 minutes, but it's where are we going, what's moving, uh, what have you learned out there from um, you know, your, your visits uh, across the country and, uh, and across the world? And I was really impressed today with the amount of work that you've done in the assessment realm because we do recognize that that's an area where we are still handicapped without enough really good, reliable, and valid tools. And so we look forward to working with you on that. And I think you probably by now have heard that IPEC is no longer just six. We added nine other disciplines. Um, a few uh, weeks ago, and we will have the first IPEC council meeting of 15 different organizations, their chief executive officers and their chief elected officers uh, in, in late June. And I think that this work, and I like the social influences on health rather than the social determinants of health, um, and um, I think that that's an area of teaching resource development that we ought to commit to doing collaboratively. And obviously, this group would be an important one to, to draw upon in that regard. So just a couple of other things that came to my mind um, as questions today. Um, and, and one of them that nobody really spoke to is, what's the right dose? But I am sure you have talked about that a lot. Uh, and I don't think, honestly, there's a right or wrong answer there, no, other than none, you know, obviously, which none is not an option. Um, but, but it would be really important. And that leads me to 
the question of do we admit it on a holistic review and then grow it, you know, and, and what's the right balance uh, in those questions. And I, and I know we, we're studying and moving to holistic review in a lot of these issues. Uh, we look for in this, the admissions essay and the admissions interview, are they coming in with a sensitivity and awareness of, of what their role will be as a, as a patient-centered practitioner. Um, which takes me back to a note, my narrative illness story. I share because it has such great teaching characteristics. Uh, September 2004, I found out that my biopsy uh, result from an excisional biopsy was positive, but it had sat in my chart unreported back to me for a few weeks. And um, when I went in to see that general surgeon with my husband, who also is a pharmacist, um, he explained me anatomically using an analogy of a dairy cow. And then, oh, and by the way, it was stage zero DCIS, identified on a mammogram at age less than 50 um, through uh, microcalcification. He then described my risk using the analogy of Castro's ability to invade Miami. And it kind of went downhill from there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and my gotcha was, you know, before we stood up and, and he, we were done, he said, and, and he hadn't gotten a clean margin, so I had to go back and have another surgery. And he said, Lucinda, just promise me you won't do, it. You won't do nothing. And I stopped, smiled and I said, well, first, this gentleman won't let me do nothing. <laughs> I said, and second, you know, you didn't ask, but uh, Dan and I are both pharmacists, and I have a PhD in healthcare administration, so I guess our literacy level is slightly above average, although not for Arlington, Virginia. <laughs> it was kind of sort of the last time he talked to me, but the contrast is <laughs> when I went to see the oncologist, and I fortunately didn't need chemo, the first question she asked me was, Lucinda, please tell me what you know about your diagnosis and its treatment. And I had gotten Dr. Susan Love's breast book, and I had talked to a whole lot of women who had had a similar experience. And so I told her what I knew. And then she proceeded to pull out the 2004 NIH consensus guidelines on the diagnosis and treatment of DCIS for physicians and walked me through the algorithm and the, and the, and the decisions we had to make together. And it, it just is such a poignant lesson in, um, in the things that you are passionate about. And then the last thing I'm passionate about, and uh, thank you for reminding me about my Research America connection. Um, there isn't enough money to support the kind of work that you have done and, and the work that needs to be done, and it's under siege politically. And um, I'm glad nobody spent any time talking about that today, but I just did, and I invite you to join us in uh, the crusade to ensure that um, not only will there be some money, but there'll be more money in, to advance this really important area of science. Thank you. Yet again, we're reminded of the power of storytelling. Yet again. Tom. I'm happy to uh, have a chance to speak because uh, the more we go on, the more my head is bursting with, uh, <laughs> uh, with um, ideas that I will quell. You know, coming here, I uh, tried to think uh, for a bit about the question that was put to us in preparation for coming to the table, which, as you've heard, was uh, where in your own world has behavioral and social science been um, most important to you or important to you? So I, I thought that what I might do, and I, I really hope that I'm not falling prey to an old man's uh, tendency to tell stories was to say something about my uh, strong recollections of coming into medicine. So this is Tommy Newey's uh, ontologic view of uh, how behavioral and social sciences became um, a uh, quest for me as an individual coming into medicine. So you won't misconstrue my comments uh, to begin with. Uh, I'll, I'll say this is a Hopkins tie, and uh, I am proud of being a Hopkins alumnus. I was born at uh, Hopkins Hospital in the labor and delivery unit, so I am a 
an alumnus in every respect since I also attended uh, their medical school and uh, their school of public health and was a chief resident there. My mother and father were both um, uh, different uh, folk. My mother was a Unitarian Universalist farm girl from, Ill in, from Illinois who was a social activist and a pacifist and uh, desegregated the YMCA and YWCA in Youngstown, Ohio. My father was from a Buddhist family and was from a patriotic uh, family, a uh, Japanese-American family who were displaced from their home in Los Angeles during World War II and chose to stay in Heart Mountain because that's where their family, that's where their country had told them to go. And my father was um, drafted and was in a mass unit uh, in Korea out of patriotism, an action that my mother uh, objected to. So for quite a long time in college, we were, I was forbidden to talk about the Vietnam War at home because it was a source of major conflict. When I uh, went to uh, uh, medical school after a Quaker college um, at, uh, west of Philadelphia, it was really the first time that uh, I remember knowing anything about Baltimore and about Hopkins. My godmother who was a nurse faculty member at Hopkins had me come a week early. So that was uh, late August uh, to, to Baltimore. And she uh, uh, arranged for my orientation. Part one of the orientation was uh, 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 shadowing uh, visiting nurses who were doing new baby visits in the neighborhood, uh, the African American new moms uh, were visited routinely about a week after they had delivered. So I saw the inside of the row houses. I smelled the inside of the row houses with their acrid pungent um, smell. I saw the red velour couches. I saw the photographs of Martin Luther King, Jack Kennedy, and Jesus on the walls. I saw the drug paraphernalia in the neighborhood because the nurses were aware of it and used it to figure out where the trouble spots were. Part two of the orientation was with a linen cart orderly named Lucky. I honestly don't remember what his real name was. He, he told me to call him Lucky. I called him Mr. Lucky. <laughs> uh, he, he was uh, also uh, someone who lived in the neighborhood. He was black. And he had, I think, uh, a, uh, a real uh, orientation method in mind. He took me first past the statue of Jesus under the dome in Hopkins and stopped in a hallway where he said, um, so Mr. Inouye, he said, yes, Mr. Lucky, I said, um, what do you see here? And at first I had no idea what he was talking about. And, and she said, literally, what do you see here? And I said, well, I see a drinking fountain over there, and I see a drinking fountain over there. And I see a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom, and what else, he said. And I see two other doors that look like that. What do you suppose those other doors are for, he said. And why do you think there are two drinking fountains, one over there and one over here? So let's go and stock the linen carts, uh, he said, and he took me to the private patient pavilion, Marburg, uh, with its high ceilings, and it's, uh, in that time of the year, it's hot in Baltimore, wonderfully air-conditioned hallways and large uh, private patient rooms. And uh, then he took me to the Osler building, which was the, uh, the ward, uh, the residence ward, with uh, four patients to each room and no air conditioning with the black bodies lying in bed, shiny with sweat. And then he took me down to the morgue, uh, a place I had never imagined going before I, I uh, matriculated at Hopkins. And, and he introduced me to Mr. Brown and he said, Mr. Brown, 
Um, what, what, uh, show us what you've got here. And there was these buckets, uh, wall, a wall uh, hallways full of buckets. There were two colors of buckets. It turns out that the gray buckets were for the organs left over after autopsy of white people. And then there were red buckets, which turned out to be the formaldehyde you know, buckets of organs left over from autopsies of black people. And Mr. Brown, why are there two more refrigerators you know, where you keep the bodies before the autopsies? Well, sir, he said, you know as well as I do, this one was for white people and that one was for black people. So uh, when I came up, uh, I uh, was shown to the place in which I was going to live, which was a dorm across the street from the school. And uh, there I was told, you know, you should be careful coming across the street to this dorm uh, because after dark it's really not safe on, on the street. You might ought to take the tunnel, the steam tunnel, because the tunnel is always safe and it's guarded at both ends. And the trouble is that we have so much heroin going around that people are crazy out of their minds for drugs. And even if you're wearing a white jacket, you might not be safe on the street. I had signed up for the dorm because I'd always lived in dorms. I stayed in the dorm until after April of 1968, when Martin Luther King was shot dead. And the National Guard turned out to separate us from the people of Baltimore who were burning the storefronts and some of the houses. And at that uh, time, I decided I was on the wrong street, on the wrong side of the line of military. I had to somehow get out of the dorm and get into the neighborhood. Now this was like visiting a crime scene. This was like, I don't know, Castle, if you know that detective story. It leaves you with questions. It makes you want to say, how did this happen? How did this happen here? What is going to happen going forward? How can this change? What is being a physician have to do with all of this? What does this mean that I should do? And so now you know, rolling it all fast forward, uh, why um, living in the community became a constant habit of mine. Deb knows that I still live in the inner city. Why I had to matriculate in the School of Public Health because over perfect the education was in Hopkins Medical School and in the Hopkins residency. It wasn't what I needed. It wasn't everything that I needed to know about what was happening out there in my neighborhoods, our neighborhoods. Why I have done education and program development for low-income, resource-scarce environments on every continent of this globe except Antarctica. Why I volunteered for the, health, for the Indian Health Service. Why I have a lifelong commitment Thank you, Ellen Cross, for saying this, to behavioral and social sciences. I was on a quest for this knowledge before um, this came along. I'm on a quest for this kind of knowledge afterwards. But as the IOM says and makes me as a member proud, knowledge is not enough. It quotes Gertrude and says we have to apply, I would say, we have to do whatever we can do. I would also say we have to be the change we want to see in the world. It is the way in which we bring other people into these traditions of learning and action. We have to embody the changes we want to see in the world. To the NIH and to the AMA, I would say, Notice what a consortium can do. This is especially important for the NIH. Don't think about individual institutions as the most trustworthy entities that there are out there. 
think about the consortia of individuals who work and link and push ahead across the institutions as the most resilient resource that uh, you have to work with. We were there before the grant. We will be there after the grant. Fuel the work of consortia and bring these remarkable people further forward. Thank you. How do you follow that one? <laughs> I'm not even going to try. So are there any questions? Um, so Tom's one of my all-time heroes. So it's, it's just uh, an honor to sit next to you. And what an incredible story. I couldn't help, uh, Tom, as you're talking, um, a phrase popped into my head uh, somewhat related. When I travel, I still hear a fair amount of what I call trainee bashing. You know, that, oh, they just want lifestyle. They just want that. And, and I have a term for it. I call it nostalgia-litis imperfecta profunda. Um, <laughs> And I think you highlighted that, you know, your experience and Lucinda, you did as well, that things actually maybe weren't as great as we thought they were and we should bring the better parts of our past forward. But I do think we also have to recognize that there are real limitations with that experience and learn from those and bring the kind of experience you just uh, beautifully did. Um, I was fortunate uh, to train at the University of Rochester during a time when uh, the biopsychosocial model was, was really uh, coming into to four. I, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I love George Engel and George Romano. I had the good fortune to be taught by them, and we routinely made fun of it uh, in every end of the year school play, um, as you might expect as students. But it was a profound impact, and I think it shows you that what a long journey this has been, and to see what's happening now is just really remarkable. Um, and I'm so sorry I couldn't join you this morning. I was at another meeting in town, so it's, it's just really a highlight to be here. Um, I would just highlight a, a couple other things I heard I thought were really, really important. Uh, the first from, from Dr. Riley, that we need to make people understand this really does have a science behind it. I, I can't, can't agree with you more. Um, I do a lot of faculty development assessment, and that's the first thing we start with. That stuff you think are the soft competencies, guess what? They're not so soft. Um, they really matter a lot, and, and they have major impact uh, on, on patients. Um, I think the other thing that, that struck me was, uh, you know, John's uh, point about scale up. I couldn't agree with that more, but my challenge to you is how do you scale it forward? Um, you know, looking at what's happening in the residency and clinical practice space, you know, we have so much to learn from you, and one of the things that uh, I, as part of an organization, getting to Tom's point is, is to be a conduit to the work that consortia are doing. And, and I can't agree with Tom more about the importance of collaboration and consortium. With regard to operationalizing some of the work you're doing uh, with re in my organization, as you know, we've, we've got this little project called the Milestones. Um, <laughs> You know, but it is a way to signal what's important, and they're far from perfect, and I worry about them every day. They keep me up. But I think the good news for all of you, particularly with the report that I had a good uh, fortune to be part of, working with Jason, who's one of the smartest people I've ever met, uh, <laughs> is that it is finding its way into those sorts of things. It is part of the conversations, and we need to continue to refine it. But that's really exciting to me that you know, there are disciplines that have recognized the importance and they're inculcating it into these frameworks, uh, if you will, to help guide the curriculum and assessment. And, and, you know, that's a step forward. I can tell you the disciplines that have probably had the most success so far looking at some of the early data were those that, guess what, were collaborative. Mm -hmm. They not only engaged multiple people, but people from outside their discipline. Um, and we're also willing to work with the programs in an iterative fashion. Those who basically use the traditional consensus kind of closed door process, they're struggling a bit more because guess what? Nobody has a shared mental model uh, to the same extent that, that they did. So that's been a really important lesson. Uh, we've actually crosswalked uh, all the milestones across the non-patient care medical knowledge competencies in preparation for round two several years down the road. The good news is a lot of this is in there. And I'm very excited about that. But there's a lot of work to do. I'm a big fan of interprofessional education. But I got to tell you, we have a lot of work to do within medicine on interdisciplinary education. The disciplines don't talk to each other. They just don't. 
Um, I travel a fair amount around the country and I run focus groups to get feedback, you know, to listen and hear what's working and what's not. And many times it's the first time they've actually had a meaningful conversation with each other. Yep, they show up at the GMEC, which is the Graduate Medical Education Committee meetings, but they're just there to kind of get an information dump or hear about things and they don't talk to each other. And so I think that's something to think about. You've got this incredible work going on at your schools. How can you, you know, scale forward into some of your residencies uh, to really help them? This is also embedded in the clinical learning environment review to really get the institutions to attend to the importance of the environment which plays into all of this, the interprofessional education, the safety, and the quality I think is really important. And I think one of the big challenges we have moving forward is, is what I call the translational problem. Um, it's translating or implementing into clinical practice. I, I, I agree, I hear the importance of the research, absolutely. Um, but I gotta tell you, I've in the past year been living this through my parents. My mom died a year ago, my dad's been very ill. And it, it's, it's just, I, I can't tell you how disappointing it is to see the lack of these skills in his care. My dad recently met with a, a hospice nurse trying to decide what to do. He had an unfortunate catastrophic event in the January despite being at work the day before as an engineer at the age of 83. <clears throat> um, and basically what he described as care in the rehab center was is he just felt like a thing. That was his words. You know, I'm just a thing here. Um, and when you look at all these things that happened to him, part of what was in addition to at times poor decision making was the lack of the attention to the behavioral and social science stuff, like the decision making, his engaging him, you know, because he's got bad kyphosis of his neck, they think he's demented. No, he's an engineer working at Raytheon. Um, so I think that's been something that's been really stunning to watch and not, not getting the staff to fully understand the importance of this engagement and all the things that you're working on. So that lack of translation, you know, I've been really seeing up front. So I can't emphasize enough about scale up, scale forward, um, and really help your faculty get good at this stuff because I don't know what it was like for all of you, I was at Rochester, but I can tell you within about two nanoseconds of being an intern at Bethesda Naval Hospital, it was gone. Yeah, that's really nice stuff there, good luck. You got a 120 hour week ahead of you. And so I think, you know, as we think about what we're putting people out into, it, that's really important. I think the hidden curriculum was something that was alluded to earlier, I think again it was Dr. Riley who kind of said like what we put people out into matters a lot. We do have to attend to that. We can build capacity, but where they go um, really matters a lot. And, and then I'll just end by saying, please, you know, feed forward any information to me or us that we think we can be helpful. I can't agree more with the collaboration across organizations. I just came from an IOM comp, a, a workshop on accreditation and how can the accreditors work together given that there's nine million of them um, you know, to make not only life easier but do stuff that's meaningful, move and work, continuous quality improvement. So I think we're entering this era of collaborative practice, not only at the care level, but at the organizational level, the discipline level, and you guys are trailblazers for that. And so it's just a privilege to be here and uh, thank you for the opportunity and I am never going after Tom again. <laughs>
is killing the selection process, it's making the students nuts, and it's overvaluing the test. So I wonder, um, for all of you, if uh, what we can do about it. Uh, we've thought about lim trying to limit the number. You're the folks who could do that. Um, I just think it's a real problem at the end game for a lot of students who may have written beautiful narratives and done really great community service, but when the rubber meets the road, um, it's a real problem from the get-go. So I, I, I guess I'd like all of you to address that. If I could just start a little bit. I, I think that you're absolutely correct, and you know, you missed out, or you didn't miss out, but I mean, I, I implied in there was also the, the number of interviews that go on, someone mentioned that before, the loss of the fourth year. Yeah, um, I mean, truly, if uh, as medical educators, you're all sitting there saying, um, it, you know, Susan has mentioned the dollars that it costs, um, and there's a host of things. So, so you've got students who are incredibly anxious. You've got um, program directors who are receiving far too many applications. Exactly. You have, I mean, I, I don't know how many residency program directors I've talked to, and they, well, I'll, I'll just do one. Uh, hopefully, no one here is ENT, but they were just like, well, we take three, we three take three residents, um, and every year we we go through this process, and every year one third of those residents doesn't work out. And it's like it, it, you're thinking, okay, so we've got a we've got a systematic problem here, um, and so it's again, it's how do we match those individuals and, and make sure um, there's there's so there's process issues, there's there's um, there's issues with over reliance on the step one. I mean, how did that happen? And 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 um, and uh, so I will tell you is that um, is that uh, there are efforts among all or probably all the organizations. I know that. For the WMC in particular, right now, is that we have taken this on as a major, major initiative this year. Um, we're meeting right before um, uh, on May 1st, right before uh, the GRA meeting. There's going to be a, a, about 40 people who are getting together to again take one more. I think we think we know the issues. We're trying to work now on solutions with regard to this. We do believe that this whole host of different ways of approaching the problem, and it's going to have to be multifactorial, and it's going to have to be multi-organizational. And it's going to have to be. I mean, this you know, for those of you in student affairs, there's traffic rules. There's ways of, of getting things that that we do end up doing. There's things that we probably could do, really could do. Um, and it's and it's. I think the loss of the fourth year to me is probably the the single. Um, well, it's not. I don't want to, because there's so many things here that are out there. But I'm glad you brought it up because it is a real issue, and we can do something about it. And I think that, you know, quite frankly. There are programs are, want certain individuals in their programs, and we're not doing a good job of identifying those characteristics that they want, and so that there's a good match between those characteristics and programs. So, mm -hmm. uh, probably others here can speak far more eloquently than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that I think it's become a serious problem, and, and I think it again is multifactorial. Mm -hmm. Part of it is I don't think we've helped when we talk about you know there's going to be. You know, no no match spots for you. So it's it's Kahneman's classic availability heuristic. You keep hearing that over and over. You believe the problem's much greater than it is. I mean, I've had conversations with with medical students on my travel who, you know, are doing at the top of their class. They're at really good places, and guess what? They're applying to thirty institutions, and that makes no sense, you know, to me. And yet they they bought into this that. I'm not going to be able to get a slot. I'm like, are you kidding? You're probably going to get your first or second slot, and yet we're we're doing that. So I, I agree that we got to really help with match, and, and I, I do worry that we've got to tone down the rhetoric about um, there not being enough slots, and, and, and or at least be much more clear and accurate to the students about what's actually happening in you know in, in that particular domain. That's the first thing. The second thing, honestly, is, is a former program director. I, I can tell you, you know, the elephant in the room is that there is a mistrust of the information that comes from the medical school. Yeah. I just hate to tell you that. I mean, no. I, you know, I, and so what ends up happening, so you've got this kind of really, I hate to, it's an overused metaphor, but the perfect storm kind of metaphor where you've got this availability heuristic and all this fear out there, and so that drives behavior. And then as John points out, you get, an incredible amount of applications come into the residency, and they need to have some sorting mechanism for better or for worse for busy people. And so, unfortunately, if they've been burned a few times before, I, that's what's going to happen. They're going to look at something that has at least some history behind it. Um, and having read Dean's letter, I mean, it's been a while. Hopefully, they're better. But I could tell you, it's reading code, yeah, yeah. you know. And so, it's at some point we got to get 
past that and figure out how to feed information. I mean, I, I was in the Yale primary care program, you know, and so we took a pretty interesting group of folks coming in, and, and we typically didn't get, quote, the top of the class from the A medical school. We were more interested in fit, you know, people who really saw a certain career path, and we wanted to make sure we were a good fit for them. And so all that credit, by the way, goes to Steve Hewitt, then that's the way he designed the admission process to make sure that we captured that. You know, yet you were really worried if somebody was really low, um, because the reality is that's going to be potentially a barrier for them for licensure and, and other things. Having said that, it's more about fit. So somehow we got to figure out how, to, how to, to do that a little better. The other fear I have, to be honest, is that you guys are doing all this great stuff, and, you know, res and students are applying all over the place, and they're not paying attention. Like, so is that place going to be, am I going to be able to use what I've just learned? So I think the A schools, as Susan is a really good example. I worry about some of these incredibly innovative places, and what if they go to a residency and they can't use any of it? So it, it, I think it's a very complex issue, um, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, there's a conversation going on. You know, as an accreditor, we can't restrict the number of places somebody applies, and we can certainly help residencies understand. But I think everybody's pretty frustrated. I was on three panels at the WMC meeting, and this came up every single time. Yeah. So I, could I just add, I, I think there are some opportunities to develop some new tools that are already out there that we need to play with and experiment with. Um, certainly, Oregon uh, has already started working on a badging system. Others are doing that as well to define credentialing more uh, deeply than a dean's letter. Um, and these tracks, again, tracks are things that are not uncommon now in schools, but what does it really mean and how do you define it? So that becomes part of the learner's portfolio and the holistic admissions and uh, experimenting more directly with not only video interviewing but video submissions of your portfolio so that you can interview the person um, without causing the same expense or necessarily relying on audition interviews. You've got two problems to solve. The first problem is the, the you need a screen and until we decide that there's something better than a graded step one rather than a pass fail step one, it's gonna be used because there's nothing else out there. And then the second is you need something that relates to the holistic need of the learner and the program that are each unique that are trying to find the right fit. So if we could focus on those two types of tools, what's needed, and really play with some new ideas, I think there's some good potential out there. And my last word is I'm just thanking you for teaching us what not to do. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you so much for your comments. Dr. Nui, you, you, your narrative was very, very poignant um, for many, many reasons. One of them for me was that you talked about being in a follower role in your initial experience. Um, it brought me back to my own experience at the Naval Academy when certainly for the first entire year my focus was on followership well before anybody ever really talked to me about leadership. Many of you represent different organizations that have big impact nationally. And when I read through the documents in light of thinking about interprofessional education and teams, I read a lot about leadership. And I read very, very little in the verbiage about followership. And so I'm wondering what role does have a stated objective and an outcome of learning to be a follower have in our educational system so that we really can be great collaborative players? Well, I've been um, perhaps uh, as um, attentive to how to join communities as uh, any random person you might meet in academic um, environments. And it's because I uh, learned a long time ago that uh, whatever uh, I might be able to conjure up in one head was far less than uh, might actually occur as ideation in many heads. And the more diverse the community and the more um, engaged with uh, action together, the better. So I, I would say um, that uh, one of the reasons that I'll just pass this along as another um, observation from the last century. I was a committee member of the Enhancing Medical Education Report. Um, and it was one of the hardest experiences at the IOM I ever had. And it was because um, absolutely everybody there was dedicated in the committee, except me, 
seem to be dedicated to the notion that my content will be not will not be left out. Damn it. And that was as true of psychiatry as it was of health economics, as it was of um, uh, every other discipline at the table. And I had come into the committee hoping for a transdisciplinary approach. Secretly, I was hoping for intersubjectivity, since that word has been used here. Shared mind. Ubuntu, thinking together, you know. We never came close, which is why the report uh, is as it is with those uh, domains uh, sorted out carefully from one another, each receiving equal attention. The beautiful thing about the work of this group is that uh, in your implementation at the coal front, you care deeply that people learn and you don't give a damn about whether your discipline is at this moment properly credited or your intellectual content properly represents. Yes, I heard the sociology comment, but <laughs> I really didn't care whether we talked about determinants of health or whether we talked about complex responsive systems <coughs> with health as an emergent property. All of that language was okay with me, so kudos to the group. Community action is the only action I know of that uh, responds powerfully to isms or to alienation or to vulnerable subpopulations and so on. And that's actually, uh, if that's followership, that's okay with me to call it that. I'm just for moving forward in the ways in which we can while sharing the experience and sort of leaning um, on one another. I really hope I'm responding to your question, uh, but I'll, sp uh, I'll think a lot about community action, uh, and I guess here comes my mother, and, the, <laughs> and, and not so much about followership. I think it's together moving the dials forward in some way. I heard just a couple of other things today that I think fit into this as well. Um, I love I know a little law, and I know how to find a lot more. And I think that that speaks to the profound complexity of um, healthcare today, whether that's diagnostics or therapeutics or the social determinants or whatever it is. There is no way that somebody is going to cross the stage in however many years, no one at all. And so from the IPET core competencies, when we're talking about roles and responsibilities, it is really getting our learners comfortable with the limits of their knowledge and to know that, gosh, I, uh, I don't know enough about this class of drugs, but maybe that person over there really does, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and teaching people to be comfortable with their vulnerability, which is not like endemic to our disciplines at all. <laughs> uh, just real quickly, anybody ever seen the video, The Lone Nut? If you haven't, no. it is fantastic. And the point of this video is that you can't have a leader without followers. You know, and so it's a lot of fun, and it's just, uh, if you get a chance, it's about five minutes. It's, it's a great video. It's called The Lone Nut. Lone nut. It's basically a gentleman nut. who's wildly gyrating at a rock concert. He looks very awkward, and then tons of people join him. <laughs> yeah, and it's really a good yeah, video to show. Yeah, out in the park, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, the in, uh, remarkable physician, A. McGee Harvey, was chair of medicine at age 36 at Hopkins and had a long career as chair of medicine, was incredibly boring. Um, he, um, he, he his, his strength was differential diagnosis. He wrote a book with Bordley, who was an EMT physician, on differential diagnosis. We used to cringe when he'd come on rounds or give a speech because um, it was hard to stay awake. But then he uh, went uh, uh, to visit the All Indian Institute of Health Sciences in Delhi. And uh, the word came back that Harvey had actually been uh, stopped for 10 minutes in his speech by a standing ovation. And so when he came back and he was asked, what in the world did you say to those folks? And, and he, he said, I, I'm not uh, really certain I intended to say this, but 
I had written out a speech and I said the trouble with uh, medicine today is uh, that we um, have too many uh, we have too many chiefs and not enough Indians. <laughs> Any other questions for the panel? <laughs> That's a good one. So I have one if that I'd like to throw out and, and maybe um, to Sue and Eric because a lot of what we've heard here is how hard it is to make cultural change. People are making some progress, but it's still really hard. And among those schools who are a part of this accelerating change, you know, the term that gets thrown around is disruptive innovation. And I, we've had enough of a struggle that it felt more like destructive innovation in, in our group. And so can, can you guys just comment just briefly on um, how, to, how to make those changes, and if it does need to be dis destructive, how folks are recovering. When we uh, started our ACE initiative, we had 85% of the medical schools apply. Why not? For a million dollars, why wouldn't you? Uh, it would be wonderful if that money was out there all the time and we had that kind of a margin. But a year ago, we went back to all the schools that applied but weren't able to compete for the first 11 in, in the rounding and had an outside firm interview them. And uh, we either interviewed the dean or the chief academic officer, the academic dean. And virtually all of them said that they were still moving forward on the proposal that they put forward to us in 2013. And when asked to say more about that, they said they couldn't afford not to. They couldn't afford to say, stand still. And the thing that they felt that they missed out on the most was the community of innovation and that we even had some schools tell us that they would pay to be part of the consortium because they valued that interaction with each other. So the work that people are doing, the deep work that's going on in the schools, in the AMA consortium, but schools all over the place, and not just in medicine, and not just in health professions. This is a time, like a century ago, when the Flexner Report came out and so many societal changes were happening. We're in that time shifting again. So the, the work is hard, and I think what people are looking for is community. And Patty, I, I think what comes from a consortium or other places where people can come together and share ideas is that sense of um, space, of reflection, of reconnection to say, this work is important, it's hard, but other people value it. When I talk about it, I remember why I'm doing it. I bring a team with me and we get away and we get to talk to other teams. I think that part of being in a group, whether it's a consortium or even in a conference, is part of the remedy of the very hard work that's out there. Um, we set it up that way on purpose and, you know, and we did some things so the resources are helpful, the prestige is helpful so that you can go back and have some value for your CV or, or for the the writing that you're doing and, and that kind of thing. But I, I do think it's that social opportunity to feel that there's value to the work that you're doing and even though it's hard, that that change at the very core is important and important to keep moving forward on. I know the letter we got from you helped a lot where you said you're, <laughs> there's something about getting, a because when you try to make these changes from the inside, it's hard. You need external validation, yeah. it helps to have external validation, it does. Eric, do you have thoughts? Yeah, just real quick, since so our short time. Um, I, I work on the regulatory side. I mean, I think one of the things we can do is try to create space. We're trying to do that. We just recently approved a new innovations pathway to really give, you know, uh, a lot of relief from typical accreditation requirements. So hopefully that'll be helpful. I think the other thing we tend to forget about, and it's always something that sticks with me from a book by uh, Heifetz and Linsky called Leadership on the Line, the preface, they say that the, the, one of our big challenges is that change isn't really about change. Change is about loss. And so for many of our faculty who have developed patterns that have been very successful for them or courses, 
this isn't about doing something new. It, it's really about a sense of loss. I'm, I'm not sure we attend to that as well, and so it feels destructive as a result of that. Um, and I think we also don't pay, we always think about learning new stuff, what we don't also think about is the unlearning that has to occur as part of that and being able to let go of stuff. So I think those are two things and that's where groups help, right? That's where being part of a consortium can help people work through that process. But I think we need to attend to those two things, unlearning and loss, probably better than we have. Nice. Okay, we are, we are ready to move to the wrap up of this meeting, which is gonna be done by Jason Satterfield and Lauren. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm aware it is late on Friday afternoon and uh, it's been a very full day and I hope both your hearts and minds are as full as mine are now. It's really been a fantastic uh, event. But I wanted just to take a couple of min minutes to help us savor and remember uh, where we've come from and really what we've accomplished. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I, I just wanted to take us back about 10 years or so ago uh, when a band of nine stalwart curriculum pioneers <laughs> met for the first time here at NIH. Uh, we were all very excited. Uh, speaking for myself, I was also a little bit nervous, not knowing exactly what to expect. Uh, but in a few moments, I think we knew that we had found our tribe, and we knew that we had a lot of work ahead of us. I believe it was Alan Cross that introduced us to the metaphor of medical education as a river. And we proceeded to talk then uh, on one of our many hopeful, exciting, inspiring, and somewhat subversive talks. <laughs> about how we might go about changing the course of that river. Now, some of our rivers are vast and raging, and some of us might be in streams, uh, but the idea is that we drop our students into these rivers, and that water takes them wherever that river goes. And how could we, as a small uh, but determined band, go about changing that river? We talked about building bridges. We talked about building dams. We talked about uh, building or dredging alternate channels. We talked about building up the shore. We talked about creating life rafts to take our students somewhere else, about going upstream, about going further downstream. But still, the, the thought was really the same of, we can't change everything, but we can change something. We not, might not be able to change exactly where this river goes, but we can influence it. And we began talking about what power do we have? Who are the power brokers? What partnerships do we want to establish? What are the levers that we might be able uh, to pull or to press? And what are the anchors that maybe we can snip so that more forward movement happens? I was just looking at our uh, website and, and uh, thinking about some of the talks that we've seen today, and it's really quite an impressive collection of accomplishments. So to date, we have over 140 peer-reviewed papers that have come out of our consortium and our consortium participants. We have over 400 dissemination events. We have a textbook in half at this point, one in progress that's been written. We've trained over 12,000 medical students uh, in our curriculum. Uh, as many folks have mentioned, we were able to uh, be heavily involved in the AAMC Behavioral and Social Science Report. We were also involved in the recent AAMC LGBT Healthcare Competency Report. We were also involved as social and behavioral scientists in the revision of the MCAT. The MCAT is now one third social and behavioral scientists, social and behavioral sciences. Our students will now arrive on our doorstep from the very first day knowing the basics about psychology and sociology. That's moving the river. We went upstream and we changed who would be put into the river and what sorts of skills uh, they would bring with them. Sue Estroff and I have infiltrated the NVME and we've become <laughs> item writers for step one and step two. Uh, to my knowledge, they've never had social and behavioral scientists write social and behavioral science questions for them before. So it has been quite a process. <laughs> So I think if we look at that, our work with the LCME, our work with the AAMC, the partnerships we've developed, and I'm sure the partnerships and the friendships that will continue, we've moved that river in all sorts of ways, and I think we will continue uh, to do that good work. If you think about the, the talks that we've heard today, there's really a broad spectrum. It's, it's very hard to pull out a singular theme. I think as we have 
matured as a group as we've added in new partner schools and members that our work has gotten uh, richer, it's gotten more mature. We've, bring, we've brought in dissemination and implementation work. We've talked about scale up. We've talked about interprofessional education where in the beginning we were really focused uh, just on medical students. But we've also identified a number of common challenges. So how do we keep this work going? This work will continue, and we may not know exactly how we'll get to wherever that river is going, but I'm certain that each of us is committed in our core to changing the course of that river, to continuing to integrate and to promote social and behavioral sciences. sciences. We have challenges to understand how do we integrate. We have challenges to understand how can we translate, how can we scale up, and how can we scale out. And many of us today talked about the necessity, the importance of faculty development, not just to support our curricular uh, areas, but also to support faculty themselves and how to renew those faculty. So I want to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart of all of these years of hard, hard work. I hope very, very much that our paths will continue to cross and we will continue this good work in whatever way, shape, or form it happens to take. And deepest gratitude again to you, Patty, for setting this up for us. Thank you. So I'm just gonna say a, a few comments and some thank yous, but I actually, uh, before I was a AAAS fellow, I spent five years teaching medical and anthropology to undergraduates. So I got to benefit from this shift uh, in, in encouraging undergrads to specialize in behavioral and social science. So I, to me, it was the greatest. I love teaching medical anthropology. Since my first year here, I must have written, after being at UNC for a year, I must have written 20 uh, you know, letters of recommendation for med school students. I kept trying to convince them to go into nursing and they never listened to me. <laughs> but I, you know, the idea that I could get them young. And at UNC, they have this amazing medical anthropology program where usually I was teaching at small individual schools where you'd get that one class for them, medical anthropology. At UNC, you know, I, like they'd already drank the Kool-Aid. It was so easy for me. It was amazing. <laughs> so, because um, there are so many courses there, you know, I'm, and so I just coming to uh, OBSSR and finding projects to work on when this one needed a home, I was the first person to volunteer and it's been a joy to work with Patty. I know we keep talking, but I mean, it's, it's been a pleasure. She's put so much into this, so um, I just really wanted to thank her and Margie who had to step in <laughs> for a little while there before Patty was um, recovering. And then also Marissa, I hope she's watching because she has been behind the scenes doing so much. I mean, we would not be here, literally, many of you would not be here without Marissa Miller. So thank you, Marissa, I hope you're watching. And then on my team, we had a lot of, Isabel is our communications person, so she's been taking care of all of those emails you got, and we had up to 276 people watching online today. So we are getting the word out there, and she's been coordinating blog posts, and so we will continue to do that. Um, and Atala Hampton in our office has helped with the travel, and Dr. Riley, of course, it's great that he was here and was able to participate, and so I just thank you all for being here. So could you say something brief, just briefly, um, Lauren, about the report that will come out of this meeting? Yes, we have some science writers here who've been furiously taking notes, <laughs> and will receive copies of all of your presentations, and we also will have the video cast, so for those of you, if you're still watching, or you want to tell your friends, once the video cast has been archived and made closed caption and accessible, accessible, it will live on our website so people can view this video cast into the future. And um, the science writers will uh, write a meeting summary and then hopefully Patty and I and the rest of the consortium will sort of work together. So you guys will have this as a document moving forward as you move on with your dissemination plans. So, and eventually we're going to house your website on our website so that um, the consortium can live on. So, yes, so thank you all for coming and traveling here. It was an amazing day, and uh, I look forward to hearing what comes out of this. Yes, that was great.